Simon and Schuster Audio presents Animal, a novel by Lisa Tadeo. Read by Emma Roberts. For my mother and my father. One. I drove myself out of New York City where a man shot himself in front of me. He was a gluttonous man, and when his blood came out, it looked like the blood of a pig. That's a cruel thing to think, I know. He did it in a restaurant where I was having dinner with another man, another married man. Do you see how this is going? But I wasn't always that way. The restaurant was called Piadina. On the exposed brick walls hung photographs of old Italian women rolling gnocchi across their giant flowered fingers. I was eating a bowl of tagliatelle bolognese. The sauce was thick and rust-colored, and there was a bright sprig of parsley at the top. I was facing the door when Vic came in. He was wearing a suit, which was usual. I'd seen him only once in casual clothes, a t-shirt and jeans, and it disturbed me very much. I'm sure he could tell. His arms were pale and soft, and I couldn't stop looking at them. He was never Victor. He was always Vic. He was my boss, and for a long time before anything happened, I looked up to him. He was very intelligent and clean, and had a warm face. He ate and drank voraciously, but there was a dignity to his excess. He was generous, scooping creamed spinach onto everyone else's plate before his own. He had a great vocabulary and a neat comb-over and an extensive collection of fine hats. He had two children, a girl and a boy. The boy was mentally challenged, and Vic somewhat kept this from me and the other people beneath him. He had only a picture of the daughter on his desk. Vic took me to hundreds of restaurants. We ate porterhouse at big clubby steakhouses with red banquettes, and the waiters flirted with me. They either assumed he was my father or my older husband, or they figured I was a mistress. We were, somehow, all of the above. His actual wife was at home in Red Bank. He said, I know you won't believe this because of what a slob I am, but my wife is actually very beautiful. In fact, she was not. Her hair was too short for her face, and her skin was too white for the colors she liked to wear. She looked like a good mother. She liked to buy little salt dishes and Turkish towels, and in the beginning of our friendship, I would walk around the city, and if a bamboo salt dish caught my eye, I would snap a photo and text him, would your wife like? He said I had wonderful taste, but what does that mean? It can feel very safe to be friends with an older man who admires you. Anywhere you are, if something goes wrong, you can make a phone call and the man will come. The man who comes should be your father, but I didn't have one at that time, and you will never. At a certain point, I began to rely on Vic for everything. We worked at an advertising firm. He was a creative director. I had virtually no experience when I started, but I had this talent, he said. He promoted me from a regular assistant to copywriter. At first, I enjoyed all the praise, and then I started to feel like I deserved everything I got, that he had nothing to do with it. It took a few years for that to happen. In the interim, we started up a sexual relationship. I can tell you a lot about sex with a man to whom you are not attracted. It becomes all about your own performance, your own body, and how it looks on the outside, the way it moves above this man who, for you, is only a spectator. While it was happening, I wasn't aware of how it was affecting me. I didn't notice until several years later when three showers a day were not enough. The very first time was in Scotland. Our company had landed an account with Newcastle Beer, and Vic suggested I take the lead, go to all the meetings, and get the ball rolling. It was a big account, and the rest of the guys were jealous. I was new to the company and the work in general. 
They stopped flirting with me and began to act like I was an exotic dancer, jerking themselves off and judging me at the same time. Newcastle put me up in this luxurious hotel just outside of Edinburgh. It was cold stone and big windows, and the front entrance was a circular gravel drive. I would look out my window to see the cars that came through, old antiques and bright black G-wagons and small silver Porsches. There was a tartan quilt on the bed and the phone was a mallard duck. The room was $1,400 a night. I'd been in Scotland for about a week when I began to feel blue. I was used to being alone, but it's different in another country. The sun never came out, but neither did the rain. Plus, I was very naive about the work and the Newcastle representatives could see that. I called Vic at the office. I didn't mean to, but I began to cry. I said that I missed my father. Of course, I missed my mother, too. But in a very different way, and you'll come to understand why. Vic was in Scotland the next evening. His last-minute flight had been exorbitant, upward of $12,000, and he paid out of his own pocket because I was terrified that our colleagues would think I'd failed. He didn't come to any meetings. He just drew up some talking points. He got his own room down the hall. The first night we had dinner and drinks in the hotel lobby, and each went to our separate rooms. But the second night, he walked me back to mine. Smart older men will have a way of crawling up your leg. It won't feel seedy at first, and it might seem like it was your idea. I was wearing a cream wool dress, and my legs were bare. I never wore pantyhose or leggings of any kind, even in winter. I wore black Mary Jane heels. Vic wore a suit. He was perennially dressed like the men in cigarette advertisements. I wasn't attracted to him, but I was comforted by his cologne. We were laughing, walking down that green and gold hallway. A couple passed us, and I remember the way the woman looked at me. I've gone around with that feeling for a long time. In my room, we opened two medium-sized bottles of red wine from the minibar, plus three airplane bottles of scotch that he drank all on his own. Probably out of self-preservation, I can't remember exactly how it got started. I'm sure I had a lot to do with it, testing the reach of my sexual power, the extent of my prettiness. But what I remember starkly is the mirror on the wall opposite the windows where I'd listened for days to the sleek cars crunching the gravel. I got up to look in the mirror because he'd said the red wine was in the corner of my lips and I looked like a crackhead. Ha ha, I said but that man could never have made me feel ugly. He came up behind me in the mirror. His head was abnormally large next to mine. My long dark hair made an elegant contrast against the cream of the dress. He placed one hand on my shoulder and the other against my hair near the ear, tipping my head to one side. I watched the look in his eye as he touched his thin lips to my neck. It sent a shiver down my spine partly in repulsion, but there was also an involuntary sexual response. He lifted the dress over my head. I stood in heels and a white lace bra and white underwear with little red bows at the sides. I was dressing for someone in those days, and I liked to believe it was me. Once in a little kitchen store in Soho, I bought an apron with printed rabbits and chalets and little girls licking ice cream cones. Thereafter came the trips to Sayulita, to Scottsdale for the nice spa. There were blue tiled bathrooms and wonderful sushi, tableside guacamole, belly dancers, valet, everything. Eventually I grew too disgusted, but for a long time I managed. There wasn't much physicality overall. You can get away with a lot of nothing if you play it right. Especially if the man is married, you can talk about morality and what your dead father would think. You can make the man feel trepidation to merely hold your hand, and all the while you're in these warm places with palm trees and golf carts. I didn't stop dating all those years. There were a few minor obsessions, but no one truly serious. I told Vic about some of them. I said they were friends, and I let him balance the suspicions in his head. But mostly, I lied. 
I would say I was going out with girlfriends and then sneak from the office and run toward a subway, looking back the whole time terrified he'd followed me. Then I would meet some unkind boy and Vic would go home and patrol the internet looking for signs of me on social media. He would write me around 11, what you up to, kid? He didn't use a question mark so it would look less inquisitive. You begin to understand human nature at a cellular level when an older man is obsessed with you. The status quo was manageable. We were both getting what we needed, though I could have done without him. It turned out he could not do without me. He likened his relationship with me to Icarus. He was Icarus, and I was the son. Lines like these, which I wholly believed and still do, made me sick to my stomach. What kind of a girl wants to be a son over a country she doesn't even want to visit? Everything was fine for a number of years, until the man from Montana. I called him Big Sky, and in the beginning, so did Vic. I sent Vic to the depths of what a man can stand. I don't recommend you do it, and you should know what it does to a human being. I think Vic came to shoot me that night, is what I think. Two. If someone asked me to describe myself in a single word, depraved is the one I would use. The deprivation has been useful to me. Useful to what end, I couldn't say. But I have survived the worst. Survivor is the second word I'd use. A dark death thing happened to me when I was a child. I will tell you all about it, but first I want to tell what followed the evening that changed the course of my life. I'll do it this way so that you may withhold your sympathy. Or maybe you won't have any sympathy at all. That's fine with me. What's more important is dispelling several misconceptions. About women, mostly. I don't want you to continue the cycle of hate. I've been called a whore. I've been judged not only by the things I've done unto others, but cruelly by the things that have happened to me. I envied the people who judged me. Those who lived their lives in a neat, predictable manner. The right college, the right house, the right time to move to a bigger one, the prescribed number of children, which sometimes is two and other times is three. I would bet that most of those people had not been through one percent of what I had. But what made me lose my mind was when those people called me a sociopath. Some even said it like it was a positive. I am someone who believes she knows which people should be dead and which should be alive. I am a lot of things, but I am not a sociopath. When Vic shot a hole in himself, the blood leaked out like liquor. I hadn't seen blood like that since I was ten years old. It opened a portal. I saw the reflection of my past in that blood. I saw the past clearly for the first time. The cops came to the restaurant looking horny. Everyone had been cleared out of the place. The man I'd been eating with asked me if I would be okay. He was putting his jacket on. He meant would I be okay alone tonight and for the rest of my life because I would never see him again. Once he'd asked me who my group was and I didn't know what he meant and now I did. The dead man on the floor was my group. I was part of a group that Dartmouth didn't recognize. After the cops left, I walked home to my apartment. I thought I had no carbohydrates in the house, but I found a taco kit. The worst thing about eating too much is that you need more Klonopin than usual. I got just high enough to be decisive. I decided I was going to find her. Vic was probably cold by then. I pictured his cold tentacles. When someone suffocates you with what they believe is love, even as you feel your air supply being cut off, you at least feel embraced. When Vic died, I was completely alone. I didn't have the energy to make someone else love me. I was inert, vota, a word my mother would have used. She always had the best words. There was one person left, a woman I'd never met. This was terrifying because women had never loved me. 
I was not a woman whom other women love. She lived in Los Angeles, a city I didn't understand. Mauve, stucco, criminals, and glitter. I didn't think Alice, that was her name, would love me, but I hoped she would at least want to see me. I'd known her name for years. I was almost positive that she didn't know mine. For the first time in a long time, I was going somewhere for a reason. I had no idea how it would go in California. I didn't know if I would fuck or love or hurt someone. I knew I'd wait for a call. I knew I would be rabid. I had zero dollars, but didn't rule out the prospect of a swimming pool. There were many paths my journey could take. I didn't think any of them would lead me to murder. She'd been untraceable for years. No social media, no real estate transactions. Once in a while, I would look for her, but I had too little information, on top of which I was scared to death. Then one afternoon, I went to a dentist because two of my teeth had been knocked out. A man had done it, but not technically with violence. It was an expensive dentist, but the man responsible for the loss of teeth was paying for it. I waited in reception for over an hour, flipping through one of those aspirational magazines for people who make over $5 million a year. There she was, on the cover, with four other pretty women who were the best of fitness, Ashtanga, Aikido, and so on in Los Angeles. I was so drawn to her looks that I read the article and saw her name, which I'd kept on a slip of paper for over a decade. I gasped, and the air whistled through the hole between my teeth. She was prettier than I ever could have imagined. Her breasts were absolutely perfect. An old boyfriend, not a boyfriend, but one of those purveyors of multiple and uncertain mornings, once said that of an actress who'd bared her breasts for a scene. Her breasts, he said to me while eating cheap vanilla ice cream, are absolutely perfect. I am still impressed that I didn't kill him. For years, I dreamed of her. Oftentimes, I dreamed of hurting her. The rest of the time, it was something else, equally worrisome. Within days of Vic's death, my apartment was cleaned out. I was an expert at leaving. I didn't know where I would live. I called about a few rentals near her place of work. But I was low on money and there weren't too many options in my budget. It got so bad that I called a place off of a rental site whose main photo was a bathroom with mold in the grout, a bottle of Selsun Blue in the stall shower, and nothing else. I mapped out a quixotic, impractical route and drove my Dodge Stratus to California. It was a very ugly car, but large, and I was able to fit many things inside. My mother's jewelry in a taupe tin. My best dresses, each sheathed in plastic and folded over the passenger seat. There were my Dorita and photographs and menus from restaurants where I'd spent memorable evenings. Essential oils from a holy place in Florence. A shallot of marijuana, a pipe, 96 pills of varying shapes and shades of cream and blue. Very expensive copper yoga pants and mustard bralettes. Boxes of smoked Malden and 20 squat cartons of pastina, which I'd heard they did not carry at the Ralphs or the Vons. I took the things that could come with only me, that could not be trusted to travel under anyone else's care. My favorite scarf, my Panama hat, my Diane Arbus, my mother, and my father. They were both in plastic baggies, it was the safest way I could think for them to travel. The baggies were in an old cardboard Clementine box on the floor of the passenger seat. My father used to call me Clementine, or he would sing the song in any case. Maybe he did both. He had a goatee, and when he kissed my forehead, I felt like an angel. There were 80 million cars on the Pacific Coast Highway. The sun on their hoods made it feel even hotter than it was. The beach looked dry in the distance, more shimmering surface than cool blue depth. Just before the turnoff into the canyon, I noticed an outdoor market with furniture and decoration for sale. Hollowed oaks made into tables, the heads of gods rendered in resin. 
I pulled in because I wanted new vases for the ashes. I'd thrown out the old ones. Naturally, it was awful for me, the idea of carrying their remains in baggies, but I was infinitely more shattered by the remnants in the vases that hadn't made it. I kept thinking that parts of them were gone forever. A toenail might have lingered in a vase, one-third of a brow bone. I got out of the Dodge and walked past hurricane candle holders. I drew a slash in the bushy dust of a gazing ball. I passed topaz seahorses, Mexican sugar skulls, aquamarine sea glass in rope nets. I was approached by a round-faced boy wearing a hooded sweatshirt in all that heat. Miss, he said, how can I help? His happy smile made him seem ignorant to everything going on in the world. You can't, I said. I said it kindly, but by that point in my life, I had a very low tolerance for unhelpful conversation. The marketplace shared its parking lot with Malibu feed bin. Seed for birds, vats of grain for horses. There were lots of horses in the canyon. Women with long braids rode them over rocks. I picture you being one of these, taller than me, stately in all aspects. There were vases inside the shed next to some hanging petunias and dusty roses. One vase was black with yellow blooms. A glass frog with orange eyes and feet hung from the lip peering in. It was vulgar, something you'd find in an elderly person's house in Florida. I was attracted to it. The young man at the cash register noticed me and then didn't take his eyes off of me. I was in a white nightgownish dress, thin as smoke. He was picking a pimple on his chin and staring at me. There are a hundred such small rapes a day. I picked up the vase and walked around with it, pretending to appraise outdoor pillows and jade foo dogs. The acne clerk got a phone call. I could hear the other boy behind me, moving seahorses from one place to another. People rarely think you will steal something larger than your own head. With the vase in the car, I felt like I had all the important pieces I needed. The movers were meeting me at the house with the balance. A truckload of pieces I'd sat upon. I began the climb up the canyon. Wilted, dark greens rose from the sandy cracks between the rocks. There were hot bushes, maidenhair ferns, false indigo, and bent grass. There were occasional splashes of color, but mostly it was brown and olive and untidy beyond expectation. The houses I could see from the road were 1970s style structures built of campfire wood and smudged glass. They looked out over the rattlers and the tanned grass. The view in the canyon was important. The realtor, Kathy, kept saying the word over and over, view. Eventually, it stopped sounding like a word I knew. She also talked about the coyotes and the rattlesnakes, but don't worry, she said. On the phone, she sounded red-haired and pretty. Don't worry, Kevin likes to catch the rattlers and move them to a happier place, no problem. Kevin was the former rap star who lived on the property. I wonder if he will mean anything to you. Relevance is fleeting. There was also a young man named River who lived in a yurt in the meadow. The landlord lives nearby, said the realtor, in case there are any issues. You are going to love it there. It's fucking heaven. I climbed the winding road until I saw the sign for Comanche Drive. I was filled with terror because already the street didn't look charming. It was treeless and the house was at the top of a steep gravel driveway. It was the highest point of Topanga Canyon, nearly piercing the clouds. Mostly it looked like some place to make meth. There was no formal parking area, so I pulled up beside a black Dodge Charger on a strip of land overlooking a steep drop. Up close, the property resembled the pictures the realtor sent, but not in the ways that counted. The realtor sent the dream. She sent the view through the glass windows, plus the pellet stove. She did not send the rusted bathtub outside the front door that was filled with browned succulents. Next to the bathtub planter, there was a wrought iron table with two chairs. 
The ginger sand was scattered with pebbles so neither the table nor the chair stood evenly. The windows were moth-skinned. The house was dark orange, adobe, and shaped like an ocean liner. There was nothing attractive about its design, nothing symmetrical. Both outside and inside, it was the kind of hot that kills the old. When I think of you being alone in heat like that, the way that I would come to be, I have to force myself to think of something else. I'd been instructed to knock on Kevin's door. His place was a somewhat attached structure beneath mine. I suppose it was a house with two apartments, but it didn't read that way. Kevin would give me the keys. His stage name was The White Space. The realtor Kathy spoke of him the way that a certain type of white woman speaks of a black man who's achieved fame. Before knocking, I took a walk around the property. Kathy was right. The view was theatrical. Every time we spoke, I pictured her at an outdoor table in the sun nibbling gravlocks. I felt sure that if I got to know her, I would hate her. Beneath the mountain, you could see the ocean, and on the other side of the canyon, the slim rectangles of the city rising behind the trees. The skyline was underwhelming. I walked to the tallest point of the property. It was miles above the car-phoned traffic. There was a delicate mist that must have been the clouds. When I was ten, my Aunt Goja told me that was where my parents were, up in the clouds. But are they together up there, I would ask? And she would get up to wash a dish or shut a window. There was a large fire pit at the highest point. It looked medieval with its big rocks and charred wood. There was a giant store of firewood under a black tarp a Michelob beer bottle filled with rainwater. I noticed the canvas yurt in the valley a few hundred feet below me. Down a grassy path in the other direction, there was a small red salt box. It looked like a glorified potting shed, something you bought at a home improvement store, but larger and more elaborate. It was the only area with grass on the property on account of the oaks. Everywhere else, the ground was dry, nut brown, but around that big potting shed, it was moist and green. There were two flower boxes full of marigolds flanking a Dutch door. I worried the tiny home belonged to the landlord. I didn't want to be so close to him. But Kathy hadn't mentioned that sort of proximity. Not at all. I peeled the dress away from my body, and it clung back down with the gum of my sweat. I would come to learn there was no respite from taking a shower in the canyon. It was a matter of moments before you turned a t-shirt translucent. I knocked on Kevin's door. I heard some bluesy rap, and after a few moments I knocked again, louder. He cracked it just a quarter of the way, then blocked the view with his frame. It smelled like tinctures inside. Miss Joan, peace and welcome to the neighborhood. He was very tall and good-looking, and his eyes were friendly. He didn't look at me. He looked through me like I was barely there. I extended a hand, and he stepped outside and closed the door behind him. I'd seen him on stage, crouching with a mic. Strobes and girls in lycra short shorts. The man in front of me looked like he'd never spoken loudly or danced. How was the drive? I said that it was good. Man, I love that drive. It's been too long. Planes trip me out. He made wings of his long arms. By now my scalp had begun to sweat. Planes trip me out, too. You want your keys, I imagine? You need some help moving some things? I've got movers coming, thanks. All right, all right. I ain't got no lemonade to offer. I didn't bake no meringue pies, but I'll get something to you. This is going to be nice. You'll like it here, Miss Joan. We like it here. We're like a small family. You met my man Leonard, my boy River? Nobody. Whoosh, he said. The lady swoops in. His palm dove down and sliced by my waist. Under cover of night. I'm going to get your keys, Miss Joan. Let you get settled. Let you get your house in order. When he returned, he handed me two keys held together by a twist tie. Mailbox, he said, pointing to one.
house, he said, pointing to the other. No, wait, other way around. He laughed delightedly. I'm all turned round today. Forgive me, Miss Joan. I record it all night. I do that and then sleep all afternoon. This is 5 a.m. for me. I took my keys and our hands touched, and I shivered, and I thought, oh, for God's sake. I looked at him, and he considered me. I could see him taking my measurements. Then he smiled. He was over it. Along the drive, I had been wanting to sleep with a real cowboy, someone without social media. Sex made me feel pretty. By the time I reached Texas, the trip was almost over. The man I fucked was named John Ford. He wore a Western shirt and placed my palm over his zipper in the lobby of the Thunderbird. The walls were aqua, and there were cowhides on the floor. He said he'd once worked on a ranch, but it turned out to be a Boy Scout trip he remembered like it was yesterday. He was in liquor sales out of Chicago. He'd never heard of the film director who shared his name, or Monument Valley where the films were made, the soaring westerns I watched with my mother. He belched twice, too loud to ignore, and ordered the flatbread pizza with balsamic onions. But his name was John Ford. Three. Inside the house, it smelled of toothpicks. What is it about moving into a new place that makes you want to kill yourself? I imagine this isn't true for women with labeled boxes, women who own fly swatters, who store their winter clothes for the summer. Me? I had my mother's eyelash curler. I had old, yellow lotions from stores that no longer existed. My unpacked boxes would stay unpacked full of mementos, full of smells, and especially the pungent odor of the mothballs my mother placed inside her handbags. As a child, I thought they were balls of crystal. The house was a giant sauna, three floors of all wood. It could have been beautiful. It was, in a way. But as with many rundown places that had potential, you needed to bring a skill to it the ability to position certain rugs and lamps. You had to not mind dirt in places you couldn't get to. I imagined Alice to be one of these people. The first floor was made up of the kitchen and the living room and the only bathroom. In the living room, the black pellet stove was filled with lilac crystals instead of wood. The side of the house that faced the mouth of the canyon was all windows. In the photographs the realtor sent me, there was a towering ficus and assorted singed palms. But without the plants, the sun was white hot and despotic. It illuminated the dust in the sockets of the outlets. There was no dishwasher and none of the cabinets lined up with one another. The insides of the drawers were sticky as though honey had been mopped up with plain water. I wouldn't be able to cook long, lovely meals in there steaming bowls of mussels or crackling hens. It was a kitchen for turkey sandwiches. I once had a boyfriend from Ireland who would make these schoolboys sandwiches with old tomatoes and cheap turkey, slicked in gloss and full of nitrates. He would leave the turkey out on the counter after making the sandwiches, and in the morning it would still be there, and then he would put it away. I was reminded of that boyfriend in my new kitchen the notion of making do. The first night we made love, it was so hot in his railroad apartment that he was sweating profusely above me. The sweat dripped off the paintbrush ends of his hair onto my face and chest. The second floor was supposed to be a bedroom. You reached it via a spiral staircase. There was only enough room for the bed. There was a small pine closet. It looked like Colorado in the bedroom. There was an old western saddle slung over a beam. I could picture a different life, rossignol skis lining the walls. I climbed a short attic staircase to the third floor, which had been advertised as an office. There was makeshift shelving left over from a former tenant, a few old record sleeves dredged in sand and hair. 
It felt like walking into a steam room. By that time, droplets were falling from my underarms and plinking the floor. I sat down on my thin white dress. I could feel the splinters of the wood pricking the silk and knew that when I got up, the dress would be ruined. I'd worn it across the country, washed it once in Terre Haute and again in Marfa, in the sink of John Ford's hotel room. I'd pulled it on wet that morning and let it bake dry against my skin in the sun. It was my mother's dress. She'd kept it for so many years in mint condition. A silverfish sprinkled across my kneecap and then someone banged on the door. I ran downstairs and opened the door to two broad men in black shirts and denim shorts. I always thought, if I had to fuck one man in the room to save my life, if I had to be ground down, which would it be? With these two, I couldn't tell which was safer. The one with a neck tattoo looked like a man who lets a dog hump his leg until one day somebody sees, so he has to shoot the dog. They asked me where I wanted certain things. When they saw the spiral staircase, the one with the neck tattoo grunted. For the first few minutes, they made me feel alternately like a rich old lady and a babysitter. I didn't want to be either. The second man, the one with a gold front tooth, looked from my eyes to my breast so often that I thought he had a tick. I wasn't wearing a bra, so my nipples poked out, looking like whelks. I don't know why these thoughts came to me, but I pictured myself being bent and raped by the one with the gold tooth over the shallow sink. I reasoned that I might then feel comfortable asking him to build my Ikea furniture. Halfway through the move, I realized that the men were doing meth in my bathroom. They were going in one after the other every 30 minutes and coming out like goblin versions of themselves. I wonder what to tell you about drugs. I took pills and I smoked marijuana and there were month-long stretches here and there when I blew coke alone at night. I would snort it off my mother's antique makeup mirror with a $500 bill of Monopoly money. Then I would stay up until three and four buying dresses online. But mostly it was pills. I wasn't strong enough to get through life without being able to go to sleep on command. Maybe you won't need to take pills. I dream that you'll be so much stronger. One time on an island, I swam in a green lagoon and saw through the clearness of the water the simple fact of my limbs. I watched the purple, red, and blue fish moving around my body, and I paddled to keep myself afloat for a long time. Afterward, I lay down on the sand and concentrated on the sun warming my kneecaps and my shoulders. I can count moments like that on my hands. My dream is for you to have many such moments. So many that you notice only the times you slip into your own brain and recognize those instances for the traps that they are. In the living room while the men brought in heavy things groaning, angry about the weight of my life, I shook my father into the frog vase and placed it on top of the pellet stove. For the time being, I left my mother in the baggie beside it. I walked around the place looking for interesting things, but the refrigerator was the kind you couldn't put imposing bundles of romaine in. It wasn't for kale or stocking beets, at best bags of peeled baby carrots. There was barely room in the pantry for all of my pastina and the cartons of college in broth. As a child, I'd had a girlfriend whose parents were 19th century poor. They had a pantry full of old food in boxes brought by ladies from the church. One night when I was over, the mother opened a package of macaroni and cheese to find milk-colored maggots slipping around, tinkling the dry elbows. The mother picked over the pasta, tossing the maggots in the sink, and turned on the hot water to melt them. Later, my friend looked at me across the table with bright, wet eyes. The family said grace, and I tucked my chin and pretended to close my eyes, but kept them instead on my plate watching for movement. My dear friend's hand in mine was small and warm. After that night, we never played again. It was early enough in the relationship that it didn't feel at the time like a wound. But now I think about her all the time. I think about her every time I open a box of pasta. Where you want this? Asked the one with the neck tattoo. 
The movers were holding my burgundy plume love seat, an armless velour nest that Vic gave to me. He'd had me on it more than once. That was the point of many gifts. I wanted it on the third floor, but the movers were sweating. The beads of sweat glistened on their foreheads like those maggots. I shook my oily hair out of a ponytail and rubbed my shoulder. You're clearly very strong, but it's probably impossible to get that up to the third floor. Nothing's impossible, said the one with the gold tooth. I smiled and thanked him. I fluttered my eyelids. It was something I actually did. Then I turned and moved sensually toward the kitchen. I don't think there's anything wrong with using sex. I know some people think that there is, but I don't understand why. I'd been coached by my Aunt Goja. Goja wasn't my aunt by blood. She was my father's brother's second wife. She was Austrian and garishly beautiful. Blonde pompadour, black Dolce & Gabbana suits, excessive filler. She trained me in the art of sexual combat. She told me that women must deploy all their strengths in order to prevail. People will call you names, she said. They are only hating themselves. As they moved past me with the couch, I saw the lightened spot where I'd scrubbed Vic's semen off. At first, it was revolting, but lately it had become a faded badge. Yo, you know the white space lives under you, said the neck tattoo. I told him that I did. Fucking sick, said the one with the gold tooth. What kind of place is this? Some artist commune and shit? I have no idea, I said. The men had become very ugly to me. I looked out the windows, wishing again I had moved someplace where it snowed, with big yellow bobcats that roared down blizzardy Ketchum mornings. I loved headlights and snowstorms. But I had come to Los Angeles for a reason. I'd stayed in New York for too long when I should have tried to find Alice. New York is a lie, I will tell you. Each city is its own lie, but New York is a whopper. I don't expect you to listen about that. Everyone needs to learn it in their own time. The men notice I'd stopped playing. Men are never okay when you stop. I had the fear of angering a man, of not being an amenable woman. I had the fear of being murdered. To assuage the guilt that I didn't follow up the flirtation by fucking them, I gave the movers each a tip of fifty dollars. I wondered if they had to buy their meth or if it was something to cook in an oxidized airstream. I pictured them eating oyster crackers from the soup counters of gloomy grocery stores in the valley. There had been times in my life when I didn't think of a hundred dollars as anything. But when those fifties left my hand, my forehead grew hot. I felt the familiar fear. There was a month when I drove to a gas station every night and bought scratch-off tickets from the lottery vendor. I scratched them off under a bug lamp next to the air pressure machine. I used a dime because it had ridges. One spring evening, I won $50, and it made me feel like I could run for office. I'd considered not tipping the movers, saying I had no cash on hand, that I would send something along in the mail. I thought, with some perverse relief, that if things got terrible anytime soon, if I couldn't find work, I might perform blowjobs on the burgundy plume. I could sit the pizza delivery man down and the propane guy, separate their giant knees and let them depress my head like a flush valve. Four. I knew where to find Alice, but you should never engage a stranger until you understand her world. Don't let anyone have an advantage. I drove to Froggy's, which was built on the sharpest curve of Topanga Canyon Boulevard. Kathy had told me it was where the locals went. It was a bar and a music venue and a fish market. It was decorated like a Mexican restaurant under the sea. They sold oysters on the half shell, steamers and nets, tacos with carnitas, coconut-crusted tilapia. 
I sat near the stage where live music played on the weekends. I ordered shrimp quesadillas to have a plate of food in front of me. I drank a Bloody Mary. It was the only thing stronger than wine that I liked. Perhaps it was the way the thickness of the tomato quieted the vodka, or perhaps it was because my father had ordered them. I used to eat the celery from his, the pimento-stuffed olives. There was an old couple at a nearby table with their thirty-something son who looked like he had cerebral palsy. His hair was trimmed into a crew cut, and when he stood, his limbs jangled like a puppet's. His father helped him to the bathroom. His mother, a pale and pretty woman in her fifties with glazed eyes, sat at the table when her men had gone and squeezed a lemon into a Coke. There was someone, I thought, who might understand me. I watched a career waitress say to the bartender, you have to take my tables. I gotta go back there. I'm gonna be some time. Something didn't agree with me. The waitress ran into the kitchen, her gray ponytail thwopping behind her. Now that I was looking in that direction, I saw the next wrong thing sitting at the bar with dirty blonde hair and light eyes the color of blue hydrangea. He looked back at me and smiled, and then suddenly he was smiling more and walking over. Hey, he said. I saw you walking out to your car before, at the house. I would have come over, but I was... He didn't finish his sentence. He was one of the sexiest men I'd met in person. He didn't have to do anything except not be cruel. Sorry, I'm River. I live in the yurt. You must be Joan. Must be, I said, biting my lip inside my brain. Mind if I sit? He was 22, I'd been told by Kathy, who also called him Eye Candy. He had pink cheeks, and his bottom lip was thick, and I thought I'd learned my lesson. He'd brought his mug of beer with him. His demeanor was gentle but indifferent, the gutting indifference of the young. I said, I don't mind, even though he'd already begun to sit down. Werewolves of London was playing. Behind his head, a great silver and blue marlin hung from the wall. He asked what had brought me to California, and I said, acting. That was what I was telling everyone so they would leave me alone. I figured there was enough shame associated with trying to be an actress in one's late thirties that they wouldn't press me. River liked Japanese folktales. He sold solar panels to celebrities in the canyon. The company was owned by a couple of bros in Santa Monica and they'd promised him a steak. He drove the work truck during the week and on the weekends he had his fixed speed. If he went out with friends, they'd pick him up. They'd drive all the way into the canyon from West Hollywood or downtown L.A. or Culver, and they'd head down to Bungalow and drink whiskey near the water. Last week, he'd sold a bundle to Lisa Bonet. Her hair was all cornrows, and she was in raw silks. She had hundreds of children around her, and they kept goats, and the children drank the milk of the goats. River tasted it and said it was the flavor of grass. How do you get home at night from the bars in Hollywood? I asked him. Kathy had told me there were no real taxis that went from Hollywood up to the canyon, or if they did, they were hundreds of dollars. Usually I don't come back up here, he said. And of course, I knew what that meant. River was from Nebraska. He talked about hunting deer with his father and selling the meat to local purveyors. Where I'm from, he said, they sell deer meat at the gas stations. You can pay at the pump and someone will walk out a big bag of meat. I pictured the bloody bag and the snow falling at a gas station on a country road. He leaned back in his chair and rested one foot on the bottom rung of my seat. He was wearing very light jeans that I don't think were in style. You will always meet a new kind of man just when you thought you'd exhausted the supply. Werewolves of London played again. Something must have been stuck in the system. Good thing I like this song, I said. He laughed in a way that meant he'd never heard it. Sometimes I dreamed of being married to Warren Zevon, eating drugs with him at Joshua Tree and curry out of stained boxes in the rains of Shoreditch. Have you met Lenny, he asked. 
no. He's an odd duck. He lost his wife a few months ago. He's still pretty fucked up over it. How long do you think people should grieve? My father died 18 months ago. That's why I moved out here. I'm sorry. He had a heart attack while he was shoveling snow. I came home and found him on the driveway. You should see the asphalt in some parts. He was almost done. I shook my head in pity. I meant it. I felt so much for him, but I was always feeling more than I should when it came to death. The bartender came and removed our dirty glasses. I was about to ask for another round when River said he should be going. He needed stamina to ride his bike up the two treacherous miles. I can give you a ride if you want. He thought for a moment and said that would be great. For a third time, Werewolves of London came on. I said I hoped it would go on forever and realized that made me sound ridiculous. So nobody told you how the bills work, he said. I told him no. The word bills filled me with dread. I was deeply in debt across many different cards. I'd sold some of the things Vic had bought for me and that had paid for the trip across the country. The movers, two months of rent. How it works is you and Kevin and Leonard are on the same propane water, etc. I'm totally off the grid, so every month I read my meter. My total kilowatt hour usage hovers around 2100. My last reading was 2085. So over the last 24 days, I use 97. My total solar power production is 987. That means I produced 137 kilowatt hours over the last 24 days, and that was directly subtracted from the group bill. So I'm responsible for minus 40 kilowatt hours. I owe zero dollars, and ten dollars was subtracted from the bills. Does that make sense? I just looked at him. I save you guys money. I produce energy. And the rest of us suck it like cows. He laughed. It's a good thing we like this song, he said. I left two twenties and followed him into the warm, fragrant night. At the valet stand, we waited behind a man in his sixties and a woman in her twenties. The woman wore a pink bandage dress and cheap shoes. The man had his palm on her rear. He moved his finger pads in concentric circles. He didn't tip the valet. River looked from them to me and smiled. Few things are more aphrodisiacal than looking down on another couple. In the car, his knee touched mine, and his hand touched mine when I shifted in the parking lot. Something about his youthful spirit made me think of all the times before something terrible happens. There are a lot of wild places in the canyon, great hiking spots. I've been thinking about getting a dog, but the coyotes. And the snakes, I said. His bike bumped around in the back. I drove slowly because the trunk was open. The first thing he did was open his window all the way and stick his elbow out. The snakes are not as bad as the coyotes. Listen, be careful around Leonard. Lenny, I mean, he's a great guy, but he's really needy. Okay, I said, thinking of the way the young feared need. I was concentrating on the curves which frightened me. I felt like the side of my body was scraping against the faces of the rocks. I was still wearing the white dress, but I'd added lime oil to my neck and wrists and a thin gold bracelet of my mother's. River told me that Leonard's father had envisioned something of a commune back when. A McCarthy-era bunker. Had I seen the Japanese soaking tub behind Leonard's place? At one time, there had been a fixed stream of tan ladies, porn stars and Satan worshippers, and your general loose, fun-loving types coming through the place. Their big, bouncy breasts would float at the black surface of the tub. He talked about the missile launch in North Korea. He talked about it the way young men spoke of threats, with political engagement and zero fear of radioactive death. River was deathless. I knew the mark of the deathless. They ate wasabi peas and used the same unlaundered towel for weeks. I practiced stoicism, he told me. 
In the driveway, we stayed in the car for a few minutes. He was talking about Rotterdam. I thought it would be nice to have sex, mostly because I was thinking about the loss of his father, and that endeared him to me. The problem is it's very difficult to find someone who will feel your loss with you. The same people who cry at movies will not blink an eye if you relate a tragedy. They will say, I'm so sorry for your loss, like you have lost a thousand dollars on a horse race, like it's something replaceable, a pittance in the grand scheme of things. Sometimes he doesn't come out of his house for whole days, River said of Leonard, but he watches from his window so don't do anything you wouldn't want anyone to see, like hanging laundry in a bikini or grilling topless. I was imagining how many girls River had slept with. Probably he saw women naked several times a week. I liked the way he said topless, like it was nothing. I've tried to explain that to other women, the feeling of liking men who don't look for sex actively. Most men are crabs, crawling around with their pincers out. I looked at the side and did the thing I always did when I moved into new, cramped quarters. I imagined a bassinet beside the bed. How crazy and stupid it would look. How terrible the staircase would be for going up and down with an infant. How dangerous everything was and how exhausting it would be to safeguard a ratty home. The bassinet was always wicker and white, something old world that tottered when you walked into the room. I myself had never been in a bassinet. I'd slept between my parents for longer than was reasonable. They used to pass Marlboro Reds across my tiny body. I remembered the long reach of my mother's slender arm across me and over to my small but muscly father. He would tip the ashes off. The ashtray was always on his side. Mimi, my mother called him when the cigarette was waiting over my head. Yes, Cece, my father said back. I wanted to tell Alice those details before the end of that life as I knew it. I dreamed that night that she was the Antichrist, that she would be cruel and try to hurt me. Part of me wanted to hurt her. Sometimes I went around wanting to hurt everyone. I woke in a sweat at three in the morning. It was not the heat that woke me, but a bright devil noise, a tone somewhere between the cry of a baby and the bray of a small dog. It felt so near that I didn't want to turn on the light, afraid there would be a tuft of silver fur on the bed. I looked and saw only one coyote out of my bedroom window, but there were more out of sight. The one I saw stood on the tallest mound of land about 500 feet from me. It was slighter than I expected. I looked at it, and it looked at me, and then the sound abruptly stopped. It was a peaceful moment. It was windless, and none of the landscape moved as though it were a painting. Then the animal cast its head back, opened its jaws, and emitted a howl like stones cracking in fire. It was joined in chorus by the invisible others. I ran around the house shutting all the windows. Down the grassy path, I saw a light come on in Leonard's shed home. I tore my dress off in the agony of heat and noticed, for the first time, an air conditioning unit mounted on the wall between the first and second floors. The realtor had said there wasn't one. Probably the unit wasn't working, but I dragged my dining room table toward the door. I hoisted a chair on top of the table and climbed up. Standing on my toes like that, I could switch the thing on. Twice I nearly fell. Then I got it, hit the switch, and it turned on with a gratifying rumble. I smelled paint chips but soon felt the cool air. I was so happy that I began to cry. From the daisy recipe tin next to the toaster, I extracted two 10-milligram tablets of Ambien. I bit one in half. One and a half was my magic number for most pills. It was more than necessary without being too much. In my dreams, I was seldom as alone as I was in life. I wore baseball caps and had a child with me, almost always a girl. My breasts ached in my dreams as though they were heavy with milk. The girl was too old to nurse, but I always had the feeling of pulling her into bed with me against my chest. The bed was by the porthole of a window in some Greek or Italian seaside town. 
The child was in a white dress and always in danger. Other times we ate happily at a fast food restaurant until suddenly a car was behind us, and I understood it was someone coming to take her away from me. When I woke, there was the mean little pain of missing someone's laughter. There was also relief. I had no one for whom to care, no one to fear losing. That first morning in the canyon, I woke to pounding on the door. It sounded as though it had gone on for a long time before I'd become aware. One time, Vic woke me with knocking like that. He said he'd thought I was dead. I hadn't returned his calls for a few days. He was ashamed when I opened the door, but also he'd been angry. Later, after I'd sent him away and looked in the mirror, I realized why. There was mascara under my eyes. My mouth looked raw. I hadn't done anything with anyone the night before, but he wouldn't have believed me. Partly he liked to think I did. Bang, 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 then a pause, and then four more. From an open suitcase on the floor, I pulled on an itchy sweater that fell to my knees. I opened the door to find an old man. He'd been angry, but then he blinked. He looked down at my long legs. Joan, he said. I nodded and squinted. When I woke too early on Ambien, there was always the quivering terror. Who did I fuck last night? What did I eat? I'm Leonard. Nice to meet you. Sorry, I seem to have woken you. Is everything all right? Well, he said, stepping into the house without invitation, he led with a cane. He wore old man sneakers, a beige pair of New Balances. He indicated the air conditioner with his cane. That unit, he said, is not to be used. It's very dangerous. It's got asbestos. It causes cancer. It's unsafe and the filter hasn't been changed. It's not approved by the city. Oh, I said. So why is it here? I need to have it taken down. Didn't you see in the lease the line about the air conditioner? I thought all leases were standard. Well, yes, it's a standard lease, but all leases have provisions. He said this like I was a dumb thing. One about the AC, he continued, another about pets. Female pets must be spayed. On account of the coyotes, I said. Kathy, the realtor, had explained this in depth. She'd said anything in heat would be torn to shreds by the coyotes. She'd instructed me on how to dispose of my tampons, to triple bag them in dog waste sacks. Leonard nodded. I lifted the chair on top of the table. What are you doing? Leonard asked nervously as I climbed. Don't do that, he said. I'll have Kevin come turn it off. Kevin is probably sleeping. He records through the night. I said this as I balanced on the shaking hardback. I wasn't wearing any underwear, and I felt the old man's eyes between my thighs like a flare. When I got down, he was winded, as though he'd been the one climbing on chairs. What a cheap little bastard, I thought. We pooled our bills. That was the reason he didn't want me to use the air conditioner, and I couldn't offer to pay extra. There were multiple periods in my life when I'd bought something in every store I walked into. I'd bought furniture on a whim, big Edison bulbs for antique iron lamps. I'd bought museum wine stoppers, even though I had never not drunk a whole bottle the same night it was opened. But this was not one of those times. I had to turn off old air conditioners. I had to suffer the grotesqueries of crushed old men. There, I said, all better. I'm sorry to have woken you. He had nice soft hair and a patrician face, but beyond that, he was just another man who could smell it on me, the loss of a father. I'm late for an audition, so I needed to be up, I said. He was still nodding as I shut the door in his face. Five. Alice's face in that magazine confirmed everything I'd always feared. She was more beautiful. At a rest stop on the way in Alamogordo, I overheard a four-year-old child tell her mother 
that her friend's mother was beautifuler. The little girl's mother smiled and said, Yes, Vanna's mom is really pretty. No, the little girl said, she's beautiful. After my brutal little landlord left, I got dressed. I used the same rose-colored balm on my cheeks and my mouth. I tried to look attractive, but I knew before meeting her in person that she was, and would always be, beautifuler. The notion of seeing her in person was nearly too much. I wanted to put it off indefinitely, but I couldn't. It had become by that point irreversible. Seeing Alice would be the key not to my survival, but to yours. Sometimes you are little more than a crimped apparition, like the heat that rises off the macadam in front of your car. By the time I'd been two days in the canyon, you had come to exist. I couldn't see your form, but I could feel you slipping from me. I could feel someone, something, pulling me away from you pulling me into a white room as I screamed for you, give her back to me. I would have burned the whole world down to get you back. But what if I could not? Los Angeles was both more remarkable and less beautiful than I expected. Cayennes and narrow streets and skinny women and the air of posh mystery. The grand homes of Beverly Hills were gruesome up close, The paint was chipping and everything felt empty, as though once famous actors were dying inside. But the canyon was different. It was orange and rocky, and the greens, the ragweed, and the beech burr and the salt bush were not plush, but dry and brown or a singed yellow. In between the rocks sprouted sedge and mule fat. In the pictures I'd seen, there had been up close images of Indian paintbrush the shocking canary of a beach evening primrose and the carpets of California poppy, like the technicolor land of Oz. But now I saw it for what it was, the golden yarrow rattled with snakes. A few weeks earlier, it would have been just fine. I'd always taken comfort in knowing that as long as I could scrape together the money for gasoline, I could drive. I could visit the Grand Canyon. I could sleep in the Argo Tunnel and rise in the morning before the tour groups came through. But I couldn't leave Los Angeles. It was the last place, and I knew it. And here I was in the queerest part of it. I had to get a place minutes from where she worked. Just as when I was a child and I wanted a tennis skirt and tennis sneakers before ever once striking a tennis ball. As an adult, I was no different. I needed to feel that I owned real estate before I used a bathroom. There was no nucleus, no central village of Topanga Canyon, just clusters of shops a mile or more apart. The old hardware store was otherworldly. It was not California precious, but neither was it a holdover from the 50s. It smelled of chalk inside. I loved the smell of hardware stores nearly as much as I loved the smell of chlorine. I stopped at the thrift store scratchy with tutus and sequin dresses and polyester palazzo pants and vintage greeting cards and postcards that once upon a time were cherished. Dear Mom, The weather is beautiful even in winter. School is going well. They sell 24 karat gold in the shops for a good price and I'm enclosing a necklace for Susan for Christmas. Please give it to Susan, Mom. Tell Dad I saw a Ferrari 312 here, just coasting the streets of downtown Padua. Cherry red with a tan leather interior. Love to all. Jack. Not too long ago, everyone wrote in script. My father wrote in script. I used to think he had the most beautiful handwriting in the world, but everyone from his era did. I drove up and down streets where you couldn't see around the curves. People seemed to drive blind on instinct. Every so often, there was an impressive Spanish-tiled house, grazing horses. There were art installations and peace signs made of hubcaps. There were bamboo fences and no clouds in the sky. When I got hungry, I stopped at a place called La Choza, next to a dry cleaner. I was in the same white dress. It smelled of sweat, but I hadn't come across anyone who would notice. 
A Mexican woman behind a counter waited with a wide tin spoon. There were instructions for how to order written on a piece of cardboard. Pick one. Chicken adobo, steak, char veg. I wanted half chicken and half charred vegetables. I didn't want any rice. You only pick one, said the woman. Can I have half of each and you can charge me for the chicken, which is the more expensive one? No, you pick one. The woman wore a honeycomb hairnet that starred her dark head. But I want half of each, and you, the store, will be making money off this order. Because the chicken is more expensive and I am having less of it, do you understand? The woman shook her head. Why, I asked, can you explain to me why? The woman set the spoon down and wiped her plastic gloves on her apron stained with yellow and brown juices. She picked up the spoon and aggressively scraped it under a section of rice. I don't want rice, I said. The woman walked away then into the kitchen. I was still hungry. Back in my car, I drove and listened to Marianne Faithful and Joni Mitchell. I will make a list for you of all the songs that meant something to me. I parked at the health food cafe next to her studio, which happened to be world famous, Rod Rails Power Yoga. Rod Rails was one of the phony stars of the yoga community, shirtless and long-haired with a crooked erection like the bone of a porterhouse, I would come to hear. In one picture, holding a malnourished child in Nepal, the next with his arm around the spiky shoulders of an older actress. He led two times a month, but mainly traveled to high holy grounds and franchises. Most of the classes were taught by girls like Alice, hot girls who had never smoked a cigarette. I walked up to the door. My legs trembled, and I felt like a nobody. On top of that, I hadn't planned what I would say. There was a schedule on the door. I looked for her name. The day was a Tuesday. She wasn't teaching until Friday. I was so relieved that everything inside of me quieted immediately. I would come back on Friday, I told myself. But I didn't have to come back at all. I could find a nice used car dealer, let him buy us a split level in Baldwin Park, and refuse to fuck in any position but doggy style. The other thing I always wanted to put off was getting a job. After running out of money that came from selling my parents' home, I'd held a lot of different jobs. Often, I didn't have a job at all. I would sell something a man gave me, and the profit might last several months. Next door, I walked through the beaded curtain of the health cafe. Fat flies buzzed inside. The cafe sold kombucha, rope baskets, chat books of poems by local writers, chocolate bars made with Oregon peppermint. A sign that said, help wanted, looked like it never came down. There was a bright pink La Marzocco machine. A young girl in a cowboy hat with two long braids stood behind the counter. An unlaminated name tag pinned to her chest said Natalia. She was young enough to have been my daughter had I gotten pregnant at 17. May I have a frittata, I said. The spinach or the kale? Spinach. It comes with corn fritters. I don't want them. I can wrap them up and you can take them home. You want to take them home, I said. I ordered an Americano to see the girl use the bright pink machine. She was pretty, the kind of simple, inarguable pretty that I had never been. I was sexually attractive. Sometimes other women didn't see it. May I also have a job application? Sorry? I tapped the help wanted sign with a dusty fingernail. The girl leaned across the counter, craning her head to see it. Her breasts were big and jammed together. She wore a rose quartz Buddha on a leather string around her neck. Oh, huh. Do they not need help? Yeah, I'm actually leaving for school. Great. How many do you need? Just the one. You want the frittata to stay or to go? I'll stay.
I walked outside with the application and the coffee to the partially covered patio with bright butterfly chairs and old sewing tables and round wood tables, each with a bottle of Cholula on top. I felt a terrible premonition. I've had these throughout my life, and few people have believed me because I'm always relating them after the fact. I don't trust myself enough to say something when I have the feeling. So this time, like every time, I quieted my mind the best I could. I concentrated on the paper in front of me. I hadn't filled out this type of application since I was in my teens. It asked if I was available to work weekends, holidays, how many hours I desired to work per week. It asked what subjects I studied in school. Yes, yes, many, I wrote, and art history. Before Vic, I had for a time kicked men in the testicles with high heels. One man gave me a painting I turned around and sold for $25,000. Another gave me a vintage silver print of Diane Arbus's A Widow in Her Bedroom. I treasured that photograph. Sometimes I felt it was the finest thing about me. Suddenly there was an extreme noise on the road. I have to tell you that terrible things always happen around me. I was marked at ten. People don't want to know that many bad things can happen to one person or around one person. A bad thing happens and coworkers circle your cubicle, their grating palms on your shoulders. Another bad thing happens and you're no longer someone upon whom they could try out their munificence. You're a squashed pack of merits on the highway. The girl Natalia came out with my frittata on a plate. A Chevy Tahoe had head-on a yellow beetle. The beetle, which looked like a human being, was compacted, its face smashed. There was the braking of other cars, and a single horn sounded, but otherwise a snowy piece settled across the canyon. I looked at the girl, and the girl looked back at me. It took the man a long time to come out of the Tahoe, and when he did, he was covered in frosty dust. He staggered toward the beetle. It was a 70s model with the handlebar on the hood and the headlights like a ladybug's eyes. Medium dark gray smoke poured out. It felt as though the driver of the Tahoe walked for hours, but he never made it to the other car before the ambulance did. It was possible the ambulance came the quickest an ambulance had ever come. The driver of the Beetle, a woman, gave the impression of burned toast. She was laid out on a stretcher. The urgency they saved for the other passenger. I turned my head when an entire infant seat was lifted out by the broad-shouldered men. I could see the baby, who was not crying. I could taste the metal and the tears of the father in the morning. Beside me, the girl's mouth hung open, but otherwise she didn't shield her eyes or make a noise. She'd likely never seen death. She stood there with that white plate. She'd been taught to put a wedge of tomato on the rim. I wanted to shove her nose in a slick of blood, but I couldn't. I had to let the girl go home, sit on her mother's couch, and tell her boyfriend she'd seen a woman and her newborn die on the road today the boyfriend would ask about the types of cars involved. Back at the house, I found my landlord sitting at the table outside my door. He had a pitcher and two crystal glasses. Joan, he said, this table is for all of us. I moved it to be closer to your door where there's some shade, but if you don't want it here, I can move it back, if you don't like company. It was hot and still. I hadn't cried about the car crash, and I thought that if I went into the house alone, I would lose it. I would take a pill and sit on one of my boxes. I felt I could have stopped it somehow. I knew for a fact I could have saved my father and my mother. I like to think that one of the reasons I'd lived through my own nightmare was so that one day I might prevent someone else from suffering. But the infant died. The mother died. I watched. I finished filling out the job application. How'd your audition go, he said. He poured me a glass. Dreamily, he said, Lenore's lemonade. My audition, I said quietly. Likely I didn't get it. You're a certain age. Do you mind my asking? 
About 30 years younger than you, I said, and he smiled. The older the man, the more my specialty. I knew that when I met God one day, it would go well. The lemonade was vodka forward. There were bits of mint floating at the surface. I thought of the radio in the car, of what the mother and the child had been listening to. I imagined it to be Peter, Paul, and Mary, and that the song would live in the air there forever. Sounds didn't die. He told me to call him Lenny and asked me what everyone wants to know. Where did you come from? What do you do for money? Why are you alone? I gave him a list of odd jobs. Babysitting, floral arrangement, the time I'd made up dead people. Underneath our bodies, the ground rumbled, and I looked up at the sky. An earthquake was one of my most vivid fantasies. But it was only Kevin waking up, turning the silver dial on some large box. Leonard's knee began to tremble. He had the face of an old movie actor, a Paul Newman. It was an interesting face, and I liked him better than I had earlier that morning with his cane and metal breath. He looked fresh. He wore a white sweatshirt and gray pants. Gone were the old man's sneakers. In their place, a good pair of loafers. Still, his ankles looked like they had been dug up. Are you through unpacking? There were boxes I would never unpack. Six large ones. They contained things like the square packets of hotel shower caps my mother saved. And, from the first time my mother cut my hair, a loose braid of black. Yes, I said. Do you live in the potting shed? He smiled and nodded at me like, I know the kind of woman you are. It's not a potting shed. It's one of these tiny homes. I don't need a lot of space. I used to live here, in your place. Why'd you move? I didn't need all the space, he repeated. I could tell I'd gone too far. I wished I didn't care. Have you always wanted to be an actress? No, I didn't want to compete with all the other pretty girls when I was young, so I waited. I figured I'd be more interesting now. I was biding my time. Kathy told me you came all the way out here alone. I drove. She drove, he said, rubbing the rim of his glass. He looked at me in the familiar way. I finished my drink and stood. He placed two fingers on my wrist and poured me another glass, saying, A bird cannot fly on one wing, my friend. You can flap one wing, but you can't fly on it. I sat back down. Lenny had a controlling air. At some point, he had been in charge of things. Family money, legacy, oil futures, a wife, a mistress. And old men like him never stopped flexing their alleged power. Sometimes when he was being gallant, he reminded me of my father, but so did anyone. For a very long time, I had written the word daddy in the steam of shower doors. This is when I lived in places with glass doors. At the apartment in Jersey City, I'd written it on so many different spots that when the sun came through the cloudy window, you could see the letters in many directions like a crossword. My wife died, he said, a little under a year ago. I'm sorry. He nodded. He seemed to believe I should feel the pain alongside him. Her name was Lenore, Lenny and Lenore. Do you want to know how we met? Of course, I said, and I did. Everybody always wanted to know how everybody else met. It seemed possible the key to life was contained on street corners in springtime when a man retrieved a woman's scarf from the sidewalk. It was on Love Connection, the television program. Wow. It was the first season they were on the air. She wore a purple skirt suit with little white kitten heels. Was she beautiful? Beyond beautiful. That's something extra. Chuck Woolery asked her if she had any fetishes. She said yes, she had two. The first was that shirts and socks have to match. 
She didn't like it if a man wore a white shirt and then black socks. She thought it was sloppy. At this point, Chuck Woolery looked down and he was wearing a white shirt with black socks. Lenore laughed. I don't think anybody in the world will ever have a laugh as wonderful. Tough, said Chuck, if you were Argyles. She didn't laugh that time. She knew how to suspend a man. It's a rare talent. I was jealous of Chuck from the start. I was always worried in the beginning that Lenore was going to love someone better. What was her second fetish? The second fetish was cowboy boots. She said she didn't like them. They disgusted her. They made her think of backwoods things, Jimmy Dean sausage. It sounds, I said, like she didn't understand the meaning of the word fetish. Lenny blinked. She was young. She was hardly 24. I was in my late 30s, probably your age right now. Did you sleep together on the date? I always wondered that about love connection. People did the same things then that they do now. So you fucked right away. Kevin, showered and dressed all in black, came outside at the hottest point of the day. He said hello to both of us on his way to his car. I felt like a whore. Six. The Friday that Alice was working, I dressed in lycra pants and a tank top. I applied mascara and blew out my hair. I drove to the studio. I was sweating so much that warm rivulets ran down my arms. There was no evidence of the crash. It was wiped from the canyon. The air was crisp because it was early and the sun was imposing like in a Hollywood western. In New York, the sun was a pellet. We get over a death as though it happened only in a movie. Looking in the rearview mirror, I absorbed the oil from my cheeks and nose with a powdered rose-scented blotting paper. I stared at my face, hating it, for so long that I became embarrassed for myself, as though others were watching me hate myself and judging me for it. Then I got out and walked languidly to the door, an entirely different person from the one I'd been in the car. When I opened the door, a brass bell tinkled. Like everything else in Los Angeles, it was nothing like what I expected. I expected white, glossy walls and orchids the color of dawn. Instead, there were dusty snake plants and mammalaria in terracotta pots. The green paint was peeling off the walls and the place smelled like summer camp. Waiting in line to register, I watched sweaty, thin women exit with towels around their necks and rolled up mats on cords over their shoulders. I thought of the way men talked about women who'd lost their beauty. I knew what they meant because it was happening to me. There was a fading in the eyes and an overall parch, like an old orange. But I believed it was less a physical change than a byproduct of seeing their husbands become moony over a babysitter as though the babysitter had solved the unsolvable equation or brokered world peace instead of merely braiding the child's hair without the child crying. I paid for a single class, $26 out of a wad of cash that felt like last breaths. I wrote down my age and it looked back at me. Through the glass door I saw her. At first I saw only the back of her head and I was struck at once. Sometimes you can be struck by the back of someone. You won't have to wonder if that person is as striking from the front. When she turned, I gasped. She had the kind of look that you saw very rarely, even in a place full of beautiful girls. She was so unequivocally flawless that I wanted to hit her. My Aunt Goja was the one who told me about her, or left me information about her in any case. When Goja and my mother became close, I was disgusted. She was an interloper, a second wife, and I was jealous. Apparently they talked on the phone often, three times a week or more when I was at school. I couldn't believe I didn't know. I was intimately involved with every part of my mother's routine to her increasing irritation. I can't even change my bloody pad without you in the room. After my parents died... I went to stay with Goja. But living with her was not like living with a caretaker or a mother. 
It was like living with a casual woman friend. We shopped for clothes. She told me I had sex appeal, even at 10 years old, and she showed me how to use it. She let me grow up alone. I went to school, and I came back to the house, and I ate her beet soup with its funny mushroom dumplings. But if I didn't want to eat it, I didn't have to. Most summers I spent in Italy with my mother's cousins. There was a laxity. I didn't have to come home if I didn't want to. But Goja gave me love whenever I needed it. If I wanted to be missed, she missed me. If I didn't, she let me be. I won't be able to give you that. She also gave me all my parents' money that I wasn't supposed to receive until I turned 21. Goja didn't believe that I should be controlled by the government or by her and my uncle. I blew a lot of the money on clothes, on shoes, on hotels with televisions in the bathroom, on caviar and foie gras and steak tartare and oysters. After high school, which was a blur of bad grades, stupid bangs, and cigarettes, I moved into Manhattan. Goja didn't push me to go to college. My first apartment was on Rivington. The kitchen was a short strip of formica with a butter yellow fridge and a rusted white stove, but I was proud of it. I hung my mother's precious Venetian dish towels from the steel rod of the oven door. Goja came in and we would go to Barney's and have tea and poached salmon. She would give me a few hundred dollars every month, even though I was still living off of my inheritance. She bought me expensive shoes. She was the first one to do that. Manolos and Louboutins. One pair of petal pink Chanel mules that I wear only when the weather is gorgeous. Goja told me as much as she knew, but she could not have prepared me for the reality of Alice. Alice had a long, almost mannish nose, but it was offset by the largeness of her blue eyes and the thickness of her lips. It was a trick. Her big nose made you feel like you had to keep looking at her to determine what was so stunning. Her hair was thick and long and the color of Coca-Cola. She wore a bralette and a pair of lycra pants. Her body was cartoonishly perfect. She had an hourglass waist and her hips were dramatically wide. I could picture someone gripping them from behind. She was 27. Alice began the class with sun salutations. Unlike other instructors, she didn't rhapsodize about energy or gratitude. She barely spoke, but when she did, the husk of her voice was hypnotizing. The class made use of small arm weights and leg weights, five-pound sacks to Velcro around the ankles. The music was curated and varied, steampunk, blues, grindcore, Indian, gazal. I tried hard to look elegant in the poses. During Crow, I was cognizant of the sinkhole between my breasts. I watched the men, inserted myself inside their heads, and saw the ways they might bend the young instructor. It was erotic and eviscerating. During Corpse Pose, she played Chibomato's white pepper ice cream. She padded around the room to all the lying bodies, squatted by their heads, and flattened the flesh between their shoulders and chests. When she did this to me... My eyes involuntarily slipped open and we looked at each other. I saw the reflection of her blue eyes in mine. I almost passed out. I got up soon after and left the class before namaste. The encounter left me feeling like I was 60. I wanted to call Vic. I wanted to call Goja. I needed someone I already knew to stabilize me. I had nothing left but Alice. Afterward, I drove to Rodeo Drive because my mother loved it there. She was impossible to please or excite, but there were places she worshipped as though they were cast in gold, and Los Angeles was one of them. She'd seen so many noir films as a young woman, Double Indemnity, Sunset Boulevard, and Los Angeles was the rich, velvety heart of them. I counted palm trees and did not miss New York. I couldn't divorce what had happened in New York from the rest of New York, from the Broom Street Bar with its copper cups and sexy bartender, from Spring Lounge the night I fell for the sexiest man in the world, from midnight on Broadway, way downtown where Manhattan looked like Rome, large and stone, 
and anodyne. All of the city now was slicked in his big, bright blood. We'd visited Rodeo when I was nine, and my parents bought me a dress for $425 that required a slip. It was black with tiny white flowers and a Peter Pan collar. My mother was angry about the dress, but she herself had gotten a pair of ruby earrings, and it was only fair, said my father. Her birthstone is not even ruby, I spat, speaking to my father but looking at my mother. It's garnet. When I see you in my dreams, you are wearing all the dresses I ever wanted. I took the Pacific Coast Highway to sunset. If someone told me this was hell, I wouldn't have been surprised. The palm trees might have risen from beneath the mantle of the earth. But if this was hell, then it was nice, the feeling of having crossed over. I recalled one of the final descents with John Ford, how I felt like a canal that this small, balding man was passing through. I turned around to see his scummy eyes fluttering like a slot machine as he came. Are you a prostitute? A man once asked me. I was eating alone at the bar of a fine restaurant. I had a mouthful of burger. The burger was terrible. It tasted oxidized. I was using my sweater like a blanket over my bare legs. You look like a Sylvie, he said. Is your name Sylvie? I'd loved only one man. Love was not the right word. He didn't love me. To this day, I still couldn't face that. He would have loved Alice. I was eating dinner with that man, the one I loved, when Vic walked in and shot himself. He shot himself in the nose. I tell you the nose because details are important. The splatter of blood on the wall was the shape of a maple leaf. What remained of his face was a suggestion. I saw a fetus once when I worked in the hospital, its image in an ultrasound, and the baby had no nose. The mother, a heavy Brazilian woman, reacted to the news as it was translated for her by a young nurse. She nodded serenely. Como Deus quer, she said. As God wishes. The sunlight was white in Beverly Hills, whereas in Topanga it was orange and gaseous. I was learning that Los Angeles was made up of distinct countries that are merely minutes apart. Not even countries, but ecosystems. The homeless beg differently from town to town. I walked into L'Envent. I was still wearing the same white dress. It made me feel young. I wore also a canvas crossbody bag. On my feet were old, dirty sandals. Women can tell another woman's worth by her shoes and bag. You can wear a tarp across your body, but the shoes and bag have to pass. I was conscious of this when I was greeted by a heavily made-up young blonde. There was a time when I wanted to have a lot of money. I wanted the best of everything because I'd come to realize that expensive things were truly made better, lasted longer, and helped you live longer. Expensive cleaning products did not cause cancer. Chanel nail color lasted at least four days longer than the kind they used in regular salons. All of that was still true, but now I thought of life differently. What I wanted most in that moment, in what I felt might be the last year of my life, was to be poor with a child. To go through the drive through at a fast food restaurant and order two items from the secret menu plus a Coca-Cola to share. Sit in the Dodge, both of us in the front seats, pretending to eat delicately, like we were at a Queen's tea party instead of in the parking lot of a fast food restaurant. The yellow splash of light from the sign would illuminate the crud in the cup holders. In the morning, we would eat milk and biscuits, the kind you can get for free in the breakfast rooms of travel lodges. In the store, I tried on a beautiful pair of emerald suede slingbacks. The sales girl had nothing better to do, so she watched me. My feet were dusty. I lifted my dress to see how the shoes made my calves look. I paraded around in the green heels. I was trying to feel normal, or not even normal, but at the very least like the girl I was before I met Vic. Of course I knew I was half dead already by the time I met Vic, 
A great many segments of myself I pictured to look like the baba o rum my mother used to love. Little yeasty cakes saturated in rum. My lungs, for example. When at night I couldn't breathe, I imagined my lungs were soaked in sweet liqueur. By the time I got to California, it was even worse. I was embarrassed that I'd ever thought I could be a mother. The desire to be beautiful had been replaced by the lowly fear of looking ugly. But seeing Alice had done something I hadn't expected. Her beauty made me remember my own. My phone rang and I picked it up because it was a familiar looking number and I thought it might be my aunt, even though she was dead. It was a woman with whom I'd never spoken, but about whom I knew a lot. Is this Joan, she said. Who is this? My name is Mary. I'm Vic's. I was Vic's wife. The first time Vic and I had sex was in Scotland, but sex has little to do with any first time. For some, it might mean the hand on the knee, the clearing of sticky hair from someone's forehead. The whole team was in Jekyll Island for a conference. I'd already begun to take oceanfront rooms for granted. The first morning, I skipped the group breakfast and went alone to the breakfast room called Jasmine Porch, where I ordered sweet tea and grits and red-eye gravy with a side of country ham. I sat in that spacious dining room looking at all these people who hadn't lived a lot. They were mostly older than me, but I could tell this was their first time drinking from a glass with an iced orchid inside. I was tan and young and careless. The waiter filled my large coffee cup from a polished silver pot. I saw a woman in her early thirties enter the restaurant using two canes to walk. Her husband and their child walked ahead of her, following a hostess to a table, and an older woman, her mother probably, was holding the younger woman's elbow. I had this urge to send over something, French toast for the table. After all, the firm was paying for our meals. I called the waiter, but before I could ask him, Vic materialized. I wish I could include a picture of him. I don't have any. He was more of a feeling sometimes. His nice but too big suits. So much suit material, like a factory. Hey, kid, he said, looming. Oh, hey. Rolling solo? I wasn't feeling a group situation. Me neither. Mind if I intrude? I had with me a departures and wanted badly to be alone. I knew the precise color I wanted my coffee and how to have an orgasm in under 30 seconds. I needed everybody in the world, including waiters, less than they needed me. Sure, I said. Sure you mind, or... He was terribly afraid of me. He was the most gorgeous listener in the whole world. Of course I don't mind. How had he found me? How did he always seem to find me? One time, inexplicably, he found me on the second floor of a deli with buffet islands of old but glistening orange chicken. He sat down and I forgot about sending over the French toast to the handicapped woman. I didn't remember until later that night in Vic's grand hotel room with the ocean just below us. I'd never stayed in such places with my parents. It was me and this other girl who worked at the copy desk and who'd brought a complaint of unwanted sexual aggression to HR, and this young man, a sort of lackey of Vic's, but then everyone was. Vic had a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue, and we were drinking it on the balcony from rocks glasses with pebbled bottoms. Vic's room was a suite, so he had a couch out there, and we dragged two chairs from the bedroom. It started out with the two of us girls on the couch, but at some point the pairings got rearranged and Vic was on the couch with me. I'd had two glasses of scotch on top of the three glasses of red wine at dinner. I don't know if I laid my head down. My guess is that he, by measured increments, lowered it down. 
Oh, poor tired baby. I remember only the airplane runway of his lap, the navy miles, the ocean shushing, the other two watching me lie across him. Nothing happened, but merely the position of my head on his lap. It was somewhat a rape. That he had hunted me so quietly that I had allowed my neck to get caught in the teeth of something stupid. I closed my eyes so that it was happening only for the others and not to me, and that was when I remembered about the handicapped woman. And I felt sad about not sending the French toast with vanilla bourbon cream and whatever lavender flowers came on the side. Then a moment later, I thought, she doesn't need you, idiot. She has a mother and a child. You have nothing. That was the first time with Vic. He caressed my hair, my earlobe, which thereafter felt whorish and diseased. Anyway, that's what Vic's wife, Mary, that's what she asked me. How did it start, she said. I told her to hold the line, that it might be a while. I walked out of L'Envent in the heels I was wearing. It's easiest to steal when you don't know you're stealing. The heavily made-up blonde had been watching me the whole time, but she was violently texting when I walked out. They were display shoes, so they didn't make a peep when they walked me out of there. Suddenly I was in the sunshine in these bright, beautiful L'Envent slingbacks. Their strings were like thin snakes around my ankles. Tourists were ordering cupcakes from a cupcake ATM. They were Italian and laughing. The shoes took me to Spago. I was seated in the courtyard. It was windless out there. I was early for lunch and everybody seemed to enjoy my presence, the busboys especially. I ordered the main lobster salad and a glass of Dr. Lozen. I unmuted the phone. I'm sorry, I said. Can you repeat the question? I want to know how it started. I didn't say anything for a long time and held the phone to my ear and my hand to the mouthpiece as the waiter poured me a glass. He smiled at me conspiratorially, like here we were being Bacchanalian and the person on the other end of that line was probably folding laundry. Do you understand the question? Yes, perfectly, I said. I think it's what I'd want to know, too. It started on his lap. She made a noise of disgust that doubled as reproach, like I was stupid to lay my head on a married man's lap. You know my husband is dead, of course. But do you know my young son got into an accident a month ago? And he's dead now, too? You didn't know that, did you? You cunt. I had, up until now, taken many measures not to think of the children. Because it was a cold dish that only needed assembling, and because I was the first customer of the afternoon, my lobster salad was delivered quickly. Bright wedges of avocado. The arico ver were glossy and dark, the bacon was crisp and auburn, and the lobster was so fresh it looked raw. I didn't. How? He drowned. Now Mary began to make these little noises on the other end like a guinea pig. Vic had met her in high school. He told me he'd never cheated on his wife with anyone other than me. It might have been a lie, but I didn't think so. He'd probably slept with five or six women before her, high school girls in the 60s. I pictured no condoms, and the girls just going home and angling a faucet to exhume it out of them. Maybe there was an abortion or two. I bet I was the first woman he did not come inside, and anything new for a man can be an erotic discovery. I started crying. I knew something of the world in which Mary was now living— the heart pills he'd no longer need. Things in the refrigerator are the worst because you cannot save them indefinitely. What if the dead person comes back and wants his coffee yogurt? But the child, I couldn't imagine. Or I could imagine. 
Before I even found you, I imagined losing you. It felt like someone was serving my heart to me on a plate and forcing me to carve out pulsing segments and eat them without condiments. Why are you crying? I'm sorry, I said. I shouldn't be crying. I didn't ask for him that way. I'm so sorry about your boy. You're a lying cunt. She would never understand. If I'd said, go home to your wife, you pig, he would have wanted me even more and her even less. You can't say these things to any woman, let alone a grieving one. I'm sorry, I said more quietly. I'm calling, she said, for another thing. My daughter, Eleanor, in case he never told you their names, I don't know where she is. She hates you. She said she wants to kill you. And I'm thinking, if she's coming for you, if she comes for you, will you give me the dignity of telling me? I nodded into the phone. Do you hear me, you cunt? Yes, I said. I thought of the word dignity and wanted to kill myself. Seven. On the way home, I took two milligrams of Klonopin. It worked enough for me to forget a little about the child, but it would come back in terrible notions. Anime eyes blinking inside of a child-sized coffin. When I walked into my place, I found my landlord sitting on my couch. I had no one to turn to, aghast. Darling, he said, standing, I'm so sorry, I feel so awful. I've been here pacing, wanting to off myself. Leonard? Yes, my darling. Is it over? Did you do it? Do what? You didn't do it, and that's all right. That's fine, darling. We will get through. We will manage. Come sit by me, my life. Let's eat a nice dinner and see a funny movie. He had a drink in one hand and a book in the other. William Carlos Williams, spring and all. His hair was rumpled. There were green stains on his collared white shirt. Lenny, I think you're confused. Yes, and I've confused you. I'm a terrible man, Lenore, and I don't deserve our life. Come close to me, my body, my woman in blue. I worked for a few months at a supermarket in Utah, sealing chicken breasts in plastic. My boss was a man in a cowboy hat and a bolo tie. He always had his hands in his pockets. He went crazy one day and shot his wife in the neck. Of course, these things don't happen one day. It was likely brewing for months. But how could I have noticed, sealing chickens and not looking at the clock for chunks of time, so that I might be pleasantly surprised at how much of it had passed? But when the police came and they started asking questions, I recalled how my boss had several times called me Shelly. Shelly, we need more breasts on the cooler and transfer yesterday's into the discount section. I never corrected him. I hadn't seen the point at the time. Lenny. Love? Leonard, I said. I'm not Lenore. I think you're having an episode. I said this calmly. I watched his mind return to his body. As reality crept in, his color faded. His face drooped, and he appeared a decade older. He looked around the room, realizing it was his old house and that he didn't live there anymore. Oh, God. It's all right. Why don't you sit back down? I'll get you a glass of water. Jesus, I'm embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. Don't be. Grief does strange things to you. I can only imagine. It's awful. One day someone is screaming at you for how you're driving. The next day you're free. I brought him warm tap water in a dusty glass. 
On top of the grief, he said, there are also the drugs I did in my youth. What sorts? LSD, mescaline, peyote, and on. They make me lose my mind for a stretch, here and there. I thought of the groceries I'd bought on the way home, the milk warming out there in the heat. The second child's death had twisted my intestines. Going to grocery stores was one of the best ways I knew to calm myself. The clean, cool aisles. Everything was brightly lit at any time of day. Do you mind, Lenny? I have to get my groceries from the car. I'll be right back. Let me get them. Let me be a gentleman so I don't feel like an embarrassment. No, stay. It was almost four and I decided to cook him dinner. I had many fresh vegetables and they wouldn't all fit in the fridge. In the beginning, I cooked for Vic all the time in my apartment. You shouldn't do that. If you cook for a man and you cook very well, as I did, they will think you belong to them. The truth was, I was always practicing for a man I might actually love. Big Sky, for example. With every crisp quail I roasted for Vic, I was perfecting my technique for Big Sky. There would be long oak tables set for Thanksgiving in his deluxe lodge in the mountains. There would be twigs and pine cones strewn about, no tablecloths, and fresh sparkling water with twists of lime. Lenny sat on one of my modern bar stools, which were out of place in that rustic hovel. He watched me mince garlic. My mother minced garlic very quickly, so fast I would always check that all her fingers were still there when she was done. I took my time. Unlike her, I didn't have a child at my knee and a husband on his way home. But this time I minced sloppily. I nearly sliced my finger. My mind was on that phone call. I hadn't thought about the people Vic left behind. Not enough, anyway, until I heard her voice. When you've suffered as much as I have, you begin to see everything in perspective. You know exactly the ways in which people will move on, and you know that they will laugh again. It makes their present suffering seem prosaic. What are you making? I'm sautéing broccoli with garlic, red pepper flakes, and breadcrumbs. Sounds spicy. Are you one of these old men who can't tolerate spice? You have some cruelty in you. Let me tell you, men love cruelty. It reminds them of every time their fathers or mothers didn't think they were good enough. Cruelty looks better on a woman than the perfect dress. How about gluten? Salt? How's your heart? He knocked his chest. Strong, he said. A few things I have are still strong. I knew he meant between his legs. I wanted him to know that there was nobody left in the world who would fuck him. We opened a bottle of wine. Garlic skipped in the pan. When I tossed the thick stalks of the leek, Lenny said, you can tell the worth of a woman by how much food she wastes. There were moments like that when I wanted to strangle him. And then he would compliment me, tell me my hair was like onyx, or reach with an old arm to fill my glass. I asked about Lenore because it soothed me to hear people talk about love like it was real. I want you to know about Lenore, about the women who men make you feel are better than you. I want you to know about everything I may not be able to teach you. Lenny was happy to oblige. They'd known each other only a month before he asked her to marry him, and the wedding was two weeks later. He went on about their honeymoon in Anguilla, snorkeling in creamy pineapple drinks. A friend of his got them upgraded to a suite in one of the finest hotels. Two bedrooms, two giant marble bathrooms. Lenore said she would be able to maintain their girlish mystery with the second bathroom for at least ten more days. They made love on both beds. The poor mate, he said with a grin, like it turned him on that the housekeeper had to make two dirty beds. There was a jacuzzi on the balcony, stone and round. Just beneath their room, palm trees and white muslin umbrellas ringed a giant blue pool. 
There were buckets full of sparkling wine and bikinis and bright colors, and more women than men in sunglasses and straw hats, reading tall, glossy magazines, and nobody as far as the eye could see in distress. Nobody who had just come from a hospital or knew they might have to go back. He said he looked at all the women in their bathing suits, some in thong bottoms with their nice rears exposed, and not one of them, he said, held a candle to Lenore. And just beyond all of that luxury, they were blessed with the Caribbean ocean, teal and endless, rolling gently against the bone shore. Did you ever have second thoughts, I asked, since you hadn't known her very long? Let me tell you something, he said, looking into my eyes like an asshole. If a man takes longer than two, three months to ask you to marry him, he doesn't love you. He won't ever love you. Do you have a man in your life? Until recently, I did. Did he provide for you, financially speaking? I thought about that for a moment. Vic had indeed provided for me. He promoted me several times. He bought me plane tickets and couches and computers, fine wines and a substantial wine cooler in which to store them. In a way, I didn't need. So he provided for you. I nodded. Did you leave him in New York? Did he leave you? I suppose, in a way, we left each other. There's no such thing. Old men are so sure of everything. He was forking broccoli into his mouth. I tried to determine whether he had dentures, or he could have had caps. He came from a wealthy family. Now he was worried about air conditioners. But that is how all old people end. More surely than we fly toward death, we go to parsimony. He killed himself. I said. Eight. When I was ten, I drank grappa in Grosseto, down the hill from my parents and the cousins, in a field that had nothing to do with farms or horses but was full of haystacks. It was late September. The horizon was a stand of cypress, some scattered clouds, and a dry field the remnants of an old olive grove. I met a boy named Mossy, short for Massimiliano. Max, I would tell my friends back home. He was much older, 14. His red hair was too thick, but everything else was consciously set there by God for a small American girl to love. He was the last boy to make me feel worthy, to put me on a pedestal the way Lenny had for Lenore. Of course, that sense of worth coincided with the fact that I had not yet been to hell. We were at a villa party given by posh distant relatives of my mother's. The day lasted forever. A string quartet played hallelujah on the tall, crunchy grass. There were figs in that grass, heavy as hearts. I'd seen the boy playing soccer noticed his strong, tan legs and skillful footwork. What does a girl love at ten? What will you love? I loved the air around this boy. It was mixed with strong cigarettes of the men and the flowery perfume of the ladies and the lemons in the trees. I stared at the boy as I sat beside my father. I felt babied by my father's hand on my shoulder as he spoke to a circle of men, smoking and drinking, most of them paunchy. I'd eaten so much of the shrimp cocktail being passed around that one of the men appraised me in what I'm fairly sure was a sexual manner. He said to my father, the girl likes expensive things. She will have to marry a man with money. My father smiled. No, he said in his decent Italian, she will make it on her own. I'd thought of that often since then my father's belief in me. My mother thought I would need to marry someone with money. Maybe she thought that because of her own life. Either way, the boy, Mossy, was from a wealthy family. I was thinking of pleasing my mother. On top of that, or because of that, 
I wanted to kiss him more than I'd wanted anything outside of my mother's love. Mossy looked at me several times. Italian boys are good at eye contact. I looked older than ten in an off-the-shoulder dress with my long, dark hair and the coral lipstick from my mother's purse. I'd wanted to fall in love since kindergarten. I'd always had crushes, had liked boys since Jeremy Braun with the calloused thumbs. Four years earlier, in the lingerie section of a department store, I'd picked a sapphire teddy off the rack, with trickling garters and a net bodice. I begged my mother for it, and my mother, because she was either innocent to the request or uniquely understanding of it, let me have the silky bedroom thing. In the privacy of the house, I wore it, baggy and bright, over my colt legs and flat chest. I watched my mother get drunk. She was laughing uncharacteristically loudly with some of the musicians. Most of the time, she stood beside a stone-faced beautiful woman with an ivory cigarette holder. I felt a hatred rise up in me that day, one that had always lurked. My mother locked me out of her bedroom many nights of our life, and I cried and begged at the door, pushing my finger pads against the cheap pine. And where was my father? I couldn't think it had been so long ago, but I remembered the bitterness I felt, and it came back around now, seeing my mother laughing with new people in a somewhat wanton way, wearing a necklace of bones around her neck. Ah, my mother's bone necklace. So that was when the boy, when Massimiliano, came around with his rich red hair and his confident saunter and his attempts at speaking my language. Would going for a walk with me? I took off with him. My father was distracted, and he would always think I was his little girl, sexlessly beautiful. So we walked out of the sight line of the guests, down into the cool shade of a cypress grove. Mossy picked up some figs and placed them in my hands. He'd hidden away a half bottle of grappa from one of the tables. It seemed the worst thing in the world if he were a cousin, but I didn't ask. I only thought it, and my cheeks glowed like the stove burners we had in the Pocono house, the glass kind without iron that got hot and red behind your back. You wait for me, he said, and left and came back with two juice glasses. He took the figs from my hands and put them in the cups and filled them with two inches of grappa. You say cheers? he said, and we sipped our grappa, and I almost choked, but first love like that inures you. That was the year before the year my parents died, and if only I had known. But I did know. I knew for the whole sunny day, when at night we went back to the fig, and it was swollen with one of the strongest liquors I knew. When the boy kissed me, the tongue and the lips, more sensual than I'd imagined, I was drunk in a way that was more mature than any drunk I would ever be in the future, and I knew that this was the first and last perfect day of my life. I wanted to tell Alice about that day. I wanted to rub her face in the cow-trampled grass. I wanted her to know everything that she had taken from me. Nine. The next day, I was hired at the health food store. Nothing had ever come so easily. A man called. His name was Jim, and I would never meet him. He burped on the other end of the line. The phone call was supposed to be an interview, but it seemed I was hired before we even spoke. We need someone every day. Can you work the whole day those days? I was frying an egg on my yellow range. Every time I accepted a job, I felt terrorized, like I was about to be sent to jail. For most, it's the opposite. The money is freeing, so they see the hours of work as a way out. I've had a strange relationship with money, as I've told you. I've been gifted things that are worth an entire year of steaming milk at a coffee shop. Yes, I said. When I flipped the egg, the yolk ran. I was so heartbroken that I stopped listening until Jim said the hourly rate. It was less than half a yoga class at the studio. 
In the news that week, a lawmaker said that destitute Americans who complain about the price of health care should forego buying the new phone they want and use the money on insurance instead. Sound good? Out the window, I saw River. He was loading heavy-looking panels into the back of his work truck. On the side, it said, Solar Forward. A son was pushing a lawnmower. He wore a bandana and a white T-shirt. I watched his arms crank in the sunlight. Yes, I said. When should I start? Tomorrow. Perfect. I figured I could always quit right away. Really, I had just wanted to get off the phone. The previous night, Leonard hadn't left until I yawned three times, the final time very aggressively. I'd washed all the dishes. I'd banged around so many pans, but he either didn't take the hint or didn't want to. After he left, I'd taken two pills and tried not to think of Vic's boy. I went outside. I walked by River while he was in the back of his truck, and I opened my car. Nothing made sense to grab. I picked up a pack of gum from the hairy console. Hey, he said. He was so awake. I smiled and shielded my eyes from the light and hated myself for waking up late almost every day of my life. So weird, I had a dream about you. Oh? Yeah, you were this wolf lady, huh? Not in a bad way. Because of that song, I guess. You tore through the house looking for blankets, which is nuts because of how hot it's been. The kid in New York, Jack, had been like this. Young boys make you feel wanted, but also like they could take you or leave you. Jack had long balls that hung like Dolly's clocks. He was unembarrassed about them. He would come to my apartment from the place he shared in Hoboken with two other boys. He would say my apartment was in violation of a fun code. It had not enough fun for weeks. When I missed him, I wrote, all in lowercase, something about something I had to show him. Are you trying to lure me into your city fort? He replied. I don't know, am I? It's just that the city fort is buckling under the weight of its lack of fun code violation. It needs to be violated. Vic knew about Jack. He was the one who gave him the name The Kid. He used to call me that until I started seeing someone so young. Are you going to get ravaged by the kid this weekend? Vic would ask. I told Vic about Jack's long coral balls. He would ask if I served the kid cookies and milk after we fucked. If he sensed my anger, he would say, just joshing, kid. A woman like you will always be a girl. He's the luckiest dope in the world until you're through with him. River was even more attractive than Jack had been. I laughed off his dream, even though it had the power to make me feel gamey. I told him to have a good day at work, and I walked back to my door in a way that would make him look at my backside. I was wearing small gray pajama shorts. The pills hit, and my head went wavy. Just inside the door, I pressed medium hard with two fingers up between my thighs. I could have come like that right then. I wanted to, and then call Vic, say there was a new kid on the block. I felt sick to my stomach. I didn't know how to dress for my first day of work at the health cafe. I'd always wished I didn't care so much. I have my mother's clothes to give you and a few of my favorite pieces. You can throw it all away, but I found it's nice to have fabric. It stores memory in an accessible way. I parked in the small lot. My Dodge looked old and sad next to two impudent convertibles. I walked by the studio but did not look inside. It was daunting to know she was in there. I imagined her sitting on the bench made of a single tree, my mother and my father flanking her. They would be talking about me as though I wouldn't understand something. Picturing the three of them together was one of the most sordid things I had ever done. When I walked in, Natalia was rinsing mugs in the immense silver sink. How are you? I said, looking into her big Bambi eyes. 
Uh, good, she said, and asked if I wanted a coffee, which was nice. It seemed we were going to pretend the accident we'd witnessed together had never happened. I could tell she was nervous to be training someone nearly two decades older than she was. I half listened about everything except the coffee machine and the cash register. Both things had so many parts and I was nervous to make a mistake. Natalia was not a good teacher. She spoke too quietly and too quickly and hurried over the important things. To help her relax, I asked where she was from. She was so stupid. Salinas, she said. My dad works on a farm. It was the most she volunteered. She asked absolutely nothing of me. She came very close to me while demonstrating a knob under the La Marzocco. She smelled like drugstore vanilla perfume. When she texted on her phone, her pretty pink nails stabbed the screen adroitly. I flipped through the manual for the coffee machine. I read the ingredients on the chocolate bars. Around noon, the bell over the door jingled and a man walked in. He was in his fifties and wrecked and seedy and handsome. How are you doing, Natalia? He said. Good, thanks, she said. He looked at me. How are you? He said. He said it like he didn't need a response, but it was enough for me. I nodded and smiled. I ferried the dry mugs from the rack onto the shelf. He ordered a green soup from Natalia. The cook, a shrewd Mexican woman named Rita, made it once every three days and it lived in a vat. It was a puree of asparagus, kale, and onions and full of butter. The whole canyon was crazy for it. He went to sit outside. I'd been struck by him and suddenly realized why. He reminded me of Big Sky, of what Big Sky would look like a decade from now. Alice would make me see these things, my penchant for a certain flavor of man, a certain type of imbecilic self-destruction. Is he a regular? I asked Natalia. Dean, yeah, he used to be famous. What's his last name? Um, I don't know, but he was Dr. Johnson, the lead singer of them. When his soup was ready, I told Natalia I'd take it out to him. I didn't know much about Dr. Johnson. I knew the song Jessica's Father and that they sang Shel Silverstein poems. He was leaning back in his chair, his jeaned legs spread. His loafers were expensive and his brows reddish as though he tried to dye them from gray. I could tell he'd had eyelid surgery, and I can't explain why I was attracted to old, young acting men. I also liked big noses, dishonest expressions, men who couldn't be bothered but were friendly. Ego. Former high school quarterbacks. Cheaters. Goddess soup, I said, setting the earthenware bowl down in front of him. Thank you. You're new? I am. New to the canyon as well? Yes. How do you like it so far? Oh, I don't know. That was a stupid question. I hate when people ask me stupid questions like that. He smiled. I could see clear through to his young self. I saw older men the way they still saw themselves. That was why they liked me so much. I was a solar panel, absorbing and refracting and re-energizing. It can get strange up here, he said, but it's the best air in Los Angeles. He had an accent like just about every man I've liked. Big Sky, of course, had an accent. He'd grown up down south. His voice was heroic. Accents are also a lie. I met him in a nice bar on Wall Street beneath street level with hanging lamplights and red leather banquettes. This was during Vic. Almost always in my life, there had been one man I desired who was giving me nothing, at the same time that there was another who didn't move me, but from whom I was taking very much. Big Sky wore a cashmere jacket, 
underneath it a fishing vest. The second I saw him, I thought, here is the greatest man in all of Manhattan. We made eye contact from 30 feet away. He had blue eyes, too. A deeper blue even than my father's. I began to sweat as he walked toward me, instant dampness under my arms. I had a plate of oysters in front of me and a glass of Gewürztraminer. He was on his way to the bathroom. He purposefully paused near my seat and the bartender introduced us. We said hello and right away we both knew what was between us. On his way back from the bathroom, he asked me about my oysters. Like an asshole, I talked about why I preferred West Coast to East. After politely but ludicrously asking if he could try one, he slurped it off its rocky beach like he knew how much I already wanted him. He was there with a friend, a blondish man who was married and lived in the suburbs. The chasm between them was considerable. The friend was a regular guy with a regular tie. He took the train into work and his wife didn't have to worry. I wondered if Big Sky's wife had to worry. I saw a picture of her when he showed me one of his young son. Long brown hair, in shape, uninteresting legs. She'd held a good job in the city, something creative, before quitting it for the kid. She was from a city and from a family that made Big Sky proud. She ran every morning around the park. Big Sky pointed at his friend with a gorgeous thumb. He still gives up shit for Lent, isn't that tragic? I laughed too loud. The bar intended for after-work cocktails began to clear at 9 p.m. The bartender opened the door and I felt the cool spring air. I got cold. I was wearing a sleeveless dress. A man I knew from the bar came by with his coat, a thick patchwork pelt, and draped it across my shoulders. It was heavy and it laid across my slight frame in a tyrannical manner. It wasn't a nice gesture. It was like he'd rolled his balls out and stretched the sticky dough against me. Men were always putting their coats around my shoulders. They marked their territory that way. It's better to freeze to death. Big Sky had been in the bathroom or making a phone call and I thought of nothing but him. But also I had tolerated other people's conversation because the first day you meet someone like that, you still have your self-decency. You still can have an interest in life beyond every tendril of their hair. He came back and said, what's this? And he took the pelt off of me and replaced it with his cashmere jacket. He laid it across my shoulders and one of his fingers brushed my flesh and he said, that's better, isn't it? The friend left because he had to catch a train. We talked for an hour more. He worked in finance. He spoke candidly of what was going on, the collapse of Wall Street. He looked me in the eye over his bitter smelling beer and said that he and all the men down there were a sad bunch of losers. We don't create shit, he whispered at my mouth. We trade paper. It's all worthless. It was the same type of thing Tim had said. But Big Sky made even more money. His dishonor was grander, sexier. When men tell you they are pieces of shit, when they tell you they are scumbags, they do it because they subconsciously know that you are hooked. It hooks you more. They push you away to pull you in, and the most terrible thing is they don't even do it on purpose. I told him I needed an accountant, that I was in the midst of my own collapse. He smiled and said he had the best one. He said he himself would give me sound investment advice. He said his accountant was the type who should go to jail but never would. Write or call me, he said. I'll make an intro. Then he said he should go too. He wrote down his full name and number and email on an order slip. I went home that night feeling beautiful. A couple of days later, I wrote to him. My note was all business, and he wrote back, How about a drink next wed? 
He wasn't much for punctuation, which I liked because it showed confidence and carelessness. Sure, I said. Same place. He wrote, how about Spring Lounge? It was north about 20 blocks from the people he worked with and the place I lived. I walked the whole way there. It was a bright day in early spring. I wore a leather halter top and jeans and riding boots. I'd pulled my hair into two loose pigtails. Some hypochondriacal thoughts were passing through. Cancer mostly. A black and blue on the inside of my arm that I thought could be the first sign of blood cancer. A sharp headache meant it had now spread to my brain. I soothed myself with the thought that if I were dying, it would all be over soon, including not being able to have this man who was the only man for whom I had ever felt this strongly, even after just one meeting. I thought about turning back, but I looked good and a part of me knew I needed this, that you can't turn away from feelings like this even if they're wrong. I called my aunt, who told me to go inside, that, for God's sake, it was the most beautiful day. So I did, and right away I saw him. Spring Lounge had these old picture windows with fly wings in the seams, and the Easter time sun was shining on his face. All the anxiety left me at once. He looked imaginary, wearing the same fishing vest and a pair of cargo pants. I would come to know and love it as his uniform. He'd ordered us two beers and held a corner table. I hope you don't mind, he said. I took the liberty of ordering you a Stella. I said hello and thanked him and said I had to run to the bathroom, where I looked in the mirror and screamed at my reflection. John Fogarty drowned me out. I was in love. We had a couple of beers and everyone in there was less excited than we were. We glowed together. I was proud of a lot of things about myself. The way I always knew how to make a dish taste better with salt or turmeric or parmesan or lemon zest or cardamom. How I could make another person feel comfortable or feel smaller. How I was rarely drunk or out of my own control. I was even proud of my pain. It made me enigmatic and aware. But I had never felt better about myself than I did in that moment, with the sunlight coming through those filthy pretty windows, sitting next to that man. This secret accountant of yours sounds like he will be unbelievably helpful. I've gotten myself into a number of untenable situations. Listen, he said, leaning his chest across the table. Truth is... I'm not just trying to help you. Look, I was excited to come here. Looked forward to it all damn week. I blushed. And then we did what people in illicit situations do. We pretended something untoward hadn't been said, but enjoyed all around ourselves the warmth of it. I tried several times to pay for a beer of his as a thank you, I said. But he kept saying, no, that's not how it works gentlemen pay. I'm a certain type of woman. Okay, buy me a drink somewhere else, certain type of woman. This place is getting beat. We walked to Tom and Jerry's, a bar that had the same bearded bartender for years. On the walk, he smoked a one-hitter. He smoked good pot. I thought it was sexy. We walked by a church in Soho, and he told me about its engravings. He knew the histories of places. He knew good bars. He was of an indeterminate wealth, somewhere in between a two-bedroom in Chelsea and a classic six on the Upper West Side. I said something funny and he laughed, and then he stopped us on a block of Manhattan that I would, in the desolate future, walk over and over, trying to reconstruct the essence of that first night. I would stand in the very spot he'd stopped us. This is so weird. Seriously, it's like the best first date I've ever had. Only I'm married. I was so happy. I was too happy. I should have played it cool. I'd have given anything to go back and play it cool. At Tom and Jerry's, we sat side by side at the bar. We drank gin and tonics. 
He complimented my hair and my intelligence. Our thighs were touching, my jeans against his loose khakis. I felt the heat of his leg through the material. I had never wanted someone more. I have never wanted someone more, he said. I have a wife and a baby at home. I have to get out of here. He paid and we left, and outside it had started to rain, turning the streets darker. That little stretch of Elizabeth Street would become hallowed. Within months, it would feel like the love of my life was buried under the cigarette packs and the fallen magnolia blossoms. He hailed a cab. One flew past. We didn't want that one anyway, he said laughing. A second came and stopped, and Big Sky opened the door for me. As I was getting in, he took hold of my shoulder. Hey, he said. Jesus. His face looked like a wolf's. He had a long nose and clever blue eyes. He didn't look like a liar. His self-centeredness was sexy. May I kiss you on the mouth, he said. The cab driver's impatience was palpable, but nobody else mattered. Yes. He came forward. My heart was a rock knocking in my chest. The kiss was open-mouthed but tongueless and lasted no longer than three seconds. It was more sex, that kiss, than any sex I had ever had. Maybe it wasn't love, but I don't know what to call how I felt inside that moment. Do you see how it's a cycle? I was standing there with the lead singer of a 70s folk band. I was attracted to this faded man because he looked like Big Sky. Because I craved men who had big, happy lives of which I would never be a part. The experience of Big Sky gored me. In a way, Big Sky was responsible for Vic's death. One man like that can be responsible for every big and small thing in a woman's life. A woman he isn't married to, whom he doesn't think very much about at all. But it's not the man's fault. The man is nothing. It's what you think you are missing inside of yourself. I promise that you are missing nothing. I didn't know if I could bear to see Alice again. I like to think I was lying in wait, sharpening a knife. But really, I was only postponing the last thing I had left to fear. I considered writing her a letter. Dear Alice, I have had a lifetime of suffering. From what I know, you have not. I have something to tell you, and you have something to tell me. I am all alone. I thought about killing myself, but I wanted to meet you first. I am depraved. I hope you like me. On the way home from the cafe, I passed River walking with a dog. They were on the crest of the lookout just before Comanche. The sun and the greens framed them. The dog was a mutt, gray and brown with a beard like a schnauzer and robust as a shepherd. River came to my open window and said, this is Kurt. He told me Kurt was a stray he'd found on the stairs hike at Murphy Ranch Trail. Men and their dogs. They will bring them everywhere and never forsake them. Unlike their women, children, dogs want nothing of a man except all the things a man wants to give. He had no leash for the dog, yet the animal waited pleasantly beside him while we spoke. There's something admirable about a man who can keep a stray dog at his heels. It made me want to have sex with him. Every single thing I did was to make that young man want to fuck me. Who are these people who have platonic conversations? They are adults. I rubbed my chin against my shoulder, exposing half of my neck. I couldn't tell if that had turned him on, so I did 20 more things. Envying another woman made me ugly with need. I had to leave first. You must always be the first to go. So I said goodbye and drove away like a person who drives unsafely. I passed the house with the aluminum gate all the way around. Palm trees rose from behind the metal, and bougainvillea strangled itself against it. You couldn't see anything in the distance. 
Much of the canyon was that way. Behind a wall of trees and fencing, there might be a glorious house with good cars in the driveway, horses in the distance and crops, or there might be a commune like ours, sandy adobe structures, the occult. That house, Lenny had told me, was the site of a former swinger's haven called Sandstone. Communal bathrooms and sleeping areas, hot tubs, naked women rinsing their legs in natural springs. You would go for a daytime interview, and if you were deemed suitable, you could come back that night for a trial evening. If you were trim and attractive, you might be invited to become a member. Lenny talked about it like he'd only heard tales and never visited. But he spoke in great detail of tan women with cornrows jumping on cowhide trampolines as the sun fell behind the red mountains. Just then, as I passed the rusting gate, I had the premonition that I was going to become a killer. Ten. One of the reasons I worked in the hospital downtown was to desensitize myself. I would still wake screaming in the night, feeling around my bed for their bodies. So I watched as emergency room doctors spoke to one another casually, arms swinging imaginary golf clubs while all around them short and long lives were ending. I went to work in a hospital so that I might learn the drill. That death was common and not so bad. It didn't work. One September afternoon, a woman came to find her pigtailed child intubated. The child had pursued a butterfly across the street, away from the teachers at the playground. She'd been hit by a bus. The mother could not understand. But a bus is so big, she kept saying. The nurses didn't get it, but I did. She meant how could a bus only hit her daughter's twig body? Merely hit. I begged the nurses to undo the child's hair, and they snarled at me like I was an idiot. But I knew that when the mother saw the pigtails, she wouldn't be able to make any rational decisions. What worked better for desensitization was kicking Tim. Tim worked at AIG, and this was during the collapse of Wall Street. So many terrible things will come to pass after the collapse that I wonder how big a deal it will seem to you. But back then it was a dark time for dark people. The men who'd been pulling in millions a year were suddenly broke or scared. I met him in a restaurant. I was always eating alone those days before Vic. Tim was with another man like him, and they were seated beside me at the bar where, a few months later, I would meet Big Sky. I'd heard them order a 1966 bottle of French First Growth at $1,400. The other man had 17 stents in his heart. He ordered the steak and ate the fries off Tim's plate. Elvis was playing from the sound system. The bartender poured the wine into a goosenecked carafe. It was a little darker than old blood. They offered me a taste. I said no, 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 and they insisted. The bartender got me a glass and watched Tim to see when he should quit the poor. Think of how terrible that feels, to not even want the wine and then be metered out some amount. To be sized up. Was I worth a $100 taste or a $250 taste? How do you like it, Tim asked me. He was balding and wore a shirt with a contrast collar. He had large teeth and the kind of eyes that looked like they were in the middle of a sex act no matter what he was doing. It's no yellowtail, I said. They didn't know to laugh right away. Eventually Tim did because I gave him one of my gazes. I stayed for another glass. The bartender wiped down the bar and the smell of ribeye faded out the door. Back then, the blue-collar men who worked at Ford would think of Wall Street and their veins would bulge. They thought of bars like that one, labels of wine that worked out to $350 a goblet. It's not that I was sympathetic to men like Tim. There was no pitiable plight of the Wall Streeter. But the other end of it was oversimplified. The hatred was misplaced, and men like Tim, if anything, 
wanted you to hate them. If you told them they were not evil, they would say that yes, they were. Men don't necessarily want to be the bad guys, but they don't want to be the ordinary ones either. Down here, Tim said to me, gesturing around the bar at the bottles of men and the glasses of women, you know at the end of every day, whether we had a good day or a bad day. You can tell the market by the mood of this bar. We work hard and we play hard, and at night we're either celebrating or we're drowning our sorrows. It's not healthy. It's like a boxer after a round. Good or bad, it makes you dysfunctional. I suppose I liked his honesty. He was somewhat guileless and somewhat a gentleman. Vic would end up being similar. All these paltry stand-ins for my father. When I went to pay my check that night, my card was declined. This had never happened to me. Or I should say, this was just the beginning of those sorts of things happening. I've got her, Tim said to the bartender. He had a platinum card between his knuckles like a blade. It wasn't inexpensive, my bill. I'd ordered the foie gras and the steak tartare, plus a few glasses of wine. Eating like that was the only way I knew to console myself. He took my phone number and I took his, and the next day I was about to write to him to say that I would send a check to his work address. But he wrote to me first. He asked me if I knew any women, any girls, for a friend of his who liked to be kicked. Another message followed right away. I'm the friend, it said with a little winking face. I looked around my room. It was an attractive and clean apartment that I had recently moved into and feared losing. It was barely furnished because I'd lost the job at the hospital downtown. I hadn't lost it. The contract had run out. The previous week I'd canceled my cable service and returned two dresses I'd already worn to Bergdorf. They accepted anything in those days, with the tags gone, with the smell of cigarettes. It wasn't without a price, of course. The women would gather the garment into their arms, sniff it, and look back at you like you were trash. I think I have a friend who might be interested, I wrote back. One minute later, I wrote, I'm the friend. Kicking Tim was healthier than all those steak dinners with Vic. Like just straight with the toe? I was standing in his hotel room at the Soho Grand. The room was very small but tasteful and dark. He was up against a wall in his nice work shirt and tasteful boxers. Black, thin socks rose up the calves of his pale legs. I wore a pinstriped skirt suit with a high slit and a pair of heels he just bought me in the meatpacking district. I was upset because I'd let him pick them out. Peep-toed black patent leather slingbacks. Stupid. He nodded quickly because to give instruction would have gone against the spirit of the thing. Primly, I brought my leg back, then smashed his testicles against the minibar behind him that held the scotch decanter and rocks glasses. The room twinkled with the sound. He groaned but did not cover himself. Nor did he smile or look like he was in sexual congress with his pain. That first night, with the talking heads in the background, I kicked him six times. Afterward, he spooned me in bed. I felt him small and hard against my skirt suit. He moved in little increments up and down instead of back and forth. He kept his palm flat against the side of my waist, the palm paralyzed like a stroke victim's. We sat for an early dinner at the restaurant inside the hotel. I ate an octopus appetizer, and he had the endive salad. The leaves were glossed demurely in oil and lemon. We both drank water. Then he went back to Connecticut, and I went home to my studio. One thousand dollars in hand. We never know how much worse it will be. That's the greatest gift we have in life. As a child, you'll scrape your knee, and the first time will sting terribly. It will shine like mica as it starts to heal. For maybe a week, you'll look at it and think, God, that hurt. But then you will lose a child out of you. 
Maybe you should stop listening to me. Sometimes I think you won't endure life without what I've learned. And other times I believe the exact opposite. But mostly what I think is that you won't love me. Eleven. On my third day at the health cafe, I worked alone. Natalia was gone. She and her braids and cowboy hat had gone home to Salinas for the summer. The rumpled folk singer came in at noon. He ordered the green soup and waited inside with me. I hadn't given a sign that I knew who he was. I knew eventually he would bring it up now that Natalia was gone. When Dr. Johnson was a thing, do you know any of our songs, Jessica's father? Yes, I do. I'm a fan. Are you? No. He was leaning on my counter and looking up at the ceiling between us. He wore expensive, casual pants and leather sandals and wasn't offended. When we were a thing, we did a show at the Theatricum Botanicum down the way. We stayed with a couple of friends on Tuna Canyon, and they brought us to lunch at this cafe. A beautiful young woman was slinging beans and rice. There was leche in the icebox and Pepsi Cola. That's it. Now look. My phone vibrated on the counter. Vic's wife, said the caller ID. The warming timer dinged on Dean's soup. Some of the soup bowls were thick and brown. Others were shallow, light pink, and very thin. We weren't supposed to let the customers bring the latter outside themselves. I can follow you to the table, I said. I was holding the hot bowl of soup and my phone vibrated again. Do you want to get that? No, thanks. It's Vic's wife, he said, smiling. She seems anxious to get in touch. Could be a follow-up to Jessica's father, I said, and he laughed, but not enough. There was an old woman at a table in the shade. She wore glasses and had fuzzy ringlets of strawberry hair. I'd sold her a rooibos hours ago, and she was only halfway through it. She wasn't sweating. She told me she kept flamingos in a garden of flamingos, and if I ever wanted to visit, I needn't call ahead. Dean Johnson sat down and jerked his thumb in the direction of the lady. If you're ever lost, the old ladies are how you know where you've landed. In Beverly Hills, the biddies look like whippets. Here in the canyon, they're shriveled hippies with bright red hair. I placed his soup bowl before him. He looked at my neck as I did. I liked it when good-looking men checked out the less obvious parts of my body. When I got back to the counter, there was a text message from Vic's wife. Call me, cunt. Alice came in while I was on a phone app that took a picture of an item and automatically affixed a description and a title, and then you named your price. Somewhere within 15 miles, someone who wanted your package of two crazy glue messaged you that they would come and pick it up. I was going around the cafe taking pictures of the Bucato and Raffia baskets. I was setting the price at $10 more than their list. The plan was to meet interested parties after work and pocket the profit. I'd pinned my location as Beverly Hills and used for my profile picture a shot of myself in Sayulita, hair in braids, white bikini, sitting on the sand in lotus pose. When she walked in, I tripped on a basket and nearly fell. I wasn't prepared for her to be the one to come to me. I keep talking about her beauty, and I don't want you to think it matters as much as it does. It only mattered too much to me. I could smell her sweat. It reminded me of my father's. I said hello, and she said it back. Her eyebrows were bushy. Her hair looked sandy and sweaty. I was not one of those heterosexual women who said they were attracted to other women. Who were these women? I could see in their faces. They were trying to impress whoever was listening, men, with their fluidity. I understood the inclination, of course. But with Alice, 
what I felt was very pure and shocking to me. When I looked at Alice, I didn't want her. What I wanted was to eat her, swallow her, and become her. I wanted to reach down between my legs and feel her cunt there. Nervously, I asked her what she would like to eat, and brightly she said, The green soup, please. Her manner was unhurried and self-assured. I'd never lived in the same place long enough to be meaningfully conversant with the grocery clerk. I felt embarrassed, like she could see inside me. My roiling thoughts, my loneliness, my suffering, and most humiliatingly, my petty jealousy. She walked to the fridge, selected a Tecate, and brought it to the counter. She tucked the beer under one bare arm and reached around to the back pocket of her leggings. She handed me a crumpled $10 bill and looked at my face with intent. She moved in so close that I could smell her apple shampoo. I had the instinct to move away, but I suppressed it. Or she suppressed it for me. I don't know how it happened, but our two heads hovered above the counter like magnets. Can I ask you a question? She said finally. I could feel the mist of her breath on my lips. I nodded. I felt expired. She sighed deeply and smiled as though she'd won the first interaction. In fact, she had. Do you shave your face? She said. I despised the requisite stunned look on my face. I said no, and she smiled. I ask because your cheeks and chin are incredibly smooth. Apparently women everywhere are shaving their faces. They say the reason men look younger than women is because they shave every day. They remove the top epidermal layer so the skin is always regenerating. Alice touched her face. I grew fur this year, she said. Well, I said, we're animals. I tried to sound as passionate, but I felt exploded. I wanted to bolt. I'd spent a lifetime not caring what women thought of me. But that was merely the lie I told myself to tell others. The truth was that I was afraid of women. When I brought her soup outside, she engaged me further, nodding to the seat across from her and saying, Did you want to sit down? As though I were the one engaging her and not the other way around. She wore small pink rose earrings that I recognized from somewhere. The patio abutted the face of a small mountain. The rocks near our cheeks gave the feeling of enclosure, privacy, and claustrophobia. It was my lunch hour, and it was all right that I'd put a sign on the door that said, Be Back Soon in 70s Style Script. It was allowed, but this was the first time I'd done it in the several days I'd been working. I drank a Tecate as well. I had never enjoyed a beer so much. I told her I was new to the canyon, and she could tell there was a reason I'd left New York, but, like all self-assured people, she didn't ask. She was startlingly forthcoming right away, which made her an alluring and warm conversationalist. At the same time, she seemed difficult to please, and too young to be so smart. A well-built man with blonde hair walked by the cafe, Hard eight, she said. What? There are so few attractive men up here. There are maybe two. The man turned to look at us. She looked back at him. I think she could have broken up any marriage. Yes, I've noticed, and I've only been here a few days. We aren't supposed to like men these days, she said to me, still looking at the man. The wrong ones, anyway. She nodded, turning back to face me, leaving the man standing there as though she'd never seen him to begin with. But, she said, the right ones are boring. The right ones don't lie. They don't forget to call. Who wants a man you can trust? There was a pause. Then we smiled and laughed. There's nothing more sensual than a woman who makes you work to make her smile. 
Is it not better here, I asked. You mean men? Better than New York? It depends on what you want. I don't know if I want anything anymore. I'm just curious. In those first few moments, I felt a volcanic connection to Alice unlike anything in my past. It was stronger than any link I'd had with a man, with my parents, with Goja, even. What kinds of men do you like? she asked. Too many. We shouldn't be talking about men. What if they see us? We should be talking about careers and emotional fulfillment. Let's talk about careers, I said, gesturing around the silly cafe. The shining crystals. She laughed again, but it felt like luck. Like I was playing a game of pinball with a broken flipper bat and the flaw was working in my favor. The last man I was with was a sailor, she said. A sailor. No, you know, one of these guys whose father has a boat. He had a regular job whatever that means in Los Angeles. And then on the weekends, he sailed around. Oh, a sailor. Precisely. He said that most of the time he was imagining me getting fucked by somebody else, that he was watching. I think I like that too, I said, remembering the way I nearly came at the thought of River and a young girl having sex in a car. Most women like it, Alice said, I think they like it more than men do. They just don't want to access that part of their brain. She walked out to the lot and came back with a pack of American spirits and a book of matches from an osteria in Rome. She slid the pack across the table and I shook my head. I couldn't believe she smoked. I wondered if she was making a show of it because she was proud of the matches. A little cartoon boy in overalls with apple cheeks eating grapes on the hood of a powder blue Fiat. Then I realized that was something only I would have done. And I spent the next few moments so involved with hating myself that Alice thought I was bored. We told each other our names, and there was no starlight. Hearing my name didn't ding her. Are you looking to date, she asked. Because you won't be able to do it up here. You'll have to go to Santa Monica. Or Hollywood, if you don't mind lice. I told her I wasn't looking for anyone, and she said we are always looking for someone, and I hated her, and I asked about her type. I don't know the types I like. I have to go through all of them before I can settle on the one I know I need to be with. I'm nearly through the American Wasp. You're done with sailors. Yes, sailors, check. I want a cowboy, I said. Cowboys don't exist. How about a logger? A stone-cold sober logger. Charlie the sailor. His profile was very well written. That's what got me. When we were in bed and he was asking me to tell him how much I loved his cock, I got to wondering. I found out later a friend of his from New York wrote it. I told Charlie his profile headline should have said, Neptune, god of the sea, seeking yoga Barbie to have conversational sex with. You learned a new art. I should include it in my profile, as a skill. Alice held out her palm like a placard and said, I can also do this. We talked about certain bars to show each other we spoke the same language. We talked about plantains and books and elections and melatonin and shaving our faces, but eventually we returned to the topic of men. Boys. We were young girls talking about boys. I'd always been afraid that thinking about men meant I wasn't a strong woman. But Alice was strong, and she liked to address the picayune strategies involved in replying to a message. She endeavored, for example, to always use at least one word less than the other person did in a previous text. She said women were considered strong these days only if they didn't talk about things they loved that didn't love them if they didn't get hurt or allow themselves to be occasionally humiliated at their own hands when, really, strength was being unashamed to want what you want. Your turn, she said. What was your last relationship? I don't know which to tell you. 
two at once? I nodded. Tell them both, but start with the one that you actually wanted to fuck. I wanted to say, how did you know? But you can't compliment a new person too much at the start of a relationship. It will affect the balance of power. She smiled and seductively took a drag of her cigarette. I told her about Big Sky. Our first meeting. I told her how he ended the evening by asking whether he could kiss me on the mouth. That's erotic, she said. What an erotic way to put it. I told her how that weekend I died the death of the single woman obsessed with the married man. I imagined that he and his wife were at farmer's markets picking out misshapen eggplants and herbs for pasta sauce. I walked and walked and walked. I tried to find him. On Friday, I emailed him. He responded wanly, shortly. I felt like I'd not only exaggerated the emotions of our evening together, but wholly invented them. I ate nothing but broccoli sprouts and broccoli florets rolled up in flaxseed wraps. My stomach felt taut, and I thought, but what for now? The weekend turned out to be beautiful. Everywhere I went, mothers bought juicy oranges and great stalks of leek, and fathers pushed tiny butts on swings in the sunshine. Nobody was smoking cigarettes. All that weekend, every ten minutes, I tapped my code into my phone and opened my email to find nothing. I wasn't sure what I was expecting. Perhaps, Alice said, you were expecting... Sorry I was short on Friday. My wife was holding our baby in my face so I couldn't write you a long note. I missed you very much. Yes, I said. That must be exactly what I was expecting. Nothing came. I started waiting 30 minutes in between check-ins to increase the likelihood of a reply. I imagined even my phone was through with me. It hungered for a more self-assured owner. Monday came. The air turned cooler and I felt calmer. Let me guess, Alice said. I nodded. It's measurable by science, she said. A man will know the very moment you have stopped obsessing. The instant. An email popped up. I continued. His name. Come by Harry's for a drink later? I felt dizzy and at first not even grateful. My throat was dried out. How could I have felt so strongly so quickly? One of my friends turned every one night stand into the love of her life, but not me. I had never met a man like this one. I love you, I said to my phone. Holy shit, I love you. Alice was pitched forward in her seat. It felt good that someone understood the passion, that it was possible to feel strongly about a man after only one and a half meetings. I didn't reply to him for three hours. I showered and blew out my hair and applied an eye mask. Finally, at five, I wrote, sure, I'll come by. Great, he wrote right away. I'm walking down there now. Good for you for waiting so long. But isn't it terrible? This is how we applaud ourselves. I bet you wanted to hit him and fuck him at the same time. What did you wear? A long-sleeved floral dress that came to the middle of my thighs and cowboy boots. I looked like a farmer's slutty daughter. She smiled and shook her head. Please, I said. I know. Sorry. Continue. He was already seated two martinis deep with the same blonde friend. Martini Monday, someone said, and glasses clinked. He looked at me. You look like you're going to cry. The bartender said, well, hello, Missy, and Big Sky smiled. His friend left after a hello and a few last sips. I'm always impressed that men know when to leave. Do you think they discussed it beforehand? I don't think so, no. God, this is sexy. Then we were alone. We looked at each other for several seconds. I saw him look at my legs and relished the feeling of power. And then he said, I thought of you all weekend. God bless him.
He'd been at his family's home in the Catskills. In the basement, he'd slipped a movie in the player, one he'd told me to watch, and he thought of me. He was building a fire, he said, and he thought of me. He was chopping down firewood, and he thought of me. And you, he said, are such a bitch. And he jabbed me lightly in the chest, right between my breasts, but politely, because I didn't email him back right away. What a cocksucker. And there I was, I said, thinking of the long weekend I'd spent the tap, tap, taps into my phone. How I'd done 30 walking lunges back and forth across my apartment floor, thinking that by the 30th one, he'd have responded to me. He reached for a greasy jar of bar cherries and said, I should be giving you one of these at a time. Instead, here I am passing you the whole goddamn jar at once. Was he drunk? Yes, but not like an asshole. She said she understood exactly what I meant and what type of man he was. I went inside and brought out two more beers. I would have to replenish the register later. It was an hour of work I'd be paying back to the place, but I didn't care. When I returned, she was leaning back in her chair. Her pose, shut but sun-searching eyes, long golden neck, belonged on a yacht. Thank you, she said, taking the beer. Please get back to the story. Bated breath over here. We kissed, I said, right there in the bar he went to all the time. The bartender was down at the other end. I leaned into him, put my hands on his thighs lightly. He left a $100 bill on a $40 check. I hated myself for being impressed. We walked outside and he threw me up against a brick wall and I swung my legs around his waist and we kissed some more. On the way back to my place, a car honked as we crossed Broadway. We laughed at the car as it flew by, knowing whoever was in it was less excited to be alive. We were holding hands and I felt high. I thought, I'll always remember how beautiful a moment this is. I will always be grateful for this. And are you? I smiled and shook my head. I wanted to cry remembering. He sounds like a fucker. I love fuckers too. Tell me the rest. I need another cigarette. In my apartment, we went down on each other. We were all over each other. We kissed like animals. We knocked into my stupid liquor shelf and it wobbled, and in particular I noticed the Remy Martin on the shelf. It had belonged to my parents, and I never touched it or let anyone else touch it. But in the near future, I would let him drink it. We didn't fuck. He only went down on me and I faked an orgasm because I was in love. Afterward, we were practicing a few yoga positions together. Downward dog into crow, jumping back into chaturanga when his cell phone rang. His breathing was heavy, but he clipped it somehow. Hey, honey. Yeah, no, don't sweat it. I'm gonna bring home a pizza. Yeah, coming right now. Okay, love you. He smiled as though nothing had happened. It wasn't that he was cruel, but that he was tipsy and the moment didn't call for being strange or for acknowledgement. I followed his lead. We laughed some more about some things and he said, well, and I said, bye. And he said, easy girl, I'm going. The wife, Alice said, like it was a vital video game character we'd forgotten to include in our game of Capture the Banker. What about her, I asked, trying to be neutral, wondering whether she was on the wife's side or the other side. She's at home, throwing out dead coffee filters from the morning. She's too exhausted to cook, and she doesn't think for a moment her husband is in a crow pose at some slut's apartment. You're judging me, I said. Of course I'm not. Morality is uninteresting. I'm intrigued by the idiocy of trust. I'll never trust a man I love. In fact, if I trust him, it will mean I don't love him enough. And a man should never trust me. Please, go on. I'm wrapped. I keep interrupting because I'm wrapped as fuck. 
Ten minutes later, my heart was still beating hard and my rug was still a quarter up the wall, and an email came through from his name. Sweet dreams. Fucker. They all should die. I was so happy because he'd left his Mets cap on my couch and his headphones. I went to bed without a pill and left my shades open and looked out at the moon. I was so happy. It's strange to think that there is some nice boy somewhere who wants to read us Pushkin and play records and not even fuck for a month. She drank the rest of her beer down and threw her cigarette in the can. She rose and I counted her inches. She must have been five feet eight. Her mother was tall. Mine was not. I come in here a few times a week for lunch after class, she said. Will you be here tomorrow? I'd love to hear the rest. I tried to seem flippant when I said that I was there every day. I watched her get into her car. It was a light green Prius. It felt so good to talk to her. I saw her arm out the window with a cigarette as she pulled onto the boulevard. The purple bougainvillea along the fences was washed blonde by the sunlight. Happiness had come easily to her. She was a person who never had to make a haunting choice. Everything was laid out for her. She only fucked men with perceptibly clean dicks. One of the best things about childhood is the lack of choices. Your parents make choices for you that you must inhabit. Even better is your lack of awareness. You have no conception of all the wrong choices that might have maimed you. Take the road to the left, and you won't get run over by the car that will kill you if you take the road to the right. The last time I was ignorant to the notion of choice was in the Poconos. It was 1989, and I was nearly 11. I remember every single day before the day my life ended. I remember all the hot dogs and every sunset. We had a red cedar A-frame on an undeveloped lot. The Saw Creek Estates. The word estate. These ugly little summer and ski homes. Linoleum and wall-to-wall -wall oatmeal carpeting. We never hung around the house anyway. We went to the Fernwood, the local hotel, to meet up with friends of my parents. There was a roller rink attached to the inn. My crisp, electrified memories of roller skating make me want to kill myself. The sharp cuts on the rink floor. The smells of the pizza and the wood. I was so impressed by the teenage girls who worked there. Their rainbow socks and crimped hair. What they did after the rink closed. For dinner, we'd go to a steakhouse called The Big A. There was a huge iron bowl over the door and the big A in red neon blinked like a beacon. That was where I grew my love for American taverns. Shoestring fries, men drinking beer from thick mugs, waitresses with bumpy faces. We never waited for a table, yet the place was always packed. Occasionally, we went to a white tablecloth place called Villa Volpe, which was cavernous like a catering hall. Waiters in bow ties and more than five fish entrees on the menu. My parents took me now and then because I liked the idea of fancy things. I think about it all the time. How the fancy place of my youth could seem cheap to me now. Broke as I am. There was a place right off I-90 that sold pierogies. My mother and I would share an order of six. I thought that we alone in the world knew about them. I didn't realize they were an ethnic food or that there might be variations. The little rings of scallion on top were thrilling. We ate in the sunlight by the window, sitting on stools and looking out at the passing cars. We dipped the pierogies into a plastic ramekin of sour cream. One time, one of the pierogies was still frozen in the middle. I felt betrayed. We wouldn't have asked the kitchen to heat it up. I guess we tossed it in the garbage. There was a flea market with funnel cakes, hubcaps, guns, go-karts, Mormons selling soap, candles, men in sleeveless shirts selling generators, patchwork quilts, old dolls with yarn hair, counterfeit ninja turtles, tin owls, pelts, hot grills with burgers, and Ziploc bags of homemade potato chips for 50 cents. 
we would always get the funnel cake. We would look around for the perfect amount of time, and I would go home with a quartz crystal or a Civil War pin. Occasionally on the fairgrounds, there was a car show. I say occasionally, though I'm sure, like all things, it had a date and time. But my parents seemed to happen up on things. They didn't plan. They were always on time for everything we needed to be on time for. But when it came to weekend events, especially in the Poconos, we would just get up and drive in the sun. And if there was a car show, then my dad would stop. He loved cars. He would talk to the owners about the transmission, and he would peer inside the windows, blocking the sun from his eyes, and getting close but never touching the vehicle. He understood the price of spotlessness. At home, I wasn't allowed to touch the walls. Whenever I was angry at my parents, I would make a furious face and covertly press my palms against our cream walls, leaving prints that might not be discovered for years, but would surely cause pain when they were. But my favorite thing about the Poconos was the pool. There were two pools, one near our house, which abutted a lake with ducks and paddle boats. There was a log roll in the pool. Maybe it was only there once, but I remember vividly the feeling of not staying on for longer than a second. A terrible feeling that fades overnight so that by the next morning you feel good about your chances. Then there was the other pool in the ritzier section of the estates. This was called the top of the world pool. It was high up in the mountains and surrounded by trees, and there was a bar and women who dropped their bathing suit strings off their shoulders. Inside the facility, there were tennis courts, that pretty indoor green, the soft thudding of balls and the echoed grunts of men. We went to the top of the world sparingly. It was the more adult recreation center, and my parents weren't so much day drinkers. I always felt they were keeping luxury from me and even from themselves. The smell of the pool up there was deeper. The chlorine was richer. I know many kids love the smell of chlorine, though I wonder if they love it as much as I did. I suppose I'm laying a foundation for you. Another chlorine lover, loose in the world. Twelve. Vic's wife called again that night. I was in my kitchen. At night, my damned house was tolerable. The glow from the lantern lamp over the sink was amber and comforting. I heard River throwing a ball for his dog outside. When I didn't pick up the call, Mary wrote, Is my daughter there? Tell me, you slut. I looked for the daughter's Facebook page. I started with Vic's wife, who had not posted anything since four hours before her husband's death. A friend of hers had recently tacked a Khalil Gibran quote about death to Mary's page. I clicked on the friend's profile and read her most recent post. I get up every morning and leave my three children to drive over an hour to work. I work some weekends. I give up that time with family and friends because I know that my work and the work of my organization make a difference. I can't travel to conflict zones, but I can spend every day supporting lobbyists in D.C. to help prevent war and kids being separated from their moms. I would die if that happened. And overall, make this a safer world for all. I believe with all my heart that international peace matters to Americans and hope that Congress agrees. You cannot be one of these who says or writes these things who needs others to think something about them. I clicked around in Mary's profile to find a picture of Eleanor, the daughter who was 17. Strawberry hair. Vic's wide, flat cheeks. She looked kind and smart, as Vic was. She didn't seem to have a boyfriend. She had thick calves and played softball. If she were indeed coming for me, it made perfect sense. I severed her life with a snip-snip of my inconsiderate fingers. Most people don't worry about threats like those. Little girls don't kill people. They're just silly little girls. 
but almost no one understands a little girl. We begin hard as marbles. I pictured this little girl in a small, clean car, crossing Texas with a ball gag and a knife. Just then, as I was lost in that thought, the door handle jiggled and I jumped. It was only Leonard. He strode through, speaking as though he'd been speaking for a long time. Leonard, I shouted. Part of me wondered if it wasn't a ruse, if he wasn't fully cognizant. Oh, he said, seeing me at last. Jesus. Oh, dear, how sorry I am. He touched the top of his forehead. It shone with perspiration. I looked at his hands. Many hands reminded me of my father's. In particular, there was a gas station attendant down the street from the house where I grew up. The day I got my license, I drove past my old house. It had been sold to a family of six. As I approached the tall oak with the haphazard patch of tulips circling its trunk, I found them all outside. The dad was playing catch with one of the girls. The mother was drinking iced tea and smiling at her herd. Afterward, I went to the gas station. The attendant remembered me, or rather, he remembered my father's car. He didn't ask me where my father was. He was Pakistani and quiet and warm, and when I looked at the side view mirror, his hands on the gas pump were my father's hands. I'd have known them anywhere. I tipped the man more than he would make that week. He'd loved my father in the silent way that men love other men they see infrequently. Lenny, I said more gently, it's okay. It's Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. What? That I've got. Please don't tell the others. He pointed idly out my window, then gestured downstairs toward Kevin's quarters. Oh, I won't. Even the doctor was stunned. He's an old Jew, too. He said, you must have done quite a lot wrong in your time, huh? When did you find out? I've known. In the distance, we heard the coyotes howling. Their voices were bright and bony. At night in the canyon, everything stilled. There was either a terrible wind or there was no movement at all. Leonard looked around my house. He looked at the envelopes on my tables as though they were bits of lingerie. Most were overdue bills. You're a mysterious woman, Joan. You're a nosy old man. I may be, but I'm a rich, nosy old man. Why don't you be nice to me, and you never know who remembers who in their will? You never know, I said, gripping the counter. I wanted money so badly. When I had money, I could drive away from myself. He checked the time on a watch I'd never noticed, then jingled it at me. You see this old girl? What? This timepiece is the only one of its kind. Patek Philippe, 1939 Platinum. My father was a cunt. I figured he was going to bury himself with this watch. But he left it for me. The only thing he ever did. I don't think it was love, anyhow. This watch, old girl, is worth a lot of money. It doesn't look it. He laughed at me. Don't laugh at me, Leonard. I'm sorry, dear. Precious things are not always comely. He turned toward the door, then back to me. Joan, would you come back to my house with me? I am overdue for my pill. Long overdue, in fact. I didn't want to go, but I went. I'd done the same thing with every other man I'd known. I went with them in case it got bad and I needed to be saved. I don't mean saved by a man. I mean saved by money, by someone doing something dirty for me. The dirty part was how I couldn't accept someone's help without subjugating myself in some sinister, sexual way. 
I followed Lenny outside and down the grassy path. There was a breeze for a change. The wealthy people had all the breezes, in the hills and the palisades. Lenny had money, so I wondered why he lived in a garden shed at the top of this rusted canyon. Whenever I had money, I lived beautifully. I was good at living in the present, in believing that tomorrow would be taken care of. Goja always told me that. Money will always come back, she said. It goes and it comes back more than anything. Lenny unlocked his door. That he kept it locked was interesting. Here we are, he said. I followed his little body inside. The smell hit me. That elderly smell of bone dust on medium pile carpets. Of coffee and orange juice dumped into the same sink together. Whenever I smelled old people, I felt cheated out of not having parents. At the same time, I was grateful. While the death of my parents when I was so young had brought me a world of devastation, I would at least be spared seeing them come undignified. My mother would always be beautiful. My father would always be strong. His big hands pumping gas in the side view mirror of the car. The place was all pine, even the ceiling and overstuffed with furniture and Persian rugs from the larger house I now occupied, which did indeed make it feel cozy. But the cozy feeling lent itself to some suggestion of dread, perhaps because it reminded me of the Poconos. It was cozy there, too. Cozy like the first few minutes of a horror movie. Lenny had a 12-inch television on a gloomy TV stand, and the bedroom was behind an accordion partition. There was a pipe and packets of vanilla-flavored tobacco. Every wall was covered in shelves for all of his books. I pictured River building the place, his arms and neck beating sweat in the canyon sun. Please, sit, he said, indicating a corduroy recliner. It's very quiet on this side of the rock. Do you hear the coyotes at night? I only hear what I want to, he said victoriously tapping a hearing aid. When he scratched his head, the watch fell down to the middle of his skinny arm. Now that I knew it had worth, I couldn't take my eyes off it. He caught me looking. My face grew hot and I looked away, focusing my eyes on his china cabinet. I saw he had a set of Laboratorio Paravicini plates. My mother had only one, a dinner plate, that she cherished. Had I broken it, I wonder if she'd have hit me. She never hit me. I would have been okay with being hit. Paravicini, I said. He nodded, impressed, which enraged me. We had them growing up, I said, thinking of the lone plate at the top of our credenza, the way it shone. It never had a lick of food on it. I sold it at the house sale, along with nearly everything. Your family is from Italy. My mother was, yes. I was born there. Your mother has passed, he asked, without enough kindness. I nodded. There was a spider unspooling from a web above Lenny's head. I didn't say anything, even when the spider was nearly on his nose. And your father? As well. I'm sorry, recently? No. You were young? Quite. Dear God, child, what happened? An accident. Motor vehicle? No. In the home. A fire? Leonard, where is your chamomile collection? I'm sure you have one. I could make you some tea if you would shut the fuck up. I was teasing and he smiled. Now that I knew he had a disease, I'd soften to him, but just a bit. I got the drug, L-Dopa. How do you like that name? It sounds like a female drug lord. He also gave me Razadine to slow down the dementia, which sounds like a character in one of those senseless science fiction books that Lenore liked. Lenore read science fiction, I asked. 
I rose to make the tea. There was a fine bone china teapot on the stove, which was meticulously clean, the burners lined with foil. Yes, Lenny snapped. Lenore was a great reader, a varied reader. Do you think a man like me could have been with someone who didn't read? How do you feel with the drugs? It'll take several weeks before they're metabolized into my system, before we'll see results. He walked to the couch and sat down. He looked like he needed to be rehydrated, like a dried sorrel. I might pump some oily water into him, and suddenly he would be able to jump on trampolines again. You're fond of that dress, aren't you? I brought Lenny his tea. He blew across its brown surface. The white mug shook in his hand. He had a collection of those as well. I would never have a collection of anything. I had only one coffee cup. It said my safe word is wine in loopy print. Vic had bought it for me on a family vacation to Napa Valley. He also brought back several bottles from his favorite vineyards. Everywhere he went, something reminded him of me. I drank the most expensive bottle, a silky Grenache, one Monday while I was preparing to see Big Sky. I was delirious that evening with fear and excitement. I was so turned on that sitting on a bicycle seat would have made me come. Leonard, I said to endear him to me. Yes. May I ask you a question? Why did you never have children? Why didn't you, he replied. Something cracked inside my skull. It's not too late for me, I said. It's not too late for me either, he said. I looked at him and smiled, like he was irrelevant and half dead. We wanted to, Leonard said finally. Lenore wasn't barren, but she was challenged. How do you know it wasn't you? I noticed that he was shaking all over, so I picked up the throw from his couch and draped it around his shoulders. Goddamn Parkinson's, he said. Of all fucking things, Parkinson's. I'd have been fine with cancer, the all-over kind. I didn't mean to be coarse, I said. Of course you did, dear. It's all right. I know it isn't easy for you. The past is all over your face. He rose and the throw fell from his shoulders. I picked it up as he crossed the short room. He turned to see if I was looking, but I pretended to have my eyes on the blanket as I folded it. I watched him quickly open a small black door in the wall and even more quickly toggle a combination lock. Then I heard a click, a jingle, and the little door shut. He turned back to me nervously. I have a taste in my mouth, he said. He walked back to the couch. I noticed what I had already guessed would be true. The watch was gone from his wrist. A bad one? Like copper. Decomposition? I asked sweetly. I wish I didn't like cruel women. Perhaps you'd like a mint. It's no use. I'm sorry you lost your parents too young. Thank you, Lenny. I like it better when you call me Leonard, but that's another sad old story. Lenny, I said, thank you. Thirteen. I dreamed that night of the Poconos. I didn't dream, that's not accurate. I closed my eyes and played the reels that couldn't exist in daytime. My parents and I were out to dinner with a couple and their adolescent son, the Chaconis. We dined with this family often when we were in the Poconos. They had a home near ours, larger though tacky, with shiny black furniture and gold accents but there was one night I remembered in particular. The boy's name was Joseph Jr., and he was about my age, though there was nothing romantic or even friendly between us. 
He was the type to sling cats down stairwells. Whenever I've wondered what rapists were like as children, I think of Joseph Jr., his black fleck eyes across a table from me. Joseph's mother, Evelyn, was plump with very dark, big hair. Her husband, Joseph Sr., was an oral surgeon. He, too, had inky hair, plus a long, swollen chin, and a sexuality that has always stayed with me. We begin to form our opinions of sex very young, and for me, Joseph Sr. maintains a looming post. I suppose it was on account of my mother, Pia, who had an inner tube of extra skin around her waist from her cesarean section, but otherwise dripped with sex. Her breasts, I've mentioned before, were audaciously large and white. We were sitting down at a shaker-style table between the bar and the fireplace. A broomstick hung from the brick wall beside the fireplace, alongside family pictures of the owners. Over the mantel was that reproduction of the bull. It had frightened me until just that summer. My parents didn't drink much. My mother generally had a light beer with dinner, and my father drank red wine, but never more than a glass or two. Sometimes he had a Bloody Mary with a plate of raw clams. Joe and Evelyn, on the other hand, drank vodka cocktails. I remember Evelyn's big finger sliding pimento-stuffed olives off of toothpicks. They both had rumbling laughs. All four adults smoked cigarettes, and the men would light the women's, whichever woman was closest. This night, I was seated next to my mother and Joseph Sr. was on her other side. My father sat across from me with Evelyn beside him and Joe Jr. beside her. I was always beside my mother. It was imperative that I could smell her and taste her food at will. She was wearing a salmon-colored sundress with a belt of tiny tin leaves. A natural brunette, she dyed her hair blonde and curled it twice a week so it was golden and spiraled. She wore these huge red-rimmed eyeglasses and a pretty shade of coral lipstick. All of her lipsticks were drugstore brands, and all their tips were ground down to flattish mounds. She took out her soft pack of marble reds, and Joseph Sr. got ready with the lighter. Maria Pia, he said to get her attention. This was the name spelled on the gold necklace she wore. She'd been Pia in Italy, but after coming to the States, she'd begun to go by Maria. It was easier for Americans to understand. After a while, she started missing her real name, but because too many people at that point knew her as Maria, she couldn't simply and quickly change it back. My father got her a Maria Pia necklace to ease the transition. Joseph Sr., who would have met her as Maria, was poking fun, flirtatiously. My mother laughed, Even her laugh had a heavy accent. She turned away from me and toward Joseph Sr. with the cigarette between her lips. His Zippo had a pinup girl on it. Long brown hair with bangs and a pink bikini. My youth was marked by such images. Seeing them on playing cards or drawn crudely on bathroom stalls. It's possible I was just poised to notice them. My father was telling the story of a friend of his, an Indian doctor named Madan. His wife, Barbara, who suspected him of having an affair, had placed a tape recorder in his big black Mercedes. My father was speaking in the conspiratorial and hushed tone he used when he was telling a story around me that wasn't suitable for children. It still hurts me to even think of my father's face. He was short, and he had a big nose, and he was partially balding even then in his early 40s. But he was incredibly magnetic. He was always having a good time, always laughing, but he was also responsible. He could fix anything on a car or in a house. And because he was a doctor, he could save your life. In terms of his being a father, I know I am biased, but I can't imagine a man loving his daughter more than he loved me. Whenever I walked into the ocean, even just a few feet in, every time I turned around, I could count on him to be propped up on his elbows watching. He had a smile on his face, but really he was just waiting to save me. 
So, said Evelyn, did she catch him? My father took a noisy drag of his cigarette. Joe Jr. was singeing pieces of dinner roll over the flame of a votive candle. I saw my mother listening to something Joseph Sr. was whispering. My father saw this, too. But the smile never left his face. I sidled closer to my mother. She'd put on her silky navy blazer with the pussy bow. I loved the feeling of her warm flesh through dainty material. She smelled like smoke and l'air du temps. I pressed close to her to let her know I was there. Oh, she got him, my father said with a crooked smile on his face. She really got him. For years afterward, I would try to make sense of that. How had Madden's wife gotten him? What did she pick up on the tape recorder? Was it the noises of sex? How did she know the other woman would be in the car with her husband? For a very long time, whenever I saw a Mercedes, I would imagine black panties stuffed into glove compartments and silver tape recorders slipped under passenger seats, their tiny red lights blinking. The waitress brought a bruschetta appetizer to the table, plus a plate of two thick mozzarella sticks for Joe Jr. and me. I didn't like food meant for children. I always wanted to eat whatever my mother was eating. This included kidneys and mustard sauce, which she'd ordered a few times in Little Italy. The kidneys smelled like urine, tangy and old. But there was something about the way my mother held her fork, the way she enjoyed food, not voraciously, like my father, but picky and graceful. I watched her select a piece of the bruschetta, drizzled with condensed balsamic vinegar. She had very white teeth and opened her mouth wide so as not to disturb her lipstick. I watched Joseph Sr. watch her. There were always at least two cigarettes lit at any moment, even when everybody was eating. It made those dinners last a long time. Unlike me, Joe Jr. ignored the adults and entertained himself. He had a mini pinball game and another little game box wherein the objective was to get miniature marbles into certain holes. He didn't share any of his toys, but I didn't care. I had both my parents to look after. That whole year had been tricky. I could tell there was something I didn't know, and I felt I couldn't miss a moment of observation. What followed I didn't fully grasp at the time, like most of childhood. Some darkness is downloaded, but you can't decode it until later, after losing your virginity, for example. My father's beeper went off. He left to call his answering service back. For short, it was service, so that any time I picked up the phone at home and it was for my father, I'd yell, Daddy, service. The waitress came around to take our dinner order. My mother ordered the prime rib for my father. He cherished all kinds of meat except chicken. He liked his steaks bloody, and once I saw him scoop some raw meatloaf filling into his mouth from a big glass bowl in the refrigerator. I waited to hear my mother's order, a polo a la Valdostana, which I'd tried once and didn't like. Then I ordered the surf and turf off the regular adult menu. Evelyn looked at my mother. Kid has expensive taste. Joseph Sr. was looking at my mother like she was a prime rib. I have always wondered why men don't do a better job of turning off their eyes. My father came back to the table. The color was gone from his face. I'd never seen him without a smile or an expression of anger at my failure to listen to my mother. I had never seen anything in between. There was a mist of sweat on his forehead. Mimi, my mother said, what is it? My father shook his head. I have to go, he said. My mother stood and went to him. I heard him. I heard what he said. As usual, everybody underestimated how tuned in I was. My mother was raped, he said. What? My mother, with her accent, had a way of saying that word. It sounded like, what? It had an exclamation mark even when she didn't mean for one. 
I saw that Joseph Sr. heard him too. My parents often spoke Italian to each other, specifically when they didn't want someone else to hear them, and I did wonder why my father hadn't communicated the news in Italian. Perhaps the word in Italian, stupro, sickened him too much. The Italian word was more carnal, more visual. Rape, by contrast, sounded like something you might eventually lock away in an aluminum drawer. I listened as they spoke for another minute. The details were filmy. I merged them with my own experience of my grandparents' house to create the scene. My grandparents lived in a part of East Orange that used to be a nice neighborhood but now had weeds growing in the cracks of the street. In the middle of the afternoon, my grandmother let a man into the house, a man she thought was a technician of some sort, and he raped her on the floral couch where their Doberman regularly pissed. He left with her wallet, her wedding ring, and her gold crucifix. My grandmother was 72 years old at the time. She wasn't slim, and she wore gaudy makeup on her fleshy face. Peach lipstick that settled into the wrinkles of her lips. Powdery blue eyeshadow on the withered lids of her eyes. Their whole house smelled like urine. The rapist struck her once, hard on the face. The Doberman and the German Shepherd were outside in the fenced yard. I wondered about the cats. They had five cats in that house. She had a bruise under one eye. She'd cleaned herself up before the police came. She'd inquired with the police as to whether there was a way they could keep it from her husband. My grandfather was a cold, small, stern, racist man. In retrospect, I believe he was evil. He called black men coloreds in polite company, and worse in his own home. My grandmother's legs were big. Her calves were like columns. She wore nude pantyhose even in the summer, which made the skin on her legs look the color of uncooked chicken breasts, an unsettling pinkish white. My father would be driving the two hours to New Jersey alone. He told my mother he would be back by morning. He came toward the table, kissed me on the forehead. He left his American Express on the table. My mother didn't carry any cards of her own. He didn't say goodbye to Joseph Sr. and Evelyn. I'd never seen him care less for other people. After he left, Joseph Sr. asked my mother what had happened. Evelyn leaned forward like her type does, lovers of gossip. My mother sketched the story quietly, saying the word rape even quieter, trying to make sense of it herself. Joseph Sr. let out something like a laugh, a disbelieving guffaw. Who in the hell would want to rape an old bag? Evelyn smiled despite herself and said, hush, Joe. My mother somewhat nodded, sharing the energy of the table's disbelief. I felt she should have taken me home, walked away from these monsters, but she didn't. She took out another cigarette. She gazed at the fireplace. Joseph Sr. lit her cigarette. Joseph Jr. selected from his rucksack a different palm-sized game. The waitress brought the big charcoal tray of our food. There was some talk about my father's prime rib, and my mother told Joe and Evelyn they could have it wrapped and take it back to their house. Evelyn wondered if they should send it back to the kitchen. It was too rare for her taste. I looked up at the big bowl over the mantel, his horns and teeth that, until recently, had the power to make me wet my pants. I stared at him and wished he were as real as I used to think he was. I prayed for him to animate suddenly and rip the rest of his body through the wall and gore Joseph Sr., make a rhubarb pie out of his wide dentist chest. Eat your food, my mother said to me. That was all she said to me for the rest of the meal. I still remember the cheap hash marks on my slab of filet mignon and the lobster tail beside it. I knocked over the metal dish of clarified butter, but nobody saw, and I knew I couldn't ask for another. Fourteen. All the next day, I hoped that Alice would come. 
I stared at the fridge where I'd lined up the Tecates. I felt like a teenage girl with a crush. When the bell jingled, I almost dropped a cup I was washing. But it wasn't her. It was River with Kurt, the dog, at his side. Meeting Alice had muted my desire for him. Whoa, he said, you work here? It appears so. What happened to Natalia? She went into politics. He smiled and looked at me like I was crazy. Jack had been better at understanding sarcasm, but River was better looking. Is it okay that Kurt's in here? Of course. How's he doing? Terrific, aren't you, boy? The dog sat and lowered his scruffy chin. He was at once regal and a little silly, but above all, loyal and smart. I felt that if I had been the one to rescue that animal, he'd be peeing in the cracks of my uneven planks and whining by the door. What can I get you, boys? An iced genmaicha for me. Maybe a bowl of water for Kurt? Sure. I filled one of the expensive soup bowls with water. My mother thought it was disgusting to use human bowls for dogs. After taking showers, my parents dried the stall with the towels they had used on themselves. The steel drain was always sparkling. I'm taking Kurt for his first dunk in the ocean. How do you know it's his first? Oh, I don't. I felt bad, so I walked around the counter and knelt to the dog's eye level. I wore a frilly, light green apron. I gazed in the dog's eyes and then stood up quickly before the animal rejected me by looking away. It will be his first time, I said. River laughed. One time I wrote to Jack. Last night was the best it's ever been, for me, with you. Of course, I bookended it with several jokes. I addressed him as Fisheye. He wrote back, hey, handsome. He replied to my jokes with jokes. He told me about an interview he'd had with some startup firm and asked for my advice. He included some song lyrics and ignored what I wrote about our sex. I made River's tea and handed it over to him. I took his money, a few crinkled dollar bills, and gave him change. He didn't put any of the change into the tip jar. Each time Dean came in, he slipped all of his singles into it. Both actions, the tipping and the not tipping, made me feel like I had lesions. Thanks, River said. He brought the bowl of water back. The dog had splashed a good amount on the floor, and I would have to wipe it up with one of the dirty bar mops. It was just about closing time, and I had given up on Alice coming in. Out of frustration, I denigrated a woman on let go about the price of a basket. She wanted to give me $5 less than what I was asking, but was willing to drive nearly 40 minutes to meet me. Stop haggling, I wrote to her. You're embarrassing yourself. Then I wrote to Vic's wife, Mary. Hey, tried you back a number of times. Calls not going through? She wrote back immediately. I didn't get any calls. Call me now. I waited a few minutes and wrote, Okay, as soon as I get off of work. When, she asked. I thought of all the nights when Mary must have sat at home feeling something wasn't right, that her husband was not where he said he was. I never noticed him step away from me to call or write to her. Once, just once, he didn't take me up on an offer for dinner. I'd emailed him from across the office. I wrote the name of the restaurant where I wanted to go in the subject line and a question mark in the body. I could see into his office from my desk. He had a large one with big windows. I saw his face fall. I watched him type a response. His pain was like a graveyard I could stroll about and mark up as I saw fit. Can't do dinner, kid. Can't tell you how sorry I am. Could do a quick drink before? Any drink, 
any bar in the city. I let him take me to Bemelman's in the Carlisle with the drawings of Madeline and little girls in hats with ribbons in Paris and balloons, ice skating elephants, picnicking rabbits, and little boys and their gray dogs. Nobody had ever read Madeline to me as a child. My mother used to tell me the story of Cinderella. In her version, there was a cop in lieu of the prince. Cinderella and the cop. She told it in both English and Italian. I have her on tape. I haven't yet been able to listen because I worry that her accent will sound stronger all these years later than it did in my head, that she would sound like someone I never knew. At the bar, I drank a gimlet, and so did Vic. By that point, I'd been avoiding him quite a bit. The season of Jack had begun. Young boy bars and beer and waking up next to a strong body with soft skin. I was waiting to hear from Jack all the time, so I rarely made dinner plans with Vic. But that night Jack was going to Queens to see a friend, and I knew he wouldn't be back until late. He would eat cheesesteak sushi in Astoria, and possibly he'd want to fuck when he got back, but most likely he would pass out on his friend's couch, or make out with some girl his own age. He would fall asleep in a pair of breasts. We were not exclusive. Or rather, I was exclusive with him. I was upset that Vic couldn't have dinner and take my mind off of the boy, but it helped me to see how sorry he was that he couldn't. I was cruel that night. I said, what a real shame we haven't spent any time with each other in ages. I thought we could watch a movie and be cozy with popcorn. Kid, he said, you don't know how bad I wish I could. Did you know, I asked, pointing to the murals around us, that the author of the Madeline books exchanged these murals for a year and a half of accommodations at the Carlisle for himself and his family? No, I didn't, he said. They must have been a happy family to live in such close quarters and not go crazy. He knew how to hurt me when he dared. He stayed for a second round, which I could see he would regret. He paid for our drinks and got up. There were fine beads of sweat in the creases of his forehead. Tell the car to take ninth to the tunnel, I yelled after him. You can't be late for your wife's birthday. Now I looked at her text message. The stillness of a message, even though you know the person on the other end is trembling, staring at her phone. The desperation of the poor, poor woman. I couldn't believe it, actually, that Vic had left her with the pain of knowing her husband killed himself over another woman left her to care for a child with challenges. Some people had suffered so much that it seemed they could handle anything. I was not unfeeling. I had been through my own gauntlet. I knew someone like Mary would survive. Most women do. The lady from Let Go wrote back, You're a fucking psycho cunt. I wrote back, You spelled your and psycho wrong. I deleted that and wrote, whatever, cheapo. Then the bell rang and Alice walked in. She wore a long gray sleeveless cotton dress. Her hair was pulled back into a wet ponytail. Her eyes didn't need makeup. Is it closing time? Can we have some beer on the patio? Sure. You don't have somewhere to be? Her grin was acerbic. Vaguely judgmental. She took out a $10 bill. I didn't pay for our second round yesterday. This one's on me. I hate people who pretend to forget to pay. Within moments, we were in the middle of our conversation from the previous afternoon. Then she said something that made me feel we were speaking on a heightened plane. They were similar to the experience of psychedelic drugs, those first conversations with Alice. There's something about your story, Big Sky, all of it. I feel like there's a purpose. Do you know? Like we're getting somewhere. Of course I sound crazy. This is colder than yesterday. It's fucking beautiful. Of course the beer was colder. I'd turn the dial down on the beer fridge for her. It was so cold it glowed. I pictured her mother's lips with my father's lips. 
You're going to hate the women here, she said to me. Aren't they the same as in New York? I think they're worse. They're opossums. This one woman, Lara, I'm giving her private lessons in her Japanese garden in Santa Monica at six in the morning. She wants to have these talks with me. Her child is with the nanny staring out the window, hands and face pressed to glass. Lara wants to talk about nothing, about how her hairstylist gives her preferential access, more so than celebrities. She wants me to be jealous of her. One time her husband came out to the garden and saw me, and then she switched our time to 9 a.m. Alice had a light accent, maybe affected, but the artifice would have made her sexier to me. She pulled a cigarette from a new soft pack. I thought to light it for her, but I didn't want to be the man between the two of us. I took a sip of beer and the flavor was suddenly bad. I felt an inch thick lake of saliva coat my throat. My head buzzed. I willed myself back into the moment. Where did you grow up? I asked her. Are you asking because of my accent? Continental? Does it sound affected? Sometimes I think I'm affecting it. I totally am. I'll try to be more genuine because I like you. She explained that she'd been born in New Jersey but had spent much of her childhood in Italy. I told her I was from there too. We discovered we both had Italian mothers. What brought your family to Italy? I asked, trying to neutralize the acid rising in my throat. We went back there when I was a toddler. Then we returned to the States for high school. Italy was not as my mother remembered it. And your father? Out of the picture, she said, fluttering her hand like half of a bird, squinting and taking a drag. You have to tell me the rest of the story, she said. We are getting somewhere. My dress felt too tight. She was right. We were getting somewhere. As I told her each part from the end backward, we were getting to the beginning. We were getting to the reason why I was there. Some people say they do work inside their own brain. They learn that jealousy is a childish emotion. They teach themselves such things. But I could do no work inside my own brain. The interior of my brain was a snake pit. I couldn't survive in there alone. I'm not the important one. Yes, you are, Alice said. I won't say I feel like I've known you forever because that's the kind of thing that woman Lara would say over bee pollen shots. She has celiac disease, so the housekeeper has to be very careful. Maybe one day the housekeeper won't be careful enough. She reached over, laughing, and placed both of her palms on my shoulders. Her forehead went into my chest. I thought grotesquely of my father having a type. Everybody is full of shit, she said. I called my mother Maman from the age of 10 until the age of 16. What happened at 16? She died, Alice said, still laughing. I'm sorry. She was only in the hospital for two weeks getting gray. She was an amazing woman, a perfect mother. I really think I'd think that even if she weren't my memo. I asked her to tell me about Rod Rails. She said that he was one of these gurus who left his penis inside of a woman to calm her, that he would never thrust. How did you get the job? You mean why did I take the job, she asked, as though, of course, if a man were hiring, she would get the job. I want to open my own place someday. Not in L.A. Back in Italy, maybe. A small oak studio amid the olive groves and cypresses. And this is the best. Rod, for all of his tantric nonsense, is the best at combining business and the spirit of yoga. He may not believe in it, but I believe in what he claims to believe in. And that's all I need. You're very smart for your age. You say that like you're so much older, what are you, 30? I'm nearly 37. Well, you don't look 36, but even so, 36 is nothing. 36 may be nothing, 
but 37 is the end. Are you almost done here? Closing time was a half hour ago. Were you waiting for me? She asked nearly lasciviously. No, I stuttered. It's okay. I was waiting to see you too. Already she had the power to coax rage from me one moment and make me feel lucky and loved the next. Let's go to the beach, she said. We got into her Prius. A cherry air freshener dangled from the smudged rearview mirror. It smelled like the 1980s and everything that was the color red. On the way down, we stopped at my house because I said I had a pack of cigarettes lying around. She didn't seem surprised by the absurdity of the compound. While I went upstairs to my stupid lofted bedroom, I heard her moving around downstairs. I shouldn't smoke, she said. It aggravates my throat. I found the pack of American spirits. I'd taken them from my rapist's hotel room. What's wrong with your throat? I pulled something back in my bulimic days. Took months to heal properly. I wouldn't have stopped otherwise. You were bulimic, I said. Give me a break, Alice said, fanning herself with her palm and looking all around. Jesus Christ, it's so hot in here. Jesus. You know there's an AC unit up there. I can't use it. It's in the lease. What? It's in the lease that I can't use it. He can hear it from his house. I pointed Lenny's shed out to Alice through the kitchen window. I'm turning it on, she said. She dragged one of my unpacked boxes to the wall, climbed it, and switched the unit on. An oily sweat glistened between her breasts. Why don't you buy some window units? The notion of the accordion, of stuffing the gaps, it was so large seeming a problem that it made me want to curl into a fetal position. I hate window units, I said. Window air conditioners make me feel cozy. They make me feel poor. In Marema, Alice said, most everywhere in Italy, as I'm sure you know, air conditioning isn't necessary at night. The breeze is enough. There is nearly always a breeze. And it's really only at night that you need to feel cool. Alice had told me earlier that the house they moved to in Italy was across the road from a dairy farm and on the same dirt road as a rifle range. She would look out the window to see the brown cows on the dusty knolls, finding swatches of grass and munching in their homely way. And then she would hear a gunshot. Both she and the cows would flinch, each in her own fashion. Violently bucolic, she called it. I wondered how many times she'd said that to a man who admired her. Is that why your mother went back to Italy, I asked? The night breeze? You want to know the truth. It makes me sick to say it. I nodded. I felt the cold of the air conditioner against my face and weirdly missed the oppressive heat. In the Poconos, we had a miserable old toaster that darkened one side of the bread while barely warming the other, and so you would have to flip the bread and babysit the process. When, that final summer, we bought a new toaster from the two guys in Harrison, the settings were precisely calibrated. The toast came out perfectly every time, and it made me irrationally sad. My mother left America, Alice said, following the death of her lover. Lover, I said. A married one. Perhaps the same sort of situation as yours. Everything reminded her of him. It was too painful. She couldn't be in the same country where he died. She told me some of the story when I was younger. And then when she was dying, she told me the man was my father. Oh, how did he die? Cancer, she said. Throat. Right then, I wanted to tell her the truth of how it actually happened. In part because I hated her for not knowing. For having had the childhood that had been ripped from me. 
We took Tuna Canyon to the beach. It was a one-way road through the canyon, from the village down the mountain to the base, ending bluntly at the Pacific Coast Highway. People raced their cars from the summit to the beach, Alice told me. Jimmy Dean died on that road, in his perfect little car. She opened all four windows and the sunroof to give the impression of a convertible. Her caramel hair whipped against her face. There were no guardrails on the road, and Alice took the twists fearlessly. Through the gaps in the sycamores, you could see the extent of the canyon, the mop of jade like the canopy of a rainforest. When we arrived at the bottom, it was like everything else I'd seen in Los Angeles. You came out of something gorgeous and untamed, into something lurid, the unlovely row of houses on the ocean side of the Pacific Coast Highway, the gas stations and the garden centers with overpriced terracotta pots. She pulled into the parking lot of a restaurant with nets and buoys. She said we were going to get some clams and beer and bring them to the beach. There was a red neon sign that said Real In. The air smelled of crabs as we got out, and the sun hit me in the evocative way it does after you have a beer on an empty stomach. Inside, there were colored lights strung from the ceiling, plastic red gingham tablecloths across long tables, an ordering booth for clam rolls, raw clams and oysters, thick steaks of Chilean sea bass on paper plates. There was a patio with heat lamps and pebbles on the ground, and picnic tables and petunias in galvanized corona buckets. I stood behind her in line and stared at her pornographic legs. Strong calves and soft thighs. I imagined cutting into parts of her with a fork and knife. She ordered two dozen clams without asking if I ate clams or whether I wanted something different. And a bucket of beer, she said to the boy behind the counter who knew her. No charge, he said. She smiled and slipped a 20 into a tip jar. I was afraid in that way you can only be afraid in an early friendship with a woman. I was afraid of being too careful. I was afraid of being too old, of not understanding music. She carried the clams they'd packaged in a to-go container, and I carried the bucket of beer. We crossed the median. Cars zoomed past and my heart thumped between my breasts. The times you are most willing to die are, ironically, the times you are having the most fun. There's a fine for drinking in Malibu, she said, but I don't know. I've never been caught. The beach was remarkable because of how close it was to the highway and because I was with Alice, who took off her sandals and led me to the shoreline. She was a Pisces, like you. She sat down on the sand and set the box of clams before us. Here, she said. They don't need salt, but lemon, all right? She indelicately squeezed lemon across them all. I hated clams. They tasted like blood and metal. My father loved them. I'd watched him eat hundreds. Oh, God, she said, sucking one down. That's all I need in life. Clams, beer, the occasional fuck. Twice a month, someone nice. Hey, I really weirdly want to know all about you. It gets darker. Tell me the rest of Big Sky. We are getting to something. I can feel it. Please don't call me crazy. I'm not sucking up or being a metaphysical twat. I can just feel this. A V of birds flew by overhead. There weren't too many people on the beach, just some wetsuits in the distance. The water was dark. Suddenly I missed him so much that I felt I was about to get swallowed by the blackness all over again. I told her that he was more than a man for me. He was a jetliner to a world I so terrifically wanted to be a part of. As a girl, I was enthralled with the American restaurants my family never went to. Places with teak banquettes and warm lighting. One place in particular a vegetarian American cafe, I dragged my parents into and the waitress, who had a thick blonde braid down her back, served us a loaf of warm pumpernickel bread on a scratched walnut cutting board with a knife and soft butter in a steel ramekin. Ivy plants dripped from the ceiling. 
At home, it was melting slices of prosciutto and wedges of parmesan wrapped in cloth beside a grater. Big Sky was a passport to being American. Everybody wants to be Italian, Alice said, and there you are trying to slough off your own particular beauty. Where in Italy did you and your mother return to? Porto Ercole. Have you heard of it? It's in Marema. We had a wonderful little cottage near the water. I don't know why we left. You never asked her? Please, she said. I'm boring. Continue with your story. It's like a warped fairy tale. I smiled and told her how Big Sky grew up in the mountains and rivers, fly fishing in Wisconsin and Montana, and riding horses and herding cattle. He was a man you could put in a seersucker suit for Easter, but he also chopped wood and understood how meat was processed. I told her how he emailed me the very next morning after our sloppy session in my bed. I left my gear. Can I pick it up later? The font looked different to me from the sweet dreams message of the previous night. I could feel the chill. I thought of all the boys I had jerked off because I didn't want to risk disease by putting my mouth on some twiggy, contagious penis. With Big Sky, I finally understood why other women risked themselves. I wanted to walk around with him inside of me. Fuck, Alice said. I have never felt that way. In the moment, sure, but not after the man left. Does that mean I haven't been in love? I think it means that I haven't been in love. She smiled. I wrote back, sure. He said he'd come by after work. So I spent an entire day getting ready for him. The whole day. Every little thing, including putting a flower in a rocks glass in the bathroom. At 5.30, my doorman, don't misunderstand, it was a shitty building. It was one of those accidental grandfathered-in doorman situations. Called up and announced Big Sky's first name, and I began to shake. Do you want to know what I was wearing? Oh, God, she said. A long-sleeved navy henley, very fitted and tight around my waist. It ended just above my hip bone. Then my white lace panties, and that was it bare legs down to a pair of high-heeled Manolo Blahnik Mary Janes. Jesus Christ. The colors were off, the navy shirt and the black shoes and the white underwear. I was going to say. It was humiliating. It was a disaster. But he didn't care. No, in fact, I'm fairly sure he did. It was one of those moves you think is a good idea in your head, but if you slept on it, you'd say, whore, dumb whore. Had you consulted with any friends? I had nobody, I said, but I thought of Vic. I hadn't told him about Big Sky until Big Sky began to drip away from me. I told her how I heard his knock and the blood from my heart leaked down my legs and I walked to the door with his headset and cap in my hand, and the sound of my heels clacking immediately wrecked my confidence. The sound of my heels was the sound of loneliness. I considered running into my bedroom, pulling on a pair of pants or sexy shorts, but at the very least removing the heels for fuck's sake. But I opened the door as planned. He saw me half naked, took me in. He looked shocked, but not in the way I had hoped. I suppose I was hoping for him to be a cartoon of the regular man. Horny, tongue-wagging, or to look at me the way Vic would have if I'd ever opened the door for him like that. Vic would have looked at me like I was an angel. This Vic, Alice said. I didn't want to tell her about Vic, but she had to hear about him. I wanted a woman to finally see me. At the same time, I worried she would be disgusted the way Big Sky was when he saw Vic and realized he was my group. I explained how the outfit, the ludicrous idea, was based upon the previous evening. A couple of martinis, darkness. But I hadn't lived an emotional life in between the night before and that moment. I was stuck in last night, 
whereas he had gone home to his family, then to work in the morning, and now, in the innocent light of half-past five, I looked like the reason he married his wife and not a girl like me. Imagine the mother of his children, presiding over a roast in the big nice oven, and then me there with my bare legs and my old heels. Here, I said to him, shaking, nervously handing him his headphones and his Mets cap. I thought of my father loving the Yankees. I thought of what my father would think if he could see me now. Okay, Alice said, so let's stop for a moment, because this is important, right? I mean, let's really stop and get inside this man's head. So he comes to the door of a woman he ate out last night who wasn't his wife. Now it's the next day and he's sober. He showered last night and once again this morning. He ate pizza with his wife in their apartment off the park. He felt like he could erase it. Now if he can just get back the very expensive headphones his wife bought him last Christmas, it will be like he never stepped foot in a strange animal's apartment. He spent a weekend thinking of you, but then last night he put his mouth between your legs and he felt wrong and sad. Last week he only kissed you, and it felt innocent and full of promise. But last night was too quick and sour. He wondered how many men you did that sort of thing with. You had no compunction about his wife and for God's sake his infant. Because, of course, you are the temptress and he is the tempted. And now here you are, opening the door with no pants on, in high heels. His dick is like, hey, whatever, what's up? But otherwise, he feels like you're nuts. Already he felt strange and awkward coming here, but now he is downright appalled. Fuck, I said, are you trying to kill me? Do you still love him? No. You do. Well, you can't. Maybe that's why you're telling me this. It turned colder and the water blew the salt air against our bare skin. Alice was one of those people who didn't feel cold. The littlest thing can make you feel another woman is better than you. This is important, she said. Please don't stop. The next part is terrible. Go. I said, here and I handed him his gear, and he looked down at it, and I began to close the door. Like you were just, what, dusting the cabinets in panties and heels? Yes, I said, groaning, I'm ashamed. No, you are all of us. You are the parts of us that no one wants to admit to. Go on. He said, hey, because he had to say hey. Otherwise, he'd be a monster. And I said, did you want to come inside? Can you imagine? Like you said, it's daytime, everyone's sober. He looked confused, but he came inside. Probably you think he wanted to end it then? Just get his gear and take off? I never thought of it like that. My aunt once told me that if you have feelings for someone, feelings that are very strong, they can't exist in one direction alone that the other person feels them too. But you're probably right. You don't believe I am. I don't, so what? So nothing, go on. I offered him a beer. I was the devil, I guess. We sat on my couch and... What? I can't. Joan, she said, then paused. That's interesting. I've never said your name. I've never said the name Joan out loud. Or I must have. Joan of Arc, etc. It's silky. Joan, please, you must go on. This is how we learn from one another. I asked him if he wanted a massage. I never liked a man that much before. I didn't understand what was happening. I was flooded with emotion. I took off his shirt and he lay on his stomach on my couch. Couches are less barbaric than beds. There is something half-assed about cheating on a couch. And I gave him an excellent massage. I imagined exactly what would feel good and did it. I just was thinking. 
When you're with someone you're tired of, you give them a massage to get things over with. You expend the least amount of energy. But the first time with someone new, you massage a back like you're before a committee, competing with every woman you've ever felt threatened by. Yes, I said, that's exactly what I was doing. And his back was stippled with freckles and scars. It wasn't a pretty back, but I loved it anyway. It was pale. Eventually, he lifted himself up and sat down. He pulled me close, and I straddled his waist and wrapped my bare legs around it, heels still on. I must have looked like a prostitute. We kissed for 30 minutes, maybe more. My legs wrapped around his waist and no other touching, just kissing. He took my shirt off. When he couldn't take it anymore, he leaned up and began to jerk himself off, and he came on my chest. Romantic. I'm saying it out loud now, so you are my witness. What I thought was sweet, what I looked upon later as a gesture of, I don't know, kindness, affection, love, was how he got up to get one of my paper towels and wiped his semen from between my breasts. Fucking hell. Then I spilled a beer in anxiety on my rug, and I got so paranoid about the smell of beer lingering that I sprayed it with carpet cleaner right away. In front of him? I nodded. What a marvelous complexity, though. So you didn't come at all? No. He just jerked himself off and you cleaned up some beer. Jesus, I said, you're making me see the rot on a moment I thought was golden. That's the point. Now, is coming important to you? As important as it should be? No, I don't think so, I said, realizing I'd never explored the question. That's funny. It's all I care about. Really? It's all I think about the whole time. And when I have one, I'm like, goodbye. So people need to get there with me. Or they will be having corpse sex. She tilted her head to one side and stuck her tongue out, and I laughed. I'm too busy thinking, I said. About? How I look, how he's feeling. So you fake orgasms? I nodded. To what end? I don't know. You want to please him, to let him know he has pleased you? I suppose. I find that men have a better time when they think they are terrible in bed. It inspires them to read magazines and find a new nub to tweak. They come back and back until they feel they figured it out. I was upset that she was more sexually conversant than me. She was younger and better at fucking. She would have eaten Big Sky alive. I shuddered to imagine them together. Are you cold, she asked, rubbing the tops of my arms with her palms. Not a lot, I said, trying to hide how loved I felt. Please, she said, continue, I'm sorry. I'm starting to feel silly. No, we need to get where this is going. So you didn't come, and he did, and he watched you clean the rug and pretended it wasn't weird. Yeah, and it was tax season and he asked whether I'd received all my forms yet. Then he just stopped and looked at me and said, Who are you? His eyes, I have to explain his eyes. He was like a wolf. Fuck, and I loved him. And I didn't know what he meant. I said, what? And he said, like, who do you hang out with? And Jesus, I thought he meant, I thought he was trying to inhale me the way I wanted to inhale him, you know? I thought he was trying to get to know me. Oh, you poor thing. And I began to name friends of mine, like first names, like an idiot. Because I didn't understand what he really meant, which was, what circle are you in? Will my wife find out? Do you hang out with weird bouncers from New Jersey because you just acted like a girl who does? Then he gave me tax advice, and I thought how lucky his wife was. Her name was fucking Parker. I thought how lucky she was to have this beautiful, smart, sexy man who does her taxes, 
who makes a lot of money, who fishes and hunts. I felt so empty and shitty and stupid. I put on a pair of sweatpants. He left with his gear. But that wasn't the end. No, but every time was the end. I felt like I was going to cry. I didn't want her to see. I looked ugly when I cried. Perhaps we need an interlude. I think you should tell me about Vic. You're right, I said, because Vic is part of the actual end. But I'm tired of my fucking voice. I'm not, she said, taking my hand. I didn't think another woman had ever taken my hand in that way. We sat there on the cooling sand, and I began to tell her about Vic. I told her about Scotland, our naked bodies on the bed. She didn't look at me like I was disgusting. And for the first time, I didn't feel that I was. Fifteen. When I got back to the house that evening, I felt alive. All my life, I'd avoided women. They complicated my time. I'd learn how to do everything alone, how to use men for what I needed, and whenever another woman was around, there would invariably be jealousy, or I was bound to act differently, to be less sexual and exacting. But with Alice, it was the opposite. I felt the need to turn myself up more. She made me feel the way that Goja had, valid. Vic had questioned Goja's role in my life once, when he was feeling me slip away. He knew I told Goja everything. He asked whether I was sure she was the best influence on me. I slapped him across the face. His stubbly cheek jiggled and he apologized right away. The truth is, who knows, she might have been a bad influence. She taught me that men will use you unless you use them first. That sometimes, men must be punished because women are in important pain from the moment they are born until the moment they die. But you could also say that my mother taught me that, and you could of course say that it was my beloved father who fucked the whole thing up. Goja did the most for me and did the least to hurt me of anyone in my life. I remember vividly the first night she brought me to a bar. I was 15. She didn't drink much, a glass of Gruner here and there. I ordered a Bloody Mary. The bartender, a kind-looking man in his fifties, didn't question it. Goja unclipped her hair, which was in a chignon. I loved that word. She shook her head, and I watched her platinum hair fall around her shoulders. I was not the only one. I clocked three men staring at her neck. She looked at me and smiled. She knew they were looking at her. There were many such evenings. She never told my uncle where we were going. She never even told him when we were going to the mall. Always ask questions. Never answer them. Have more secrets than the person you are with. She spoke in epithets. She never implicitly said it, but she was teaching me how not to end up like my mother. She taught me well. I could turn it on at any time. I had a man I would never fuck move the contents of one apartment to another, all on his own. Goja couldn't erase what I'd seen as a child. She knew that she could not, but she tried very hard. I became a sort of Frankenstein's monster. I could make a man like Vic cut another man's throat for me, but I could not get the 24-year-old to call me the morning after we fucked. Even with Vic, though, I wasn't using him to nefarious ends. I was just afraid to be alone. I was looking for fathers in every train car. That afternoon, Lenny wasn't sitting at our outside table, which annoyed me because I'd asked Alice to wait while I ordered him a paper boat of fried calamari. She asked me about him, and I told her some stories, and she alternately laughed and shook her head. My life amused her. She dropped me off and we didn't inquire about what the other was doing. It was that early time in a friendship when you respect boundaries and evenings are off limits. 
I walked with the squid to Lenny's tiny home and knocked. Because the last time we'd spoken, he'd been alert and very much himself, I wasn't expecting him to be in the middle of an episode, but he was. I heard him through the door say, Lenore, is that you? I was depraved. I stole from stores. I used men, but I always gave something of myself in return. But plain and mean deceit? Never. Until that moment. Yes, I said. It's me, darling. Leonard opened the little door to his home. My life, he said, pulling me into his body and kissing me on the mouth. I inhaled the smell of his age. He was wearing linen pants and a cotton t-shirt. Tell me the news of the world, he said, smoothing my hair back with the palm of his hand and gazing into my eyes so intently I thought for sure he would snap out of it. But he didn't. We sat together on the couch. It's vicious out there, darling. I'm happy to be back. Shall I fix us a cup of tea? What's that in your hand? Fried squid. I brought it from Malibu. What were you doing in Malibu? He asked, looking haunted. I was down there with a girlfriend of mine. I see. Lenore, let me ask you. I worry you are still upset by the thing that happened. The way he spoke to Lenore was saintly, unreal. With me, he was his crude, erudite self. With Lenore, he was a gentleman. One of my greatest furies was the way men treated me like I would not merely endure their filth but endorse it. Oh, what thing? Do you mean the other night when you went into my ass? What? The other night, darling, when we tried what you've been wanting to try. Oh, was that at Sandstone? The Mickey I took, I can't remember so much. Yes, we were in the red bedroom after the pool. I can't. It's all right if you don't remember, my love. It hurt a little, but overall I'd say I enjoyed it. Did you? I enjoy everything with you. That's good to hear, he said, patting my wrist like the elderly man that he was. I squeezed the wedge of lemon across the paper boat and handed him a leggy clump. An expression of pure gratitude came over his face. He took the whole boat from me. He made humming noises, over-chewing each piece and swallowing with occasional difficulty. It's a particular heartbreak to watch an old man eat something he's enjoyed all his life. His brows moved like inchworms, and he didn't look up at me again until after he'd finished. I walked into his kitchen for a piece of paper towel. He bought the cheap, rough kind. I wet a corner of it in the small sink and brought it back to the couch. I took the empty boat from him and dabbed his mouth with the moist paper towel. Lenore, you're so good to me. And you to me, my love. Lenny had an eight-bottle wooden wine rack next to the television. I selected the most expensive-looking one and poked around for glasses. He once told me he had all the good china in storage, save the laboratorio plates. Storage for what, I wanted to ask him. He had no children, nobody to whom to pass along his china. I found two short glasses made by Oneida with 79-cent stickers from some dollar store in the valley. I brought our glasses to the couch. I moved slowly, wary of shocking him back into the present. We are in a low, dishonest decade, he said. Isn't that true of every decade? No, not all of them. In any case, that's Auden, not me. But it's truer now than it was then. Do you agree with that, darling? Somewhat, Lenore. Somewhat I do. September 1st, 1939, and November 8th of this year. They are mirrors if you look in the right light. Do you know what else Auden said? He said we all have Hitler in us. Hmm. I believe all men have a rapist in them just dying to get out. Excuse me? Nothing, my love. You seem tense. Is something troubling you? 
your feelings for me, Lenore. His pupils were hazy, like those of a fish on ice at a discount grocer's. He took my arms in his bony hands. His pupils were hazy, like those of a fish on ice at a discount grocer's. After I lie down, love, after I take a rest, I wondered if we might lie with each other. I could feel his penis wanting to rise. He was not wearing the watch. I would come to learn that he wore it only when he had those few hours of definitive clarity after taking his drugs. But one day he would make a mistake. I would be patient. I would like nothing more, darling. I'll go and take a shower. Get the sand off my feet. I like to be clean as a whistle when we, when we lie with each other. It was easy for me to say the things that Leonard wanted to hear. I have always and unequivocally known what a man needed from me. With Big Sky, I trembled in fear at saying the wrong thing. I tried to keep every message short. I rewrote lines to make them sound nonchalant. I spent morbid hours on one sentence. With Vic, I knew very well what to say, but often said the exact opposite. In the very beginning of our relationship, the second or the third time I let him fuck me, he lay beside me after, staring with those wet little eyes of his. We were in a hotel room in Siwatanejo. The rooms were all open air, white curtains billowing the blue sea, lanterns and rattan and ripe mangoes in a bowl. You're going to throw me out one day, he said, caressing the side of my arm. The breeze was gorgeous. I was in the prime of my life in that orange and blue place. The coconut grove down the road. Oh no, I said. Not one day. I'm going to do it very, very gradually. I waited until Lenny fell asleep. When he began to snore, I walked to the safe in the wall. I tried fifteen or so combinations, looking over at him every few seconds. I reminded myself that there was no rush. I turned it back to where it had been and used the hem of my dress to rub off my fingerprints. I looked inside of his little closet. I found his old man robe, his old man record collection, and a photo album. I tucked the latter under my arm, and I also took the pipe from his coffee table and a packet of tobacco back to my place. I sat at the outdoor table and drank a greyhound with fresh grapefruit juice and puffed on the pipe. If I'd had a child, I thought, I never would have been able to fresh squeeze a grapefruit, to rim the glass with salt. I lit the bowl of the pipe and looked through the album. It was almost exclusively full of pinup type shots of Lenore. There was something sordid about them, even by my standards. Lenore sitting on the toilet with a scrunch of toilet paper in one hand. Lenore naked in a bathtub with no water. Lenore drinking a martini in the nude on a velvet settee, her hair up in a classic Lenore chignon. None of it was pornographic, exactly, but there was something aggressive about the pictures. Lenore had an embarrassed smile in every shot. Her relationship to the photographer, Lenny, was clear. He was the bullish director, telling her how to sit and how to hold her body, and she was smiling like a woman who didn't want a man to be angry at her. Around five, Kevin came out, wearing black jeans and a black t-shirt. He was handsome and warm, but there was something distant about him. He would speak to you on one level, but his train of thought seemed to exist on another. I kept wondering if he would start wanting me and the not knowing gave me an enormous amount of pleasure. Being with Alice made me feel confident that sooner or later he would. Miss Joan, he said, coming close enough that I could smell him. Eucalyptus. Haven't seen you around too much. We keep different hours, I said. How true, how true. What's up with Lenny? He's kind for being a bastard, I said. I like that, Miss Joan. You got verve. Coming from someone with verve, I said. That means a lot. Nice of you to be checking on him. Why do you think you do that? I don't know. He's still in there? 
Little nappy for the old man? Nonny boots, my mother used to say. Get into your nonny boots, son. I like that. Yeah, I always dug it, too. Tonight is his regular poker game. It's the only night he looks good to me. He gets together with a bunch of old friends in Hollywood. Long black car comes to pick him up. One of these days, Kev, he says to me, it's going to be a hearse. Sometimes I feel bad for him, I said, and other times I don't. You know, I think that's just about everybody. I was always going around wondering where everyone got their self-assurance. Kevin's mother sounded like she loved him in a pure way. She didn't make him take care of her. It made me want him. His mother's love for him turned me on. I worried that with every man I met, either I was going to want him or he was going to want me. It had never truly been both at once. Just keep your wits about you regarding Lenny. River said the same thing. What do you mean? Nothing really. He's harmless, of course, but he isn't innocent. What does that mean, I asked. Oh, I don't really mean anything. You live in the canyon long enough, you hear rumors and such, and anyway, you don't move up here unless you have something to hide. He looked at his watch. My lady is waiting, he said. You have yourself a fine night, Miss Joan. Young man River went to Froggy's, case you're hankering for something to do. It's half-priced caipirinhas, all night long. He winked and ran to his charger. The music was all the way up as he sped down the drive, trailing baked dust in his wake. I couldn't hear the coyotes, but I could sense them. The rustle of the breeze might have been their tails thwopping against the salt bush and the milkweed. It was easy to pin my fear on the animals and the darkness of our queer compound. I wished I were in a place where I wouldn't be afraid to be alone, to turn in early with a book and a cup of chamomile. But even when I'd lived in such places, in the Jersey City apartment building, for example, surrounded by city lights and the noises of families, even then I had been afraid to be home early, to be sober and unaccompanied as dusk approached. Very quickly, I dressed in a black jumpsuit and my new stolen heels and drove down the winding road to Froggy's. I saw River right away, sitting at the bar, alone in an unalone way. We spoke candidly for a while. I was very attracted to him. I felt safe because I wanted to fuck him more than he wanted to fuck me. He told me the story of how in grade school, he'd been walking home one day with his best friend Eric. They took the same route as always, and it was a bright spring afternoon. Cherry blossoms, baseball season. Eric was wearing a blue sweatshirt his cousin sent him from Hawaii. It said Aloha Hawaii on the front in rainbow letters, and there was a rendering of all the islands. A white pickup truck drove past, slowed, and came to a stop. A man got out. He had long gray hair, a silvery goatee jean shorts, and paint on his bare knees. He was flustered and nervous and asked if one of the boys could help. His little girl had fallen into a well on Shroudsbury Road at the old pump house. He was on his way to get help, but he didn't want to leave her there alone. He was looking at me the whole time, River said, and I didn't say anything. I guess I believed him, but I don't know. I didn't say anything. But Eric said, sure. Eric hopped right into the cab. The old man told me to run along home and call the fire department, tell them to go to the pump house. But he kept looking at me as he backed away. Then he got into his car and they sped away. Eric waved at me out of the window. That was the last time River saw Eric alive. The next day they found the old truck a few counties over. It was a florist's van. It had been stolen from a funeral home during a wake. They found Eric's body in a ditch, naked, a few days later. Jesus, I said to him. We were very close to each other in that moment, and I looked into his eyes. I suppose, like anyone, I've never lost the hope for perfect love to come out of nowhere. River was not brilliant, but he was physically perfect and kind, and a life with him would be like a Grateful Dead t-shirt. 
I knew, River said, that the man wanted me. I knew I was the one he really wanted. And I've been living with that for all these years. Despicably, that story was like foreplay for me. I needed to have him. Just as I needed to see all the sides of a new town, I needed to feel wanted by a good-looking man. To feel good. To feel as pretty as Alice. To feel potent enough to be near her. By the time we left, the whole bar knew we were going to fuck. We parked in the driveway of our compound and were about to get out of my car when a long black car drove up. Down, I hissed, and we both shrank beneath the windows. It's probably just Lenny, River whispered. Yeah, I said. Why are we hiding, he asked. I don't know, I said. I stayed down there until the car took Lenny away. River led me down the rough terrain from our driveway to his yurt, holding my hand as my heels scraped the rocks. I knew they were getting ruined, but I didn't care. I hadn't paid for them. I followed him into his yurt and recalled all the times I'd been fucked in creepy places. It was a circus pavilion. Thin balsa beams held the structure up. The beams were in diamond shapes, in accordion. Then they straightened and met at the top like the spokes of an umbrella. There was a pellet stove in the center, like the one in my home. On the floor were many mismatched carpets. There were Aztec pillows and bright burlap blankets covering arabesque floor couches. His bed was in the back and center, the focal point. Right above it, a skylight, a hexagon of navy sky. He undressed me the way young boys undress a woman. Tentatively, they undo one button or tug a corner of the shirt off your shoulder. Then they lean back, smile, and wait for you to do the rest. If you never moved, neither would they. I slipped the jumpsuit off and left my heels on. I wasn't wearing a bra, so I stood there in just my black thong and those delicious green shoes. Do you know what happens, he asked me, when you pour hot aluminum into anthills? I laughed and said I had no idea what happened when you did that. It travels into all the passageways and hardens there. And then you dig it up, and you have this castle, this aluminum castle, with all these doors and intricate hallways. It's amazing. It's insane. What about the ants? I said. Yeah, he replied solemnly. We began fucking standing up, his body hard and warm. Touching his rear made me feel self-conscious. After several perfect minutes, he laid me down atop his shitty mattress and plunged in and out so rhythmically that it seemed choreographed to go with the Penguin Cafe Orchestra tinkling from his laptop speaker. He rolled us over so that I was on top and I performed the required spectacle. I held my hair above my neck, making triangles of my arms. I swiveled my hips and did not mash myself the way I have done with some men when I just wanted to get myself off. I did everything that I figured he would want. I sucked my stomach in, though I was mostly bones and tendons. I even turned around, reverse cowgirl. I felt the oldest then, the most ridiculous. I decided reverse cowgirl had its expiration at 37, at least with a new and younger man. Oh, man, he said a few times, but otherwise he wasn't a grunter. He held my hips firmly but tenderly. Nothing about him was gruesome or untoward. You'd be surprised at how few men you can say that about. Vic held me more gently and timidly than anyone, but it was insidious. His fingers like a Venus flytrap, closing in imperceptibly, wary of offending its prey. I wasn't able to relax that night, but there's nothing better than fucking a beautiful man who is also kind and elusive. I faked an orgasm 40 minutes in. I liked that he brought his mouth between my legs after we'd already started fucking. I liked the messiness. I looked up through the skylight at the wolf gray stars and cried out like I was calling up to someone in the galaxy. I looked down to see the proud look on his shining face. The dog, Kurt, lay near the door, his chin resting on his paws, watching sex the way that dogs do, 
like they are confused as to why you're making more of it than it is. In the morning, I woke before he did. I didn't know how anyone could sleep past dawn in a yurt. The sun made me feel like a slut. River lay there, lightly snoring and handsome in a way that I found offensive. I rose and gathered my jumpsuit and my heels. He woke up and looked at me and didn't offer water. The previous night after he'd come, he almost immediately began talking of his life plans. I was dismayed when the hemp curtains parted to reveal his boyish ambition. He was the same as Jack. They wanted you to think they didn't need technology, and meanwhile they were furiously mining Bitcoin. I'd looked up Jack around that time. He wasn't the internet entrepreneur he'd planned to be. In fact, his online presence was slight and bland, with one exception. Photographs of him were featured on the blog of a young woman named Kylie who was studying in Ireland for a master's program in something esoteric and unexciting. Jack had gone to visit her in a small town in County Clare, where she lived with a bunch of other skinny girls in jean jackets. During Jack's visit, they milked goats and burned peat moss. They went on hikes to well-known cliffs. They drank beer or wine in every shot. There were several still lifes of bouquets. Jack buys me flowers any time he sees them, the accompanying caption read, and if they aren't available for purchase, he makes his own bouquets. At the top of the blog was the customary Kerouac quote, though I was sure a girl like Kylie knew no mad ones. I was a mad one who had held her new love's scrotum in my palms and kneaded it like dough. Women have the upper hand. It's taken me half a lifetime to realize it. We don't actually care about the man who is bringing flowers to another woman. River was a stand-in for Jack. All present men are stand-ins for former men. And all men are stand-ins for our fathers. And even our fathers mean less than our own self-preservation. May you not go around the world looking to fill what you fear you lack with the flesh of another human being. That's part of what this story is for. On a practical level, both young men, Jack and River, were proxies for Mossy, my first kiss at ten, following the figs soaked in grappa. When I saw boys in the streets with their low-slung backpacks, I thought of the girls they liked, the girls who got to be eleven and twelve and thirteen, with unicorn stickers and slap bracelets. I did not get to be any of those ages. I was 10, and then I was 30, and then I was 37. That's the best reason I can give you for why I lingered near the door until River called out to me. Hey, he said. A muscular arm reached from the bed and made the shape of a hug. Come back, he said. You can't leave without cuddling. We fucked again, short but intense. We were on our sides, and every thrust was deep and thoughtful. Kurt was circling near the door. His scruffy ears twitched at the sounds of squirrels and birds outside. Mid-fuck, River told the dog they'd be going soon. He asked me if I wanted to accompany them on their morning hike. Did you want to come? were the words he used. I said no, and River told me to stay for a bit under the covers. They left without me. I walked around the yurt. On the walls were pictures of his father, many of them stuck to the wood beams. There was a tray of crystals and rocks, each of them labeled. Fancy jasper, stone of relaxation, golden sheen obsidian, stone of personal power, titanium aura quartz, stone of high energy. There was a collection of homemade walking canes. There was a pair of panties on the floor next to the stove brown silk. I picked them up and smelled them. I was in pain for the rest of that day. My abdomen was turning in on itself. I thought that it was because I'd had sex. Even if you don't believe in God, you can chalk it up to biology. Your body will occasionally be confused if a penis pokes in and out and doesn't ejaculate inside of you. You didn't fulfill your biological purpose nor did you have a sincere orgasm. 
I took the jumpsuit off, how stupid clothes are after you've gotten drunk and fucked in them, and lay on the cowhide couch I'd owned for many years, the one on which I'd given Big Sky that first massage. My thighs and the backs of my arms stuck to the leather. I was afraid to turn the air conditioner on because the noise might summon Lenny. I didn't want to see anyone, especially him. I thought an orgasm might unclench my abdomen, so I flipped onto my stomach. I rode one of the wide leather pillows and thought of River fucking someone even younger than he was. I thought of Jack and River double-teaming some small blonde wearing an anklet. Finally, right at the edge, I pictured Alice's huge naked chest squashed against a Corian kitchen counter and Big Sky plowing her from behind, an expression of ecstasy on his face that he'd never had with me. I came easily, explosively, but the pain did not subside. Sixteen. At the end of the dinner that day my grandmother was raped, Joe and Evelyn dropped us off at our little red A-frame. At the restaurant they'd ordered dessert, a baked Alaska. My mother smoked and watched them eat it, two herons drawing their big lips over the creamy forkfuls. Joe Jr. and I each got a scoop of rainbow sherbet in a little silver bowl. Bye, Maria. Keep us posted, Evelyn called from the car. Meanwhile, Joe Sr. walked us to the door. He held my mother's elbow. She was a little unsteady in her noisy wooden heels. He insisted on coming inside to make sure the place was secure. No need, Joe, my mother said. She was always appropriating English idioms with her accent. It made me hate her a little. Joe made a show of poking around, going upstairs into our bedrooms. I need to describe the house. Right as you walk in, there was the galley kitchen a little rectangle of formica and a four-burner white stove. My parents were very clean people, and yet the Pocono house of my memory is covered in a film of grease. There were those plastic salt and pepper shakers, a brown top to indicate pepper, and taupe for salt, and every time I touched them, I felt the need to wash my hands. Alongside the kitchen and extending to the back of the house was the combination dining room and living area. This was covered in wall-to-wall -wall beige carpet, thick and cheap. Our dining room table had candlesticks and a plastic tablecloth that my mother wiped down nightly with a sponge. My mother was always cleaning, using her long nails to scrape hard crusts off of cabinets, spraying Windex at cloudy windows, and moving her arms industriously to battle the streaks. Yet the house, for me, seemed categorically contaminated. Clearly, I had some sort of premonition. At the rear were the stairs to the second floor. These two were carpeted. The stairwell was very narrow. As a toddler, I'd once tumbled from the top to the landing. I can still remember the curved pain in my neck when I thudded at the bottom with my feet in the air. I was afraid I'd broken myself, but I was more afraid of my mother getting angry. The second floor was railroad style, a long slender hallway with three bedrooms and one bathroom. My parents, the master, was at the end of the hallway with the bathroom directly opposite. I slept in the bedroom closest to theirs, although most nights I slipped into bed beside my mother. The third bedroom, the one closest to the stairs, had two creepy twin beds with very tight sheets and knit blankets and light pink pillows with eyelet fringes. Sometimes I dreamed of two little girls in there, vicious ones who would pinch me in my sleep. The bathroom was small with white and black subway tiles and a cheap shower curtain circling a clawfoot tub. In the mirrored medicine cabinet, my mother kept a backup of her Valium, blue pills with V-shaped cutouts in the middle that I used to think were hearts. I've saved those, along with many of her other pills. The expiration dates are about 25 years old, but I found they still work if you triple the dose. Joe Sr. came downstairs. I was always having strange thoughts. 
I remember wondering if he'd stuffed a pair of my mother's panties into his jacket pocket. She wore full-bottom underwear, often sheer, in dark colors like purple and mahogany. I inherited some of my mother's allure, but it passed through a filter. She was old-fashioned, sexy, pin-up sexy. I have been hotel room sexy. Succubus sexy. Too skinny to be remembered. All clear, he said. Thanks, Joe. If you feel nervous, anything at all, you give me a call any time of night. My mother nodded. She'd kicked off her shoes and was rubbing her ankle with the red painted toes of the opposite foot. After he left, the girlish smile left my mother's face. It's time for a bath, she said to me. Can we have cocoa? No cocoa. It's bedtime. It's been a long day. Is grandma going to be okay? Yes. My mother moved into the small kitchen, putting dishes away. She was angry, and I didn't understand why. I thought she should be worried, nervous. I'd expected we would cuddle and comfort each other. Why didn't we go with daddy? I asked, knowing it was the wrong question. I don't know why. Go to bed. Mommy, please. I'll have nightmares. She shook her head at me. She said something in Italian about nightmares being unavoidable. I don't want you to think she was cruel. But she didn't hold anything back. She didn't treat me like I was ten years old. My father loved me so much more. I always thought that. But the tragedy of my life is proof that he did not. I always have nightmares if you're angry at me. Daddy would tell you to read me a story and make it better. Why isn't your father here and do it, then? Because, Grandma. Go to bed. Don't you love me, Mommy? My mother turned to face me. I wasn't going to get the answer I wanted. I remember the feeling inside my heart. It was shocking how cold she could be. As a child in rural Italy, she'd been very sick, and her parents had put her in a sanatorium, hours away from the family home, where she was quarantined in a sick ward with other children, coughing blood, and not getting outside. Nurses with masks treated her brusquely, washed her in ice water to curtail the infection. They left bowls of farina with lumps for her to eat. They didn't care if she didn't eat. For nearly a year, she was in that hospital, and her mother came to visit her only once. It was a long trip, and they were very poor, and my mother said she didn't blame her. She accepted it without reservation. In their bedroom in New Jersey, my mother had a shrine for the woman who left her in the sanatorium. She told me I didn't understand how hard life could be, that I was lucky. Silently, she taught me that we are all monsters. We are all capable of monstrosity. Unforgettably and unforgivably, she taught me several days later that there is always a reason behind the monstrosity. So all my life, I have never had to wonder, how did that thing happen? With a mother killing her toddler, with a girl texting her boyfriend into committing suicide, with a child blowing the priest— other people wonder why. I know exactly why. There are no stories or cocoa this late, my mother said, instead of answering my question. But daddy lets me when I'm scared. Daddy said, your father is going to ruin you, she snapped. I have long puzzled over that response. Somehow because of how much warmer my father was on the whole. I think I metabolized it to mean that men can ruin you in wonderful ways, like lurid, bright white jawbreakers with beautiful rainbow specks. Seventeen. I woke in the morning to two text messages. The first had come in the middle of the night from Vic's wife, very long, and all in capital letters. 
She must have been drunk or on pills. I thought of her dead husband, and especially of her boy, how it was exponentially easier to go on if you decided to go mad. Joanne. Come in, Joanne. Where are you? Are you with a new husband? Are you going to tear another family to shreds? My daughter hates me, and she hates her father. She thinks it's my fault that a whore was able to steal her father from me. What do you think, Joanne? Do you agree? Are you a woman of God? Do you pray to a higher power? We used to go to church every Sunday and after to the rose garden, and he picked me roses, and we put them in a vase at home, and they lived until the next Sunday. I was one of the lucky girls. He was the love of my life. I wonder if he got you roses. I have all the bills here, the credit card I wasn't supposed to know about, all these fancy dinners. You are a lucky girl, too. He never got me caviar. I read it a few times. I'd begun to tremble, though I didn't realize it until I saw the phone shaking in my hand. The other message was from Alice. Your day off, right? Come by for a comp class at ten? Then I'll take you to the farmer's market on Trancus for banana blossoms. Five minutes before the class, I checked my face in my rearview mirror. Why do some straight women need to be beautiful in front of other women? If men were wiped from the planet, how long would that need linger? At what point would we just focus on becoming strong? Inside the studio, Alice was seated in lotus pose. Her hair was all the way down. She winked at me as I unrolled one of the rental mats near the window. She led us in sun salutations to Dylan's Mozambique. I wondered whether any of these tight-faced women were thinking anything other than how beautiful Alice was, how stable yet dainty her wrists looked on the mat, and how demure her rear was, high up in the air, in Downward Dog. There is so much power in the way we obsess. If we could only harness it, if we would only redirect it. I watched Alice's body move and willed my bones to lengthen like hers. When I shot my legs behind my hips into Chaturanga, I felt as light as I had ever felt. At the end, Alice readjusted me in corpse pose. She smelled like pears. I was the first to get up and quietly roll up my mat. I didn't look at her as I left the space. I waited outside on one of the benches. The front desk girl came outside to ask me whether I had paid for the class, whether I would like to purchase a membership. I told her the class was comped. I felt like a wrinkled thief. When Alice came outside, she regarded me with a queer smile on her face. I worried that maybe I'd acted needy in the studio. It was impossible for me to know the right way to be around a woman. We drove too fast in the left lane of the Pacific Coast Highway with the windows down. We passed several empty garden centers. We passed the stone pillars of the Getty. That stretch of Malibu felt void of animals. The wind was too hot, the cars were too fast. Only crabs thrived. Alice played music loud and didn't always answer a question right away. A lot of her actions felt cruel to me. Eventually, I stopped asking questions. I held my arm out the window and tried to exist as a needless thing. I felt around her much the way I'd felt around Big Sky, that I should be as seductive as possible but take up the least amount of space. We pulled into the Trancus Country Market. It was a cluster of shops, a cafe, a bank, and a few boutiques. All the storefronts were made of wood planks. It felt more like Montana than it did the dry throat of Malibu. Alice parked between a bright yellow Carmangia and a powder blue BMW. There were G-Wagons and Land Rovers and weathered Volvos and Porsches and Priuses. Every car in Los Angeles felt like it was the perfect car. The farmer's market took up a strip of roadway behind the shops. Individual white tents shaded twin rows of long tables. Some tables were full of flowers and vases, and others had tight clusters of young broccoli florets and healthy-looking artichokes. Some had shallow tubs of ice with plastic containers of tara masalata and whipped feta. 
There was a fishmonger, and there was a meat man, and there were gray-haired ladies selling soap. Many of the patrons looked like us, women in yoga clothes with good hair. There was a woman a few years older than I was with her daughter. I was always picking these women out of crowds, my age, give or take a few years, with a young girl. The child wore her blonde hair in cornrows and had gangly legs. The mother pushed her own hair into a messy bun, something that beautiful women do on autopilot. My mother did things like that, but not with her hair, more so with cutting onions, eating persimmon. This mother looked rested and scheduled. I watched her buy black garlic and let the hippie farmer keep the three dollars in change. There was a group of young men in neon Ray-Bans wearing backpacks. They were hikers coming down from one of the nearby trails for a glass of aloe vera. They looked at us. Next to Alice, in similar clothes, I wondered if I became a part of their fantasy, or if they pushed me out of the picture altogether. I would have preferred the latter. To be a part of the dream of Alice would have made me feel like the scrapings from a pan. By that point in my life, I knew that my obsession with beauty had everything to do with my father. When you are young and you see your father choose something, the thing that he chooses will be the thing that you want to be. I'm thrilled you will not have this problem. So far, the two men who'd loved me were dead. Big Sky was alive and well with his young son and his Southern Belle wife on the Upper West Side and in Montana. For some reason, I always pictured them on their big decks eating peaches, sweet yellow wedges with vibrant red-orange skin. I'd been in the apartment overlooking the park only once. His wife and son had been at the lodge in Montana. Back then, they went sporadically, but I'd recently found out they had moved most of their life there. He was flying to meet them at the lodge the following day. With Big Sky, my hatred of weekends intensified. Only people who live their lives very routinely, who have never known abject grief, can love Saturdays and Sundays. For me, there was a rickety lonesomeness to them. It always seemed everybody had escaped somewhere I hadn't been invited to. Blue pools and cocktails circulating on round trays, or black lakes and tire swings. I bet that's true for most mistresses but it's laughable to call myself a mistress with either Vic or Big Sky, or with Tim for that matter. I wish I had been something so quaint and definable as a mistress. That Thursday night on Big Sky's deck, I looked out at the city beneath me. I was wearing a white dress with wooden buttons down the center. It was one of the most expensive dresses I owned, though it didn't look it. He brought out two glasses of rosé, and we peered over the stone balustrade. I felt the heat of being next to him. I wanted to make myself wider. I wanted to spread my legs as far out in either direction as they could go and take everything he could possibly shoot inside me. I asked him if he was excited to get to Montana, and he said, oh, yes, I can't wait. I don't know what I expected, but I didn't expect that. I was savoring every second with him, and he was merely passing the time before he could be in the mountain air with his family. We fucked on one of the striped deck loungers under the silvery Manhattan starlight. He didn't wear a condom. He always pulled out and came across my chest. That was our thing. Even though I wanted to stay over, I knew that I couldn't, so I took a cab home just after midnight. It was my choice to be hurt in these ways. Talking to Alice about Big Sky made my feelings for him both more painful and more manageable. I had only told her the first part of Vic, what you might call the honeymoon period, though I cringe to think of it in those terms. She was giving me exactly what I had always wanted. She was making me feel seen and heard. Are there any herbs you absolutely hate? She said to me when we were before a table of them. Tall fronds of dill and glistening bunches of cilantro and parsley and basil, arranged like tiny trees inside of mason jars. In general? These are things we should get over with now. Otherwise you become close and then one day you discover the other person doesn't like dill and you're forced to hate them forever. Dill is a deal breaker? No. Cilantro. I can't stand people who don't like cilantro. 
They're closed-minded. I could do without oregano, I said. Everyone can do without oregano. That's fine. There isn't any herb I hate. I think chives and chervil are beautiful. She turned to me and smiled. I'd gotten the answer right. Do you cook, she asked. I nodded. I worried that she was more skilled in classic techniques, like poaching fish. She was likely a neater chopper. I could never take the time to dice an onion into comely cubes. Is it too soon, Alice said, for us to cook together? Maybe, I said. We both laughed. There is no better invitation in the world than women laughing. The boys in the bright Ray-Ban stopped in their tracks and stared at us. There were four, and not one was better looking than the other. None of their eyes were kind. I wondered how many women between them they'd gotten pregnant. Sometimes I can't get down a city block without seeing the quiet abortions in the air above everyone's head. They were frozen in that airless atmosphere of men waiting to aggress. The way they stared, lips parted in a lively leer, gleaming eyes, often forced the women to say something first, often out of fear. I was wondering if Alice noticed them, or if she was even more used to being hit on than I, when suddenly she spoke. Do you recognize us from somewhere? The apparent leader, the tallest, wearing a highlighter pink sleeveless tank with highlighter yellow Ray-Bans, pushed the glasses up on his sandy head. We were wondering if you girls might know where the vegetarian masala dosas are. Masala dosas are traditionally vegetarian, so you don't need to qualify, said Alice. Actually, some have meat, the captain said, smiling. Actually, some have meat, Alice mimicked, her lips pursed. As a group, they looked wounded. It was funny how men could look that way. For years, they could violently finger and push just the tip in, all the while saying, just the tip, just for a second. Not like a question, but like a mantra. They could thoughtlessly fuck you from behind, their hips on hydraulics. They could be tired, sick, sad, rageful, over having the flu, yet their hips would be completely fine moving back and forth like a car part. Men were dependable fuckers, but suddenly they could look sad like that. After all, they were only trying to make conversation. The Indian culture is more meatless than any other, Alice said, but you boys look like you could use some. Meat. She said the word meat very softly, but not sensually. I watched the rape in them shrivel up. Maybe it's not too soon, I said, staring at the boys, to cook together. Alice's house, close to the Venice canals, was nothing like what I expected. I expected to be jealous. Teak and windows, clean lines. Not rich, but well-planned. Single flowers in old Italian lotion bottles. I'd followed her in my car, and when we pulled up, I had that sinking feeling I get when something is the opposite of beautiful. I used to feel that with my parents when we'd pull up to hotels they'd booked, or the first time I saw the Poconos house. Alice's house was not clean and holistic. It was an exhausted bordello. From the outside, it was a tiny cape with blue aluminum siding. There was a shabby porch with two stained armchairs and an old steel planter. The area beneath the porch was covered with broken white lattice. There was a strip of dead grass between the edge of the porch and the start of the sidewalk. From the outside, it looked like the home of a couple who'd met in college, settled into this spot after a bender, and never left. The front door opened directly into a depressing kitchen. Yellowed wallpaper, cheap white cabinets with pine trim, beige linoleum floor peeling up at the corners coil stove, a dirty white Mr. Coffee. Then there were the inexplicable touches. Dried lavender hanging from the ceiling, gem dolls and Barbie dolls with dyed blue and pink hair, posing from the tops of the cabinets. Alice, unembarrassed, gave me the grand tour. The living room had a black leather couch and a 19-inch Magnavox sitting on a stack of books, 
many Persian rugs that looked expensive, some of them beginning on the floor and finishing a few feet up the wall. Ruby and emerald settees, pink and mahogany pillows on the floor, lanterns filled with battery-operated candles. It was both operatic and small, overstuffed and empty. The bedroom made the least sense. A patchwork quilt, glossy black cabinets, lots of unwatered plants, the smell of myrrh, posters of heavy metal bands with curled up edges, a framed picture of a naked man, his crotch obscured by a python, a pink neon sign over the bed in wild font said, love me. I could only think of the stains of many sex acts. Alice waited for me to turn around after seeing the bedroom. Her arms were folded and she was smiling. What do you think, she said. It's kind of insane. It's a reminder not to get comfortable. It's like this on purpose? It's like this because it's like this. Some of it is laissez-faire, sloppiness, laziness, what have you. Mostly it's cheap. Whatever I had on hand, garage sale things. Some of it's from an escort's place on the boardwalk. She gave me her pillows. Because my expression didn't change, she squinted and cocked her head until I looked directly into her eyes. Don't forget, she said, I'm younger than you. In no time, the ugly home transformed before my eyes, the way the ugly homes of beautiful women are wont to do. Alice cranked open the window in the kitchen and the California breeze blew in. She set a bushel of basil in a vase filled with water and a bunch of cilantro went into an empty creamer carton. She took out all the fruit and vegetables we'd bought, arranging them in bowls and tall carafes until the kitchen came alive. Dusty orange watermelon radish, prim pearl onions, grassy spring onions, vine tomatoes and limes, sandy spinach, mustard greens and arugula, green papaya and avocado, and the banana blossom looking like a panicked bird in its own white bowl. She placed the hunk of ruby tuna we'd bought from the fishmonger on a white cutting board and then rubbed the blue fish with salt and oil and left it in its brown waxed paper. She washed her hands with Mrs. Meyer's lemon soap and played Calypso from her laptop. She was going to make a salad and ceviche, and she asked me to tell her about Vic as she worked. She asked me what he looked like. I described him as best I could, but said that he was more of a feeling than anyone I'd ever known. I told her about his hats and his suits, how large they were, that he'd never worked out in his life beyond the weights he lifted in high school. And though he wasn't overweight, he was definitely ashamed of his figure, and so he wore these big suits. She asked me again if it was crazy of her to think that we were getting somewhere. I told her no, it wasn't crazy. I could have said more then. I could have told her everything, and I wanted to. But she was right that Vic would lead into the rest. I'd already told her about Scotland and Cumberland Island and Mexico. The sunny days the times when I'd still felt like a girl, when I could still pretend that I hadn't flushed myself down a drain. Now it was time to tell her when the rot set in. In as much detail as I could remember, I described the company trip to Palm Springs, the scaly heat of the desert. Vic was always arranging events so he'd have an excuse to be with me for a long weekend. It's funny to think how many corporate dollars are spent so that one man can fuck one woman. We stayed at a ten-bedroom guest house that had natural rock hot tubs with unobstructed views of the mountains in the distance. I'd never been attracted to any of our colleagues. There was one man, Paul, who had just come from Virginia, from some old tobacco family, and he hunted and fished and wore minnetonkas and swore very graciously the words goddamned and witch's tit. Paul was something of a precursor to Big Sky. He was in a moose bouche I sat next to him at the first dinner. It was held at a decent chain with a huge kitchen and a gas-burning fireplace that stretched horizontally across the room. We sat in long strips of two, and Vic was diagonal from me. Poor Vic folded the napkin in his lap very meticulously, 
but for some reason I always had the feeling it was tucked into his shirt beneath his neck. I listened to Paul with my chin in the cradle of my palm. I laughed a lot. I did that with most men at first. I'd done it with Vic. I told Alice how I was sure I'd gotten this from my mother. Paul talked about hunting like an asshole. But he was also self-effacing and had a nice head of chestnut hair, so that overall it was charming. And had I been a little healthier, I might have tried to date him, but I didn't. I flirted in a way that a man from a good Southern family couldn't quite comprehend. It made Vic angry. I could feel his wrath across the table. His skin was red. He drank glass after glass of wine. Then he switched to scotch and flicked his eyeballs to the back of his brain. But he didn't erupt. What he did instead is what all men do when they feel like another man has touched something they think they own. They try to reclaim you. That night he came into my room. There were no locks on the doors and I had the room on the top floor between Vic and some woman named Crystal whose eyes ping-ponged from side to side when she talked and everybody made fun of her all weekend long and so did I. Around midnight, there were still some men playing poker in the kitchen but most of us had gone into our rooms. I heard my door open. I couldn't believe it. I thought to pretend I was dead asleep. I heard him walk very quietly to the side of my bed and kneel down until his face was next to mine. I opened my eyes. Hey, he said. My stomach turned. His eyes were small, his skin was dry, and he looked like someone who'd let himself go for many years, and now he'd found a reason to live and he wanted to drink purified water and join a gym. He smelled like scotch and cologne. He kissed my forehead and then my eyelids. Jesus Christ, Alice said. Please tell me you did not let him fuck you. No. I said I was feeling sick from the wine. He got into bed and held me, in his boxers and t-shirt. He didn't let go all night. Blood-sucking pig. In the morning, we overslept. I remember the room was very cool. Someone had cranked the air conditioning, and the shades were down, and we slept past 8.30. Nine was the time we were all being picked up by a limo to be brought to the breakfast spot for a team-building exercise. Someone knocked on my door. I bolted up in bed. Vic did not. He snored peacefully. Just a second, I said. The voice outside said, Joan, are you okay? The limo's here. It was Paul's voice, and I could tell he hadn't heard me. And meanwhile, Vic stirred and said, like a hungover boar, what? Oh, my God. And the door began to open, and I ran up and pushed back against Paul and told him that I was running late and I would be right behind them in a taxi. And he seemed to peer around me, and Vic was making waking up noises, and I was sweating. I was so afraid. Then Paul left, and it was just the two of us in the house, and so we both arrived late to the team-building exercise. I insisted in going in a taxi by myself, but Vic popped in about five minutes after me, freshly showered, looking jovial. He wanted everyone to think he had fucked you. Paul barely said another word to me for the rest of the weekend. Every one of them avoided me. I was garbage. You said you ruined this man's life, and all I've heard so far is how he pissed all over yours. I told her she didn't know the whole story. By now, she had diced the spring onions, tomatoes, and avocados, and cut the tuna into textbook cubes. She'd minced the serrano peppers and cilantro. She used a wooden spoon to gently fold it all with lime juice and a few teaspoons of sugar. We were drinking Sancerre out of short cups, filling each other up frequently. It was just before two on a Monday afternoon. We'll eat the ceviche now, then I'll make the salad outside while you grill the bluefish. Does that sound okay? I nodded. I wish she would do or say something that wasn't perfect so that I wouldn't have to kill her. Now tell me how you hurt this man, because I have to tell you, Joan, I think you've got it wrong. I told her about the week I met Big Sky. It was the same week that I had a big project due at work, 
And what she had to understand was that this was the first time in my life I had a job that wasn't odd. For Christ's sake, I'd made up dead people, and poorly because I didn't have any training. At the advertising firm, I'd been promoted from a secretarial position to an associate very quickly. I was telling the world to buy beer and cars and to shop at big department stores. I was involved in a conversation. I was involved in the making of money. It had become somewhat lost on me that the reason I was in this vaunted position was because a married man had become infatuated with me. And Vic was happy to provide for my progression. He prided himself on his connections, his ability to vault people. But with me, of course, he also wanted to prove indispensable. He promoted me again. I met Big Sky a day or so later. You have to understand, I said to Alice, the situation with Vic had begun to fester. Palm Springs had happened a few months before, and I was done. I was disgusted, and he could tell. Did you tell Vic about him? I couldn't bear not to. I had nobody else to tell. Not one girlfriend? Nobody. You've never had girlfriends? Alice asked. Not really. My aunt. You haven't seen a point with women? I wouldn't say that. Even though all around you men were fucking you right in the ass. That's not entirely true, I said, feeling myself flush. Joan, this is why you met me. Don't you think so? Everything happens for a reason, even the scary things. We had moved outside to her terrible yard with its yellow-green grass and its charbroil kettle grill. It felt like we were in Alabama instead of Southern California, and she was mocking me with her continental accent and her absolute beauty, and I wanted to dislike her very much. But I also felt she was on my side. It was hard to experience the feeling, let alone explain its effect. I wanted her to hold me. My whole life, I'd been waiting for a woman to hold me. We drank our wine and grilled the fish, and the sun lowered and some more breeze came. I felt a little nauseous, and Alice decided it was time to eat. She set the table and served the salad. It was a wonderful salad, with the banana blossoms julienne and the vibrant pinwheels of watermelon radish, the arugula coated with olive oil and bright lemon, and a dusting of pecorino across the top. It was odd to eat something so fresh on stained armchairs in the unkept yard with a gorgeous woman. A lot about Alice was a contradiction, but that was true of most beautiful women. There was one poet, one author they knew backward and forward, which lent them some intractable intellect. Once I knew a beautiful girl from the Midwest who had read everything Barry Hannah had ever written, and that was it. That was all she knew. The more obscure the writer, the more suicidal the better. I told Vic about Big Sky after the first weekend when I didn't hear from him at all. I was so desperate I just wanted to tell somebody who cared for me. I wanted Vic to tell me I would hear from him again. Oh, Alice said, that's always it, isn't it? Will he call me again? Just tell me I'll hear from him again, even if it's only so he can say, this is over. Alice took a bite. She ate like a European, small, neat forkfuls. A piece of fish with a strip of arugula or radish, mixing things. You grilled the fish perfectly, she said. I thanked her and she nodded impatiently while chewing, reminding me of my mother, and gestured with her hand for me to go on. I told him, and I was breathing heavily, and I was scared, he could tell. We were out to lunch. It was a Monday at this Bavarian bar far from our office, and I was drinking Belgian ale, though I hate Belgian ale, and he was staring at me with his beady eyes. I kept looking at my phone to see if Big Sky had written, and I could just sail out of there, leave Vic forever, the whole disease of it. And this is where it gets awful, just sickening. Yes, tell me. Vic told me to write to him. He told me to give him a directive. He told me to write and say, Was just thinking of you. I'm making martinis at five. Stop by when you knock off for the day. 
That's somewhat good advice, Alice said. It was scary. He had this look on his face like he was assessing a haunted part of himself. Then he sat there with me and we waited. I said I could not believe I just wrote that. And Vic said, you had to. It's fine. He'll come. And I said, Jesus, that is so unlike me. And Vic smirked. And I remember this verbatim. He said, he'll be rock hard the second he opens that email, kid. Alice doubled over in disgust. I'd thought I would feel shame recounting that, but instead I felt relief. So I continued. By now he had this very strange look on his face, this very strange mask. His eyes glittered. He wasn't sad but enraged. Even turned on? Yes. And he said, so tell me about him. And I said, huh? And he just repeated himself, tell me about him, blankly, straightforward, as though he were just any man and I were just any girl. He said, is it nice? And I kept saying, what? And he just kept saying those same words. Tell me about him. What's it like? Is it nice? And finally I said, what? The sex? And he said, yeah. I said, aren't you bored with this? And he said, nope. I remember that specifically. Nope. I said, I told you everything, which of course wasn't completely true, but I told him so much. I had certainly told him more than a woman has ever told a man who loves her about another man she's been fucking. And Vic said, is he a total stud? And I said, yeah, in a sort of strange way. He's unthreateningly assertive. Now this, of course, was the thing that most drew me to Big Sky. But Vic, like every man, didn't care about that. He sailed over that. He said, big? Just like that, big? I said yes, because I wanted to torture him a little. Because how dare he talk to me that way? That's the right thing you should have felt. But I was cruel. We'll see. And he said, huge? So I said, not huge, but big. And he said, nice. Heavy comer? And I looked at the tables around us. I was always looking at the tables around us everywhere we went. I was always feeling depraved and hideous. I said, who are you? Are you a porn writer? I didn't understand where this was coming from. And he could see that I was angry and confused, and he said, aw, come on, kid. He was trying to get off. But I was never that way. I'd done so many questionable things in my life, but I was prudish in these respects, you know? I can see that about you. You're a little girl in many ways. I told Vic the best part was kissing and the way he held me while we did and the way we moved against each other. And he laid down a $50 bill and said, awesome, have a great afternoon, kid. Let me know what he says. I've got to get back to the office. I know you don't like to walk back with me anymore, your morals and such, so I'll leave you to it. And I said, I can feel it. He's not going to respond, and I'm going to feel like an asshole. And Vic said, he'll come, trust me. And if he doesn't, like I said, it's not because he doesn't want to. I thanked him for being a good friend in a very strange way. And he said, okay, catch you in a bit. He'll come. Just wish I was the one getting that note. And seriously, of course. Look, I love you. I really do. Sometimes I think you don't get that. And then, Alice said, he went to jerk off in the office bathroom. But you don't understand, I said. There was something more. There was love there. He loved me. That's not love. That's abuse. He finished my project for me. I had that big project. I couldn't think. I couldn't concentrate on it because of Big Sky, who, as you know, did show up that night. And after he left, I was wounded all over again. And Vic did it for me that week. He'd been there. He'd listened. About all the other boys, all the other men. I didn't tell you everything. So you'd been telling him about other men you were with? Yes. A doorman, for example that I slipped my room number to in San Francisco. That's hot, Alice said. 
The way a woman could make you feel sensual was utterly different than a way a man could. Especially a beautiful woman. I looked at her big nose, at her big white teeth, her ferocious eyebrows and her nude, fat lips. It was a mystery where the striking beauty came from. It came from everything at once. And although it was hard to put my finger on, I didn't for a moment doubt it. Unlike my own, which I'd been doubting in mirrors my whole life. And the young kid, Jack, I said. So he suffered, listening about all these men. I nodded, feeling for the first time that I'd been unfairly blaming myself. But he didn't have to, you understand. We worked together. Should he have fired me? No. He should have sucked it up. That he was married with a family and that a young woman who lost her own family might be looking for something that replicated that. And that just because you wanted connection, someone to make you feel protected, that didn't mean you wanted someone to chain you up to emotionally jail you. Joan, this man took advantage of a sad young woman. Joan? But the truth is I kept going back to him and back to him. Every time I was hurt by some little thing. Every time I needed help with my work. Every time some fucking little boy hurt me. I felt loved by him. I needed that so badly. But this time it was different. The way I felt for Big Sky, Vic could tell I was blown away. Vic saw it, and it killed him. Plus, Big Sky was a man. He wasn't some kid. He had more money than Vic. He was powerful. But these games he was playing, asking you about the size of another man's dick? After we returned to Italy, I worked as a waitress at this cafe on La Dogana Beach in Marema. Every day, this bald man with one of those cartoon guts came in. Every day, he ordered the linguine con vongole. They made it the best there. And every day this man, Carlo, would ask for extra parsley, but he wanted me to sprinkle it on top right there in front of him. Some days he was my only lunch table. He didn't act untoward with me, unless you count him wanting the parsley sprinkled table side in the way he would watch my hands. I used to apply clear polish every other day because I was conscious of Carlo watching my fingers. Joan, do you understand? There are rapes, and then there are the rapes we allow to happen, the ones we shower and get ready for. But that doesn't mean the man does nothing. It's a finer line than that, I said. I wasn't innocent. Don't forget, I'd slept with Vic. I'd even tried to get off. I could never come with him, but I tried. I exhausted myself trying. I told him I cared for him. More than once. And then one day you didn't, and he wouldn't lay off of you. He stuck around. You didn't force him to. Not only did he stick around, he suctioned himself on like a fucking octopus. But I lied to him, and all he wanted was the truth. He didn't want half-truths, and I would lie. I could have just said, I love this man, this married man. Now fuck off, please. And it should be your responsibility to talk to someone that way? You don't think he knew you didn't love him? Didn't want him around? But it would have been honest. In the beginning, I would see him everywhere, as though he were a man I loved. Probably he felt real love for me. Of course I was confusing it with fatherly love I'd been looking for. But to change suddenly, to start to talk to him about other men, I didn't believe him that he wanted to hear these things. But he also didn't want me to lie. I was confused, but still, I was never doing right by him. I sent him into a pit of despair. And at home, he had this wife and this son with problems. Oh, fuck his problems. You lied because if you told the truth, he'd make you feel terrible. In his own little ways. And you were saying that you changed suddenly? What about the ways he must have changed? Going from a man who reminded you of your father to a man who made you feel like a slut like a bad, bad girl. He scared you the way men scare women into submission. He could have fired you, and you needed the job. You're still under the spell of him, and Big Sky. You need to come out from there. Where is Vic now? Where is this blood sucker? That's the part.
Alice poured us both some more wine and raised her eyebrows in curiosity. At the very least, I didn't feel boring. A little over a month ago, just before I came here, Big Sky got in touch with me after a very long time. I was so happy. I cried for a day. I went to a Turkish bath. I buttered every inch of my skin. I had everything plucked, tinted. We met for dinner at this Italian restaurant in the village. I can't tell you how delirious I was. I didn't tell Vic. I didn't tell anyone. In fact, Vic asked me if I'd heard from Big Sky lately. He acted like it had just popped into his mind. Of course, I realized later he'd been reading my email. He knew my security question, having to do with my mother's maiden name, because he had all my employment information. And my email was always saying that my password had to be changed, so I knew he was reading my email. At home with his wife sitting there and clicking away like a teenage sociopath. So he must have known. He must have followed me. I had a hunch that he waited outside my apartment. Once I saw him and he played it off, said he'd been in the area and was going to ring me up. Other times I felt his energy. I would turn around quickly in the street, expecting to find him there. I started to wait longer and longer to reply to his messages. One time he texted, and then, when I didn't reply for over an hour, he called me. I shoved my phone in my bag and roamed the streets. I finally wrote back. You don't have to follow up a text with a call. It's obsessive. I'll reply when I see it. What's up? And he wrote, I was calling because I saw you. I saw you on the street. I wrote back, why didn't you call my name? But I was frightened. The streets of Manhattan are the most naked places. If there's someone you want to see, that person lights up. They glow. I know you don't want to be seen with me at certain times in certain spots. I was respecting your boundaries. God, how I hated myself. That I allowed people like him to feel they owned pieces of me. Joan, Jesus, it keeps getting worse. This night in question, I wore a very pretty green wool dress, long-sleeved, wifely, you could say. I felt aware of everything. When I saw Big Sky at the table, I was happy, but I was also ready. After all that time, I felt strong. He told me I looked beautiful. I could see in his eyes he had that fear about him, when a man hasn't seen you in a long time and worries he no longer has his thumb over you. That was the look he had, and I savored it. We ordered fried zucchini blossoms and a bottle of expensive wine. His hair was long and I loved it, but I didn't say anything. I was clever and restrained. He spoke vaguely of some problems in his marriage. By the time our entrees arrived, I felt like he was feeling all the things for me I'd always wanted him to feel. God, I felt so happy. And then Vic walked in. I saw him come in. I saw him the whole time, and I knew I wasn't seeing things. I told you how he hated that I lied to him, that he once said that was the worst part. And there I was with the man whose existence in my life had almost killed him. And Vic thought it had been put to bed, and likely he thought there was still a chance for me in him, that one day I'd grow older and Vic would be there for me. And sometimes I thought that too, that eventually I'd be too tired, too wrinkled. A woman like me can't exist past a certain age. And Vic must have dreamed about that day. He'd get us a condo in Sayulita with white stucco and a little jacuzzi on the balcony. And he'd buy me high-cut bikinis and we'd eat plantains and just live out our days. But I think seeing me there with Big Sky, seeing me wearing a wonderful dress, looking more beautiful than I'd ever looked with him, I think it was a concentration of every raw hurt he'd ever felt at my hands. I could see his face melt from the inside. And he pulled out a gun. I was barely shocked to see it because I could feel it. I'd been feeling it for years. I didn't close my eyes. I felt I should die. Anyway. It would make sense. I thought of the imminent freedom. A woman at another table screamed and Big Sky turned to look behind himself. But then something switched again in Vic's eyes. And I thought he would point it at Big Sky, and in that moment I felt I didn't care about anything, about anyone. 
I figured how natural it was for my life to go this way the first night I felt happiness. The screams around us were muted. Everyone was frozen, waiters with two bowls of pasta on each arm. And then Vic turned the gun on himself, and it went off, and his face blew through itself onto the wall behind him. Oh, Jesus Christ. That's the reason I left New York, I said. I wanted to tell her that it was to see her. I wanted to know what only she could tell me. The thing I didn't expect was that telling her about me would force me to look at myself, at the way I craved the love of men who would never love me, at the way I could not abide women who needed me, at the way I destroyed some while allowing others to destroy me. I felt sick with myself and, at the same time, unburdened. I thought I'd been honest with myself, but I hadn't. I'd been telling myself ghost stories my whole life. Alice rose and hugged me. All afternoon, we'd been performing the little acts that women must perform when they come together after high school. The extreme politeness of gesture. The focus on being both feminine and its opposite. And with this embrace, it was no different. We were trying to exude kindness without being overly effusive. I wished she would never let go. There's more, I said. She let go of me and sat back down. I told her about Vic's wife, Mary, and his daughter, Eleanor, who was apparently on her way to find me. I showed her the text messages, the latest one, its crazed length, its capital letters. No, Joan. Alice said in a tone of what I believe was genuine anger. No, she said, this is enough of this. I laughed, trying to make light of the absurdity. From beyond the grave, he finds me. Is this crazy girl thinking she's going to kill you? This is insane. Maybe she has a point. Oh no, she doesn't. Her father is, was a bloodsucker, and that's that. She needs to learn from that and move along. I don't know. I think maybe she's justified. You think she wants to kill me? Clearly, she comes from a line of sociopaths. You haven't spoken to the mother since that text? No. Nothing will come of it. It's so stupid. Shall I pick you up tomorrow? We can go to Cold Spring Tavern, flirt with Harley men, and get food poisoning. You need to put this ridiculousness out of your head. I used the bathroom as she began clearing the plates. I tried to help, but she refused. I hated when people didn't refuse, when they gave you something to do. Julienne these carrots. The bathroom was tiny and there was mold in almost every line of caulk. There was a Tasmanian devil mud flap, the kind you see on an 18-wheeler on the floor of the tub. I pressed a piece of toilet paper to my forehead and nose to blot the oil. Sorry for the heavy afternoon, I said before I left. She ruffled my hair. I kept my hand pressed to the same spot on my scalp the whole way home. <laughs>